The Tale of Sinaue, from Notes on the Story of Sinaue by Alan H. Gardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Arnie Horton. The Tale of Sinaue, the hereditary prince and count governor of the domains of the sovereign in the lands of the Setu, true acquaintance of the king, beloved of him, the henchman Sinue, he says, I was a henchman who followed his lord, a servant of the royal harim, attending on the hereditary princess, the highly praised royal consort of Sesostris, in the pyramid town of Kenem Esot, the royal daughter of Amenemis, in the pyramid town of Ka Nofru, even Nofru the revered. In year thirty, third month of inundation, day seven, the god attained his horizon, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Sehetepre. He flew to heaven and was united with the sun's disk. The flesh of the god was merged in him who made him. Then was the residence hushed, hearts were filled with mourning, the great portals were closed, the courtiers crouched head on lap, the people grieved, now his majesty had dispatched an army to the land of the Temhi, and his eldest son was the captain thereof, the good god Sesostris. Even now he was returning, having carried away captives of the Tehanu, and cattle of all kinds beyond number. And the companions of the royal palace sent to the western border to acquaint the king's son with the matters that had come to pass at the court. And the messengers met him on the road, they reached him at time of night. Not a moment did he wait. The falcon flew away with his henchmen, not suffering it to be known to his army. Howbeit message had been sent to the royal children who were with him in this army, and one of them had been summoned. And lo, I stood and heard his voice as he was speaking, being a little distance aloof, and my heart became distraught, my arms spread apart, trembling having fallen on all my limbs. Leaping, I betook myself thence to seek a hiding place, and placed me between two brambles, so as to sunder the road from its traveller. I set out southward, yet purposed not to approach the residence, for I thought there would be strife, and I had no mind to live after him. I crossed the waters of Mawati, hard by the sycamore, and arrived in island of Snofru. I tarried there in the open fields and was afoot early when it was day. I met a man who rose up in my path. He showed dismay of me and feared. When the time of supper came, I drew nigh to the town of Gu. I ferried over in a barge without a rudder, by the help of a western breeze, and passed by the east of the quarry in the district, mistress of the Red Mountain. I gave a road to my feet northward, and attained the wall of the prince which was made to repel the setu and crush the sandfarers. I bowed me down in the thicket, through fear lest the watcher on the wall for the day might see. I went on at time of night, and when it dawned I reached Petni. I halted at the island of Kemwer. An attack of thirst overtook me. I was parched. My throat burned, and I said, This is the taste of death. Then I lifted my heart and gathered up my body. I heard the sound of the lowing of cattle, and espied men of the Setu, a sheikh among them, who was aforetime in Egypt, recognized me, and gave me water. He bowled for me milk. I went with him to his tribe, and they entreated me kindly. Land gave me to land. I set forth to Byblos. I pushed on to the Kedmi. I spent half a year there. Then Enshi, son of Amu, prince of upper retinue, took me and said to me, Thou farest well with me, for thou hearest the tongue of Egypt. This he said, for that he had become aware of my qualities, he had heard of my wisdom. Egyptian folk who were there with him had testified concerning me. And he said to me, Wherefore art thou come hither? Hath aught befallen at the residence? And I said to him, Sehetebre is departed to the horizon and none knoweth what has happened in this matter. And I spoke again, dissembling. I came from the expedition to the land of the Temhi, and a report was made to me. 
and my understanding real. My heart was no longer in my body. It carried me away on the path of the wastes. Yet none had spoken evil of me. None had spat in my face. I had heard no reviling word. My name had not been heard in the mouth of the herald. I know not what brought me to this country. It was like the dispensation of God. Then he said to me, How shall you land fair without him, the beneficent God, the fear of whom was throughout the lands like Sachmet in a year of plague? Spake I to him and answered him, Of a truth his son has entered the palace and has taken the inheritance of his father. A God is he without a peer. None other surpasses him. A master of prudence is he, excellent in counsel efficacious in decrees goings and comings are at his command it is he who subdued the foreign lands while his father was within his palace and reported to him what was ordered him to do valiant is he achieving with his strong arm active and none is like to him when he is seen charging down on Ro petiu or approaching the melee a curber of horns is he a weakener of hands his enemies cannot marshal their ranks Vengeful is he, a smasher of foreheads, none can stand in his neighborhood. Long of stride is he, destroying the fugitive, there is no ending for any that turn his back to him. Out of heart is he, when he sees a multitude, he suffers not sloth to encompass his heart. Headlong is he, when he falls upon the Easterners, his joy is to plunder the raw ped tiu. he seizes the buckler, he tramples under foot. He repeats not his blow in order to kill. None can turn his shaft or bend his bow. The Petiu flee before him as before the might of the great goddess. He fights without end. He spares not, and there is no remnant. He is a master of grace, great in sweetness. He conquers through love. His city loves him more than itself. It rejoices over him more than over its god men and women pass by in exultation concerning him now that he is king he conquered while yet in the egg his face has been set toward kingship ever since he was born he is one who multiplies those who were born with him he is unique god-given this land that he rules rejoices he is one who enlarges his borders he will conquer the southern lands but he heeds not the northern lands he was made to smite the Setiu, and to crush the Sandfarers. Send to him, let him know thy name. Utter no curse against his majesty. He fails not to do good to the land that is loyal to him. Said he to me, of a truth Egypt is happy, since it knows that he prospers. But thou, behold, thou art here. Thou shalt dwell with me, and I will entreat thee kindly and he placed me open before his children, and mated me with his eldest daughter. He caused me to choose for myself of his country, of the best that belonged to him on his border to another country. It was a goodly land called Ya'a. Figs were in it, and grapes, and its wine was more abundant than its water. Plentiful was its honey, many were its olives. All manner of fruits were upon its trees. Wheat was in it, and spelt and limitless cattle of all kinds. Great also was that which fell to my portion by reason of the love bestowed on me. He made me ruler of a tribe of the best of his country. Food was provided for me for my daily fare, and wine for my daily portion, cooked meat and roast fowl, over and above the animals of the desert. For men hunted and laid before me in addition to the quarry of my dog, and there were made for me many dainties and milk prepared in every way. I spent many years, and my children grew up as mighty men, each one controlling his tribe. The messenger who fared north or south to the residence tarried with me, for I caused all men to tarry. I gave water to the thirsty, and set upon the road him who was strayed. I rescued him who was plundered. When the Setiu waxed insolent to oppose the chieftains of the deserts i counseled their movements for this prince of the retinue caused me to pass many years as commander of his host every country against which i marched when i made my assault it was driven from its pastures and wells 
I spoiled its cattle. I made captive its inhabitants. I took away their food. I slew people in it. By my strong arm, by my bow, by my movements, and by my excellent counsels, I found favor in his heart, and he loved me. He marked my bravery, and placed me even before his children, when he had seen that my hands prevailed. There came a mighty man of retinue, and flaunted me in my tent. He was a champion without a peer, and had subdued the whole of retinue. He vowed that he would fight with me. He planned to rob me. He plotted to spoil my cattle. By the counsel of his tribesfolk, the prince communed with me, and I said, I know him not. Forsooth, I am no confederate of his, nor one who strode about his encampment. Yet have I ever opened his door, or overthrown his fence. Nay, it is envy, because he sees me doing thy behest. Assuredly, I am like a wandering bull in the midst of a strange herd, and the steer of those cattle charges him. A longhorn attacks him. Is there a humble man who is beloved in the condition of a master? There is no petty that makes cause with a man of the delta. What can fasten the papyrus to the rock? Does a bull love combat? And shall then a stronger bull wish to sound the retreat through dread lest that one might equal him? If his heart be toward fighting, let him speak his will. Does God ignore what is ordained for him? Or knows he how the matter stands? At night time I strung my bow and tried my arrows. I drew out my dagger and polished my weapons. Day dawned and the retinue was already come. It had stirred up its tribes and had assembled the countries of half of it. It had planned this fight. Forth he came against me where I stood and I posted myself near him. Every heart burned for me. Women and men jabbered. Every heart was sore for me, saying, Is this another mighty man who can fight against him? Then his shield, his battle axe, and his arm full of javelins fell. When I had escaped from his weapons and had caused his arrows to pass by me, uselessly sped, while one approached the other. I shot him, my arrow sticking in his neck. He cried aloud and fell on his nose. I laid him low with his own battle axe and raised my shout of victory over his back. Every ah am shrieked. I gave thanks to Mantu, but his serfs mourned for him. This prince Enshi, son of Amu, took me to his embrace, then carried I off his possessions and spoiled his cattle. What he had devised to do unto me, that did I unto him. I seized what was in his tent. I ransacked his encampment. I became great thereby. I grew large in my riches. I became abundant in my flocks. Thus God hath done, so as to shew mercy to him whom he had condemned, whom he had made wander to another land. For today is his heart satisfied. A fugitive fled in his season. Now the report of me is in the residence. A laggard lagged because of hunger. Now give I bread to my neighbor. A man left his country because of nakedness. But I am clad in white raiment and linen. A man sped for lack of one whom he should send. But I am a plenteous owner of slaves. Beautiful is my house, wide my dwelling place. The remembrance of me is in the palace. O God, whosoever thou art that didst ordain this fight, show mercy and bring me to the residence. Her adventure thou wilt grant me to see the place where my heart dwelleth. What matter is greater than that my corpse should be buried in the land wherein I was born? Come to my aid. A happy event has befallen. I have caused God to be merciful. May he do the like again so as to ennoble the end of him he had abased, his heart grieving for him whom he had compelled to live abroad. If it so be that today he is merciful, may he hear the prayer of one afar off. May he restore him whom he had stricken to the place whence he took him. Oh, may the king of Egypt show mercy to me, that I may live by his mercy. May I salute the lady of the land who is in his palace. May I hear the behests of her children. Oh, let my flesh grow young again, for old age has befallen, feebleness has overtaken me. 
Mine eyes are heavy, my hands are weak, my legs refuse to follow, my heart is weary, and death approaches me. When they shall bear me to the city of eternity, let me serve my sovereign lady. Oh, let her discourse to me of her children's beauty. May she spend an eternity over me. Now it was told the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Kepercere, concerning this pass wherein I was. Thereupon his majesty sent to me with gifts of the royal bounty, and gladdened the heart of this his servant, as it had been the prince of any foreign country. And the royal children who were within his palace caused me to hear their behests. Copy of the decree which was brought to the humble servant concerning his return to Egypt. Horus, life of births, two goddesses, life of births, king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Kepercere, son of Re, Sesostris, living for ever and ever, a royal decree unto the henchman Sinue. Behold, this decree of the king is brought to thee to instruct thee as following. Thou hast traversed the foreign lands and art gone forth from Kedme to retinue. Land gave thee to land self counseled by thine own heart what hadst thou done that aught should be done against thee thou hadst not blasphemed that thy word should be reproved thou hadst not spoken in the council of the nobles that thy utterances should be banned this determination it seized thine own heart it was not in my heart against thee this thy heaven who is in the palace is established and prospereth daily she hath her part in the kingship of the land her children are at the court mayest thou long enjoy the goodly things that they shall give thee mayest thou live by their bounty come now to egypt that thou mayest see the residence where thou didst grow that thou mayest kiss the earth of the great portals and have thy lot among the companions for today already thou hast begun to be old thy manhood is spent bethink thee of the day of burial the passing into beatitude how that the night shall be devoted to thee with ointment with bandages from the hands of tight and a funeral procession shall be made for thee on a day of joining the earth the mummy shell of gold with head of lazuli and a heaven above thee and thou placed upon the hearse oxen dragging thee musicians in front of thee and there shall be performed a dance of the mu'u at the door of thy tomb and the offering list shall be invoked for thee and slaughterings made beside thy stele thy columns being shapen of white stone amid the tombs of the royal children thus shalt thou not die abroad ah amu shall not escort thee shalt thou not be placed in a sheepskin when thy mound is made yea all these things shall fall to the ground wherefore think of thy corpse and come this decree reached me as i stood in the midst of my tribesfolk it was read aloud to me and i laid me on my belly and touched the soil i strewed it on my hair and i went about my encampment rejoicing and saying how should such things be done to a servant whom his heart led astray to barbarous lands fair in sooth is the graciousness which delivereth me from death, inasmuch as thy ka will grant me to accomplish the ending of my body at home. Copy of the acknowledgment of this decree. The servant of the Harim Sinue says, Fair hail, discerned is this flight that thy servant made in his witlessness. Yea, even by thy ka, thou good God, Lord of the two lands, whom Re loves and Mantu lord of thebes praises amun lord of karnak sob re horus hathor atum with his eniath sobdu neferbayu semseru horus of the east the lady of imet who rests on thy head the conclave upon the waters min in the midst of the deserts Wereret, lady of punt Arure and all the gods of timori and of the islands of the sea they give life and strength to thy nose they endue thee with their gifts they give to thee eternity illimitable 
time without born. The fear of thee is bruited abroad in cornlands and desert hills. Thou hast subdued all the circuit of the sun. This thy servant's prayer to his Lord to rescue him in the west. The Lord of perception, who perceiveth lowly folk, he perceived it in his noble palace. Thy servant feared to speak it. Now it is like some grave circumstance to repeat it. Thou great God, peer of Re, in giving discretion to one toiling for himself, this thy servant is in the hand of a good counsellor in his behoof. Verily I am pleased beneath his guidance, for thy majesty is the victorious Horus. Thy hands are strong against all lands. Let now thy majesty cause to be brought Maki from Kedmi, Kentiaosh from Kentkesh, Menus from the lands of the Fenku. They are renowned princes who have grown up in love of thee, albeit unremembered. Retinue is thine, like to thy hounds. But as touching this thy servant's flight, I planned it not. It was not in my heart. I conceived it not. I know not what sundered me from my place. It was the manner of a dream, as when a delta man sees himself in Elephantine, a man of the marshes in Ta Seti. I had not feared. None had pursued after me. I had heard no reviling word. My name had not been heard in the mouth of the herald. Nay, but my body quivered. My feet began to scurry. My heart directed me. The God who ordained this flight drew me away. Yet I am not stiff-backed, inasmuch as suffering the fear of a man that knows his land. For Ray has set the fear of thee throughout the land, the dread of thee in every foreign country. Whether I be at home, or whether I be in this place, it is thou that canst obscure you, horizon. The sun riseth at thy pleasure. The water in the rivers is drunk at thy will. The air in heaven is breathed at thy word. Thy servant will hand over the viziership, which thy servant hath held in this place. But let thy majesty do as pleaseth thee. Men live by the breath that thou givest. Re, Horus, and Hathor, love this thy august nose, which Montu, lord of Thebes, wills shall live eternally. Envoys came to this servant, and I was suffered to spend a day in Ya'a, to hand over my possessions to my children, my eldest son taking charge of my tribe, all my possessions being in his hand, my serfs and all my cattle, my fruit, and every present tree of mine, then came this humble servant southward, and halted at the pass of Horus. The commander who was there, in charge of the frontier patrol, sent a message to the residents to bear tidings, and his majesty sent a trusty head fowler of the palace, having with him ships laden with presents of the royal bounty for the Setiu that were with me to conduct me to the pass of Horus, and I named each several one of them by his name brewers needed and strained in my presence and every serving man made busy with his task then i set out and sailed until i reached the town of ichtol and when the land was lightened and it was morning there came men to summon me ten coming and ten going to convey me to the palace and i pressed my forehead to the ground between the sphinxes the royal children standing in the gateway against my coming the companions that had been ushered into the forecourt showed me the way to the hall of audience, and I found his majesty on a throne in a gateway of gold, and I stretched myself on my belly, and my wit forsook me in his presence, albeit this god greeted me joyously. Yea, I was like a man caught in the dusk. My soul fled, my flesh quaked, and my heart was not in my body, that I should know life from death. Thereupon his majesty said to one of those companions, Raise him up, let him speak to me. And his majesty said, Lo, thou art come. Thou hast trodden the deserts, thou hast traversed the wastes. Eld has prevailed against thee. Thou hast reached old age. It is no small matter that thy corpse should be buried without escort of Petiu. But do not thus, staying ever speechless, when thy name is pronounced, 
but verily i feared punishment and answered him with the answer of one afraid what speaketh my lord to me would i might answer it and may not lo it is the hand of god yea the dread that is in my body like that which caused this fateful flight behold i am in thy presence thine is life may thy majesty do as pleaseth thee the royal children were caused to be ushered in then his majesty said to the royal consort behold sinue who is come as i am an offspring of setiu folk she gave a great cry and the royal children shrieked out all together and they said to his majesty it is not really he o sovereign my lord and his majesty said yea it is really he then brought they their necklaces their rattles and their sistra and presented them to his majesty thy hands be on the beatus one o enduring king on the ornament of the lady of heaven may noob give life to thy nose may the lady of the stars join herself to thee let the goddess of upper egypt fair north and the goddess of lower egypt fair south united and conjoined in the name of thy majesty may the uraeus be set upon thy brow thou hast delivered thy subjects out of evil may re lord of the land show thee grace hail to thee and also to our sovereign lady the horn of thy bow is slaked thine arrow loosed give breath to one that is stifled and grant us our goodly guerdon in the person of this sheikh see mate the petty born in t murray he fled through fear of thee he left this land through dread of thee but as for the face of him who sees thy majesty it blenches not as for the eye that regardeth thee it fears not then said his majesty nay but he shall not fear he shall not dread for he shall be a companion among the magistrates he shall be set in the midst of the nobles get you gone to the chamber of adornment to wait upon him so when i was gone forth from the hall of audience the royal children giving me their hands we went together to the great portals and i was placed in the house of a royal son there was noble equipment in a bathroom and painted devices of the horizon costly things of the treasury were in it garments of royal stuff were in every chamber unguent and fine oil of the king and of the courtiers whom he loves and every serving man made busy with his task years were caused to pass away from my flesh i was shaved and my hair was combed a burden was given over to the desert and clothing to the sandfarers and i was clad in soft linen and anointed with fine oil by night i lay upon a bed i gave up the sand to them that dwell therein and oil of wood to him who smears himself with it there was given to me the house of a provincial governor such as a companion may possess many artificers built it and all its woodwork was new appointed and meals were brought to me from the palace three times yea four times a day over and above that which the royal children gave without remiss and there was constructed for me a tomb of stone in the midst of the tombs the masons that hewed tombs marked out its ground plan the master draughtsmen designed it the master sculptors carved in it and the master architects who are in the necropolis bestowed their care upon it and all the gear that is placed in a tomb shaft went to its equipment and cost servants were given to me and there was made for me a sepulchral garden in which were fields in front of my abode even as is done for a chief companion and my statue was overlaid with gold and its apron was of real gold it was his majesty caused it to be made there is no poor man for whom the like hath been done and i enjoyed the favors of the royal bounty until the day of death came it is finished from the beginning to the end according as it was found in writing end of the tale of sinue translated by alan h gardner Philboid Studge, The Story of a Mouse That Helped, by Saki. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Philvoid Studge, The Story of a Mouse That Helped by Saki I want to marry your daughter, said Mark Bailey with faltering eagerness. I am only an artist with an income of two hundred a year, and she is the daughter of an enormously wealthy man, so I suppose you will think my offer a piece of presumption. Duncan Dullamy, the great company inflator, showed no outward sign of displeasure. As a matter of fact, he was secretly relieved at the prospect of finding even a two hundred a year husband for his daughter, Leonor. A crisis was rapidly rushing upon him, from which he knew he would emerge with neither money nor credit. All his recent ventures had fallen flat, and flattest of all had gone the wonderful new breakfast food, Pepenta, on the advertisement of which he had sunk such huge sums. It could scarcely be called a drug in the market. People bought drugs, but no one bought Pepenta. Would you marry Leonore if she were a poor man's daughter? asked the man of phantom wealth. Yes, said Mark, wisely avoiding the error of over-protestation, and to his astonishment Leonore's father not only gave his consent, but suggested a fairly early date for the wedding. I wish I could show my gratitude in some way, said Mark, with genuine emotion. I'm afraid it's rather like the mouse proposing to help the lion. Get people to buy that beastly muck, said Dullamy, nodding savagely at a poster of the despised Pipenta, and you'll have done more than any of my agents have been able to accomplish. It wants a better name, said Mark reflectively, and something distinctive in the poster line. Anyway, I'll have a shot at it. Three weeks later, the world was advised of the coming of a new breakfast food, herald under the resounding name of Philboid Studge. Spaley put forth no pictures of massive babies springing up with fungus-like rapidity under its forcing influence, or of representatives of the leading nations of the world scrambling with fatuous eagerness for its possession. One huge, somber poster depicted the damned in hell suffering a new torment from their inability to get at the filboid studge which elegant young fiends held in transparent bowls just beyond their reach. The scene was rendered even more gruesome by a subtle suggestion of the features of leading men and women of the day in the portrayal of the lost souls, prominent individuals of both political parties. Society hostesses, well-known dramatic authors and novelists, and distinguished aeroplanists were dimly recognizable in that doomed throng. Noted lights of the musical comedy stage flickered wanly in the shades of the inferno, smiling still from force of habit, but with the fearsome smiling rage of baffled effort. The poster bore no fulsome allusions to the merits of the new breakfast food, but a single grim statement ran in bold letters along its base. They cannot buy it now. Spaley had grasped the fact that people will do things from a sense of duty which they would never attempt as a pleasure. There are thousands of respectable middle-class men who, if you found them unexpectedly in a Turkish bath, would explain in all sincerity that a doctor had ordered them to take Turkish baths. If you told them in return that you went there because you liked it, they would stare in pained wonder at the frivolity of your motive. In the same way, whenever a massacre of Armenians is reported from Asia Minor, everyone assumes that it has been carried out under orders, from somewhere or another. No one seems to think that there are people who might like to kill their neighbors now and then. And so it was with the new breakfast food. No one would have eaten filboid studge as a pleasure, but the grim austerity of its advertisement drove housewives in shoals to the grocer's shops to clamor for an immediate supply. 
In small kitchens, solemn pigtailed daughters helped depressed mothers to perform the primitive ritual of its preparation. On the breakfast tables of cheerless parlors, it was partaken of in silence. Once, the women folk discovered that it was thoroughly palatable. Their zeal in forcing it on their households knew no bounds. You haven't eaten your filboid studge, would be screamed at the appetiteless clerk as he hurried weariedly from the breakfast table, and his evening meal would be prefaced by a warmed-up mess which would be explained as your filboid studge that you didn't eat this morning. Those strange fanatics who ostentatiously mortify themselves inwardly and outwardly with health biscuits and health garments battened aggressively on the new food. Ernest, spectacled, young, then devoured it on the steps of the National Liberal Club. A bishop who did not believe in a future state preached against the poster, and a peer's daughter died from eating too much of the compound. A further advertisement was obtained when an infantry regiment mutinied and shot its officers rather than eat the nauseous mess. Fortunately, Lord Beryl of Blatherstone, who was war minister at the moment, saved the situation by his happy epigram that Discipline, to be effective, must be optional. Philboyd Studge had become a household word, but Dullamy wisely realized that it was not necessarily the last word in breakfast dietary. Its supremacy would be challenged as soon as some yet more unpalatable food should be put on the market. There might even be a reaction in favor of something tasty and appetizing, and the Puritan austerity of the moment might be banished from domestic cookery. At an opportune moment, therefore, he sold out his interests in the article which had brought him in colossal wealth at a critical juncture, and placed his financial reputation beyond the reach of Cavill. As for Leonor, who was now an heiress on a far greater scale than ever before, he naturally found her something a vast deal higher in the husband market than a two hundred a year poster designer. Mark Spaley, the brain mouse who had helped the financial lion with such untoward effect, was left to curse the day he produced the wonder-working poster. After all, said Clovis, meeting him shortly afterwards at his club, you have this doubtful consolation that tis not in mortals to countermand success. End of Phil Boyd's Studge, The Story of a Mouse that helped by Saki. The Sphinx Without a Secret by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One afternoon I was sitting outside the Cafe de la Paix, watching the splendour and shabbiness of Parisian life and wondering over my vermouth at the strange panorama of pride and poverty that was passing before me, when I heard someone call my name. I turned round and saw Lord Murchison. We had not met since we had been at college together nearly ten years before, so I was delighted to come across him again, and we shook hands warmly. At Oxford we had been great friends. I had liked him immensely. He was so handsome, so high-spirited, and so honourable. We used to say of him that he would be the best of fellows if he did not always speak the truth, but I think we really admired him all the more for his frankness. I found him a good deal changed. He looked anxious and puzzled and seemed to be in doubt about something. I felt it could not be modern scepticism, for Murchison was the stoutest of Tories and believed in the Pentateuch as firmly as he believed in the House of Peers. So I concluded that it was a woman and asked him if he was married yet. I don't understand women well enough, he answered. My dear Gerald, I said, women are meant to be loved, not to be understood. I cannot love where I cannot trust, he replied. I believe you have a mystery in your life, Gerald, I exclaimed. Tell me about it. Let us go for a drive, he answered. It is too crowded here. No, not a yellow carriage, any other colour. There, 
that dark green one will do and in a few moments we were trotting down the boulevard in the direction of the madeleine where shall we go to i said oh anywhere you like he answered to the restaurant in the bois we will dine there and you shall tell me all about yourself i want to hear about you first i said tell me your mystery he took from his pocket a little silver clasped morocco case and handed it to me i opened it inside there was the photograph of a woman she was tall and slight and strangely picturesque with her large vague eyes and loosened hair she looked like a clairvoyant and was wrapped in rich furs what do you think of that face he said is it truthful i examined it carefully it seemed to me the face of someone who had a secret but whether that secret was good or evil i could not say its beauty was a beauty moulded out of many mysteries the beauty in fact which is psychological not plastic and the faint smile that just played across the lips was far too subtle to be really sweet well he cried impatiently what do you say she is the giaconda in sables i answered let me know all about her not now he said after dinner and began to talk of other things when the waiter brought us our coffee and cigarettes i reminded gerald of his promise he rose from his seat walked two or three times up and down the room and sinking into an armchair told me the following story one evening he said i was walking down bond street about five o'clock there was a terrific crush of carriages and the traffic was almost stopped close to the pavement was standing a little yellow brougham which for some reason or other attracted my attention as i passed by there looked out from it the face i showed you this afternoon it fascinated me immediately all that night i kept thinking of it and all the next day i wandered up and down that wretched row peering into every carriage and waiting for the yellow brougham but i could not find ma belle inconnue and at last i began to think she was merely a dream about a week afterwards i was dining with madame de rastel dinner was for eight o'clock but at half past eight we were still waiting in the drawing-room finally the servant threw open the door and announced lady alroy it was the woman i had been looking for she came in very slowly looking like a moonbeam in grey lace and to my intense delight i was asked to take her in to dinner after we had sat down i remarked quite innocently i think i caught sight of you in bond street some time ago lady alroy she grew very pale and said to me in a low voice pray do not talk so loud you may be overheard i felt miserable at having made such a bad beginning and plunged recklessly into the subject of the french plays she spoke very little always in the same low musical voice and seemed as if she was afraid of someone listening i fell passionately stupidly in love and the indefinable atmosphere of mystery that surrounded her excited my most ardent curiosity when she was going away which she did very soon after dinner i asked her if i might call and see her she hesitated for a moment glanced round to see if any one was near us and then said yes tomorrow at a quarter to five i begged madame de rastel to tell me about her but all that i could learn was that she was a widow with a beautiful house in park lane and as some scientific bore began a dissertation on widows as exemplifying the survival of the matrimonially fittest i left and went home the next day i arrived at park lane punctual to the moment but was told by the butler that lady alroy had just gone out i went down to the club quite unhappy and very much puzzled and after long consideration wrote her a letter asking if i might be allowed to try my chance some other afternoon i had no answer for several days but at last i got a little note saying she would be at home on sunday at four and with this extraordinary postscript please do not write to me here again i will explain when i see you on sunday she received me and was perfectly charming but when i was going away she begged of me if i ever had occasion to write to her again to address my letter to mrs knox care of whittaker's library green street there are reasons she said why i cannot receive letters in my own house all through the season i saw a great deal of her and the atmosphere of mystery never left her 
Sometimes I thought she was in the power of some man, but she looked so unapproachable that I could not believe it. It was really very difficult for me to come to any conclusion, for she was like one of those strange crystals that one sees in museums, which are at one moment clear and at another clouded. At last I determined to ask her to be my wife. I was sick and tired of the incessant secrecy that she imposed on all my visits, and on the few letters I sent her. I wrote to her at the library to ask if she could see me the following Monday at six. She answered yes, and I was in the seventh heaven of delight. I was infatuated with her, in spite of the mystery I thought then, in consequence of it I see now. No, it was the woman herself I loved. The mystery troubled me, maddened me. Why did chance put me in its track? You discovered it then, I cried. I fear so, he answered. You can judge for yourself. When Monday came round, I went to lunch with my uncle, and about four o'clock found myself in the Marlebone Road. My uncle, you know, lives in Regent's Park. I wanted to get to Piccadilly, and took a shortcut through a lot of shabby little streets. Suddenly I saw in front of me Lady Olroy, deeply veiled and walking very fast. On coming to the last house in the street, she went up the steps, took out a latch key, and let herself in. Here is the mystery, I said to myself, and I hurried on and examined the house. It seemed a sort of place for letting lodgings. On the doorstep lay her handkerchief, which she had dropped. I picked it up and put it in my pocket. Then I began to consider what I should do. I came to the conclusion that I had no right to spy on her, and I drove down to the club. At six, I called to see her. She was lying on a sofa in a tea gown of silver tissue looped up by some strange moonstones that she always wore. She was looking quite lovely. I am so glad to see you, she said. I have not been out all day. I stared at her in amazement, and pulling the handkerchief out of my pocket, handed it to her. You dropped this in Cumnor Street this afternoon, Lady Olroy, I said very calmly. She looked at me in terror, but made no attempt to take the handkerchief. "'What were you doing there?' I asked. "'What right have you to question me?' she answered. "'The right of a man who loves you,' I replied. "'I came here to ask you to be my wife.' She hid her face in her hands and burst into floods of tears. "'You must tell me,' I continued. She stood up and, looking me straight in the face, said, "'Lord Murchison, there is nothing to tell you. "'You went to meet someone,' I cried. "'This is your mystery.' She grew dreadfully white and said, I went to meet no one. Can't you tell the truth? I exclaimed. I have told it, she replied. I was mad, frantic. I don't know what I said, but I said terrible things to her. Finally, I rushed out of the house. She wrote me a letter the next day. I sent it back unopened and started for Norway with Alan Colville. After a month, I came back and the first thing I saw in the morning post was the death of Lady Olroy. She had caught a chill at the opera and had died in five days of congestion of the lungs. I shut myself up and saw no one. I had loved her so much, I had loved her so madly. Good God, how I had loved that woman! You went to the street. To the house in it, I said. Yes, he answered. One day I went to Cumnor Street. I could not help it. I was tortured with doubt. I knocked at the door and a respectable-looking woman opened it to me. I asked her if she had any rooms to let. Well, sir, she replied, the drawing-rooms are supposed to be let, but I have not seen the lady for three months, and as rent is owing on them, you can have them. Is this the lady? I said, showing the photograph. That's her, sure enough, she exclaimed. And when is she coming back, sir? The lady is dead, I replied. Oh, sir, I hope not, said the woman. She was my best lodger. She paid me three guineas a week merely to sit in my drawing-rooms now and then. She met someone here, I said, but the woman assured me that it was not so, that she always came alone and saw no one. What on earth did she do here? I cried. She simply sat in the drawing-room, sir, reading books and sometimes had tea, the woman answered. I did not know what to say, so I gave her a sovereign and went away. Now, what do you think it all meant? You don't believe the woman was telling the truth. I do. Then why did Lady Olroy go there? My dear Gerald, I answered, 
Lady Alroy was simply a woman with a mania for mystery. She took these rooms for the pleasure of going there with her veil down and imagining she was a heroine. She had a passion for secrecy, but she herself was merely a sphinx without a secret. Do you really think so? I am sure of it, I replied. He took out the Morocco case, opened it, and looked at the photograph. I wonder, he said at last. End of The Sphinx Without a Secret by Oscar Wilde A Holiday in Bed and Other Sketches by J. M. Barry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel Novotny, Black Forest, Germany. A Holiday in Bed. Now is the time for a real holiday. Take it in bed if you are wise. People have tried a holiday in bed before now and found it a failure, but that was because they were ignorant of the rules. They went to bed with the open intention of staying there, say, three days, and found to their surprise that each morning they wanted to get up. This was a novel experience to them. They flung about restlessly and probably shortened their holiday. The proper thing is to take your holiday in bed with a vague intention of getting up in another quarter of an hour. The real pleasure of lying in bed after you are awake is largely due to the feeling that you ought to get up. To take another quarter of an hour then becomes a luxury. You are, in short, in the position of the man who dined on larks. Had he seen the hundreds that were ready for him, all set out on one monster dish, they would have turned his stomach. But getting them two at a time, he went on eating till all the larks were exhausted. His feeling of uncertainty as to whether these might not be his last two larks is your feeling that, perhaps, you will have to get up in a quarter of an hour. Deceive yourself in this way, and your holiday in bed will pass only too quickly. Sympathy is what all the world is craving for, and sympathy is what the ordinary holiday-maker never gets. How can we be expected to sympathise with you when we know you are off to Perthshire to fish? No, we say we wish we were you, and forget that your holiday is sure to be a hollow mockery, that your child will jam her finger in the railway carriage and scream to the end of the journey, that you will lose your luggage, that the guard will notice your dog beneath the seat and insist on its being paid for, that you will be caught in a scotch mist up on top of the mountain and be put on gruel for a fortnight that your wife will fret herself into a fever about the way the servant who has been left at home is carrying on with her cousins the milkman and the policeman and that you will be had up for trespassing yet when you tell her you are off to-morrow we have never the sympathy to say poor fellow i hope you pull through somehow if it is an exhibition you go to gape at, we never picture you dragging your weedy legs from one department to another and wondering why your back is so sore. Should it be the seaside, we talk heartlessly to you about the briny, though we must know, if we would stop to think, that there is one holiday more miserable than all the others. It is that spent at the seaside, when you wander the weary beach and fling pebbles at the sea and wonder how long it will be till dinner time. Were we to come down to see you, we would probably find you not on the beach, but moving slowly through the village, looking in at one milliner's window, or laboriously reading what the one grocer's labels say on the subject of pale ale, compressed beef or vinegar. There was never an object that called aloud for sympathy more than you do, but you get not a jot of it. You should take the first train home and go to bed for three days. To enjoy your holiday in bed to the full, you should let it be vaguely understood that there is something amiss with you. 
don't go into details for they are not necessary and besides you want to be dreamy more or less and the dreamy state is not consistent with a definite ailment the moment one takes to bed he gets sympathy he may be suffering from a tearing headache or a tooth that makes him cry out but if he goes about his business or even flops in a chair true sympathy is denied him let him take to bed with one of those illnesses of which he can say with accuracy that he is not quite certain what is the matter with him and his wife for instance will want to bathe his brow she must not be made too anxious that would not only be cruel to her but it would wake you from the dreamy state she must simply see that you are not yourself women have an idea that unless men are not themselves they will not take to bed and as a consequence your wife is tenderly thoughtful of you every little while she will ask you if you are feeling any better now and you can reply with the old regard for truth that you are much about it you may even for your own pleasure talk of getting up now when she will earnestly urge you to stay in bed until you feel easier you consent indeed you are ready to do anything to please her the ideal holiday in bed does not require the presence of a ministering angel in the room all day you frequently prefer to be alone and point out to your wife that you cannot have her trifling with her health for your sake and so she must go out for a walk she is reluctant but finally goes protesting yet that you are the most unselfish of men and only too good for her this leaves a pleasant aroma behind it for even when lying in bed we like to feel that we are uncommonly fine fellows after she has gone you get up cautiously and walk stealthily to the wardrobe produce from the pocket of your great coat a good novel a holiday in bed must be arranged for beforehand with a gleam in your eye you slip back to bed double your pillow to make it higher and begin to read you have only got to the fourth page when you make a horrible discovery namely that the book is not cut an experienced holiday maker would have cut the night before but this is your first real holiday or perhaps you have been thoughtless in any case you have now matter to think of you are torn in two different ways there is your coat on the floor with a knife in it but you cannot reach the coat without getting up again ought you to get the knife or to give up reading perhaps it takes a quarter of an hour to decide this question and you decide it by discovering a third course being a sort of an invalid you have certain privileges which would be denied you if you were merely sitting in a chair in the agonies of neuralgia one of the glorious privileges of a holiday in bed is that you are entitled to cut books with your fingers so you cut the novel in this way and read on those who have never tried it may fancy that there is a lack of incident in a holiday in bed there could not be a more monstrous mistake you are in the middle of a chapter when suddenly you hear a step on the stair your loving ears tell you that your wife has returned and is hastening to you now what happens the book disappears beneath the pillow and when she enters the room softly you are lying there with your eyes shut this is not merely incident it is drama what happens next depends on circumstances she says in a low voice are you feeling any easier now john no answer oh i believe he is sleeping then she steals from the room and you begin to read again during a holiday in bed one never never thinks of course of analyzing his actions if you had done so in this instance you would have seen that you pretended to sleep because you had got to an exciting passage you love your wife but wife or no wife you must see how the passage ends possibly the little scene plays differently as thus john are you feeling any easier now no answer are you asleep no answer 
What a pity. I don't want to waken him, and yet the fowl will be spoilt. Uh, is that you back, Marion? Yes, dear. I, I thought you were asleep. No, only thinking. You think too much, dear. I have cooked a chicken for you. I have no appetite. Ach, I'm sorry, but I can give it to the children. Oh, as it's cooked, you may as well bring it up. In that case, the reason of your change of action is obvious. But why do you not let your wife know that you have been reading? This is another matter that you never reason about. Perhaps it is because of your craving for sympathy, and you fear that if you were seen enjoying a novel in the bed, sympathy would go. Or perhaps it is that a holiday in bed is never perfect without a secret. Monotony must be guarded against, and so long as you keep the book to yourself, your holiday in bed is a healthy excitement. A stolen book, as we may call it, is like stolen fruit, sweeter than what you can devour openly. The boy enjoys his stolen apple because at any moment he may have to slip it down the leg of his trousers and pretend that he has nearly climbed the tree to enjoy the scenery. You enjoy your book doubly because you feel that it is a forbidden pleasure. Or do you conceal the book from your wife lest she should think that you are overexerting yourself? She must not be made anxious on your account. Ah, that is it. People who pretend, for it must be pretense, that they enjoy their holiday in a country, explain that the hills or the sea give them such an appetite. I could never find myself feel the delight of being able to manage an extra herring for breakfast, but... It should be pointed out that neither mountains nor oceans give you such an appetite as a holiday in bed. What makes people eat more anywhere is that they have nothing else to do. And in bed, you have lots of time for meals. As for the quality of the food supplied, there is no comparison. In the highlands, it is ham and eggs all day till you sicken. At the seaside it is fish till the bones stick in your mouth. But in bed, oh, there you get something worth eating. You don't take three big meals a day, but twelve little ones, and each time it is something different from the last. There are delicacies for breakfast, for your four luncheons and your five dinners. You explain to your wife that you have lost your appetite, and she believes you. But at the same time, she has the sense to hurry on your dinner. At the clatter of dishes, for which you have been lying listening, you raise your poor head and say faintly, Really, Marion, I can't touch food. But this is nothing, she says, only the wing of a partridge. You take a side glance at it and see that there is also the other wing and the body and two legs. Your alarm thus dispelled, you say, I really can't. But dear, it's so beautifully cooked. Yes, but I have no appetite. But try to take it, John, for my sake. Then, for her sake, you take. You say she can leave it on the chair, and perhaps you will just taste it. As soon as she has gone, you devour that partridge, and when she comes back, she has the sense to say, Why, you've scarcely eaten anything. What could you take for supper? You say you can take nothing, but if she likes, she can cook a large sole, only you won't be able to touch it. Poor dear, she says, your appetite has completely gone. And then she rushes to the kitchen to cook the sole with her own hands. In half an hour, she steals into your room with it, and then you, who have been wondering why she is such a time, start up protesting. I hope, Marion, this is nothing for me. Only the least little bit of a soul, dear. But I told you, I could eat nothing. Well, this is nothing. It's so small. You look again and see with relief that it is a large soul. I would much rather that you took it away. But, dear, I tell you, I have no appetite. Of course I know that, but how can you hope to deserve your strength if you eat so little? You've had nothing all day. 
You'll glance at her face to see if she is in earnest, for you can remember three breakfasts, four luncheons, two dinners and sandwiches between, but evidently she is not jesting. Then you yield. Oh well, uh, to keep my health up, I must just put a fork into it. Do, dear, it will do you good, though you have no caring for it. Take a holiday in bed, if only to discover what an angel your wife is. There is only one thing to guard against. Never call it a holiday. Continue not to feel sure what is wrong with you and to talk vaguely of getting up presently. Your wife will suggest calling in the doctor, but poo-poo him. Be firm on that point. The chances are that he won't understand your case. End of A Holiday in Bed by J. M. Barry. The Man Who Would Manage by Jerome K. Jerome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It has been told me by those in a position to know, and I can believe it, that at nineteen months of age he wept because his grandmother would not allow him to feed her with a spoon, and that at three and a half he was fished in an exhausted condition out of the water butt, whither he had climbed for the purpose of teaching a frog to swim. Two years later he permanently injured his left eye, showing the cat how to carry kittens without hurting them, and about the same period was dangerously stung by a bee while conveying it from a flower where, as it seemed to him, it was only wasting its time, to one more rich in honey-making properties. His desire was always to help others. He would spend whole mornings explaining to elderly hens how to hatch eggs, and would give up an afternoon's blackberrying to sit at home and crack nuts for his pet squirrel. Before he was seven he would argue with his mother upon the management of children, and reprove his father for the way he was bringing him up. As a child nothing could afford him greater delight than minding other children, or them less. He would take upon himself this harassing duty entirely of his own accord, without hope of reward or gratitude. It was immaterial to him whether the other children were older than himself or younger, stronger or weaker. Whenever and wherever he found them, he set to work to mind them. Once, during a school treat, piteous cries were heard coming from a distant part of the wood, and upon search being made, he was discovered prone upon the ground, with a cousin of his, a boy twice his own weight, sitting upon him and steadily whacking him. Having rescued him, the teacher said, "'Why don't you keep with the little boys? What are you doing along with him?' "'Please, sir,' was the answer, "'I was minding him.' He would have minded Noah if he had got hold of him. He was a good-natured lad, and at school he was always willing for the whole class to copy from his slate. Indeed, he would urge them to do so. He meant it kindly, but inasmuch as his answers were invariably quite wrong, with a distinctive and inimitable wrongness peculiar to himself, the result to his followers was eminently unsatisfactory and with the shallowness of youth that ignoring motives judges solely from results they would wait for him outside and punch him all his energies went to the instruction of others leaving none for his own purposes he would take callow youths to his chambers and teach them to box now try and hit me on the nose he would say, standing before them in an attitude of defence. Don't be afraid. Hit as hard as ever you can. And they would do it. And so soon as he had recovered from his surprise, and a little lessened the bleeding, he would explain to them how they had done it all wrong, and how easily he could have stopped the blow if they had only hit him properly. 
twice at golf he lamed himself for over a week showing a novice how to drive and at cricket on one occasion i remember seeing his middle stump go down like a ninepin just as he was explaining to the bowler how to get the balls in straight after which he had a long argument with the umpire as to whether he was in or out he has been known during a stormy channel passage to rush excitedly upon the bridge in order to inform the captain that he had just seen a light about two miles away to the left and if he is on the top of an omnibus he generally sits beside the driver and points out to him the various obstacles likely to impede their progress it was upon an omnibus that my own personal acquaintanceship with him began i was sitting behind two ladies when the conductor came up to collect fares one of them handed him a sixpence telling him to take to piccadilly circus which was twopence no said the other lady to her friend handing the man a shilling i owe you sixpence you give me fourpence and i'll pay for the two the conductor took the shilling punched two twopenny tickets and then stood trying to think it out that's right said the lady who had spoken last give my friend fourpence the conductor did so now you give that fourpence to me the friend handed it to her and you she concluded to the conductor give me eightpence then we shall be all right the conductor doled out to her the eightpence the sixpence he had taken from the first lady with a penny and two halfpennies out of his own bag distrustfully and retired muttering something about his duties not including those of a lightning calculator now said the elder lady to the younger i owe you a shilling i deemed the incident closed when suddenly a florid gentleman on the opposite seat called out in stentorian tones hi conductor you've cheated these ladies out of fourpence who's cheated who out of fourpence replied the indignant conductor from the top of the steps it was a tuppenny fare two tuppences don't make eightpence retorted the florid gentleman hotly how much did you give the fellow my dear he asked addressing the first of the young ladies i gave him sixpence replied the lady examining her purse and then i gave you fourpence you know she added addressing her companion that's a dear two pennies chimed in a common-looking man on the seat behind oh that's impossible dear returned the other because i owed you sixpence to begin with but i did persisted the first lady you gave me a shilling said the conductor who had returned pointing an accusing forefinger at the elder of the ladies the elder lady nodded and i gave you sixpence and two pennies didn't i the lady admitted it and i give her he pointed towards the younger lady fourpence didn't i which i gave you you know dear remarked the younger lady blow me if it ain't me as has been cheated out of the fourpence cried the conductor but said the florid gentleman the other lady gave you sixpence which i give to her replied the conductor again pointing the finger of accusation at the elder lady you can search my bag if you like i ain't got a bloomin sixpence on me by this time everybody had forgotten what they had done and contradicted themselves and one another the florid man took it upon himself to put everybody right with the result that before piccadilly circus was reached three passengers had threatened to report the conductor for unbecoming language the conductor had called a policeman and had taken the names and addresses of the two ladies intending to sue them for the fourpence which they wanted to pay but which the florid man would not allow them to do the younger lady had become convinced that the elder lady had meant to cheat her and the elder lady was in tears 
the florid gentleman and myself continued to Charing Cross Station. At the booking office window it transpired that we were bound for the same suburb, and we journeyed down together. He talked about the fourpence all the way. At my gate we shook hands, and he was good enough to express delight at the discovery that we were near neighbours. What attracted him to myself I failed to understand, for he had bored me considerably, and I had, to the best of my ability, snubbed him. Subsequently I learned that it was a peculiarity of his to be charmed with any one who did not openly insult him. Three days afterwards he burst into my study unannounced. He appeared to regard himself as my bosom friend, and asked me to forgive him for not having called sooner, which I did. "'I met the postman as I was coming along,' he said, handing me a blue envelope, "'and he gave me this for you.' I saw it was an application for the water rate. "'We must make a stand against this.' he continued. That's for water to the twenty-ninth September. You've no right to pay it in June. I replied to the effect that water rates had to be paid, and that it seemed to me immaterial whether they were paid in June or September. That's not it, he answered. It's the principle of the thing. Why should you pay for water you have never had? "'What right have they to bully you into paying what you don't owe?' "'He was a fluent talker, and I was ass enough to listen to him. "'By the end of half an hour he had persuaded me "'that the question was bound up with the inalienable rights of man, "'and that if I paid that fourteen and tenpence in June instead of in September, "'I should be unworthy of the privileges my forefathers had fought and died to bestow upon me. He told me the company had not a leg to stand upon, and at his instigation I sat down and wrote an insulting letter to the chairman. The secretary replied that, having regard to the attitude I had taken up, it would be incumbent upon themselves to treat it as a test case and presumed that my solicitors would accept service on my behalf. When I showed him this letter, he was delighted. "'You leave it to me,' he said, pocketing the correspondence, "'and we'll teach them a lesson.' I left it to him. My only excuse is that at the time I was immersed in the writing of what in those days was termed a comedy drama. The little sense I possessed must, I suppose, have been absorbed by the play. The magistrate's decision somewhat damped my ardour, but only inflamed his zeal. Magistrates, he said, were muddle-headed old fogies. This was a matter for a judge. The judge was a kindly old gentleman and said that, bearing in mind the unsatisfactory wording of the sub-clause, he did not think he could allow the company their costs, so that, all told, I got off for something under fifty pounds, inclusive of the original fourteen and tenpence. Afterwards our friendship waned, but living as we did in the same outlying suburb, I was bound to see a good deal of him, and to hear more. At parties of all kinds he was particularly prominent, and on such occasions, being in his most good-natured mood, was most to be dreaded. No human being worked harder for the enjoyment of others, or produced more universal wretchedness. One Christmas afternoon, calling upon a friend, I found some fourteen or fifteen elderly ladies and gentlemen trotting solemnly round a row of chairs in the centre of the drawing-room while Poppleton played the piano. Every now and then Poppleton would suddenly cease, and every one would drop wearily into the nearest chair, evidently glad of a rest, all but one who would thereupon creep quietly away, 
followed by the envying looks of those left behind i stood by the door watching the weird scene presently an escaped player came towards me and i inquired of him what the ceremony was supposed to signify don't ask me he answered grumpily some of poppleton's damned tomfoolery then he added savagely we've got to play forfeits after this the servant was still waiting a favourable opportunity to announce me i gave her a shilling not to and got away unperceived after a satisfactory dinner he would suggest an impromptu dance and want you to roll up mats or help him move the piano to the other end of the room he knew enough round games to have started a small purgatory of his own just as you were in the middle of an interesting discussion or a delightful tete-a-tete -tete with a pretty woman he would swoop down upon you with come along we're going to play literary consequences and dragging you to the table and putting a piece of paper and a pencil before you would tell you to write a description of your favourite heroine in fiction and would see that you did it he never spared himself it was always he who would volunteer to escort the old ladies to the station and who would never leave them until he had seen them safely into the wrong train he it was who would play wild beasts with the children and frighten them into fits that would last all night so far as intention went he was the kindest man alive he never visited poor sick persons without taking with him in his pocket some little delicacy calculated to disagree with them and make them worse he arranged yachting excursions for bad sailors entirely at his own expense and seemed to regard their subsequent agonies as ingratitude he loved to manage a wedding once he planned matters so that the bride arrived at the altar three-quarters of an hour before the groom which led to unpleasantness upon a day that should have been filled only with joy and once he forgot the clergyman but he was always ready to admit when he made a mistake at funerals also he was to the fore pointing out to the grief-stricken relatives how much better it was for all concerned that the corpse was dead and expressing a pious hope that they would soon join it the chiefest delight of his life however was to be mixed up in other people's domestic quarrels no domestic quarrel for miles round was complete without him he generally came in as mediator and finished as leading witness for the appellant as a journalist or politician his wonderful grasp of other people's business would have won for him esteem the error he made was working it out in practice end of the man who would manage by jerome k jerome recording by ruth golding An Encounter by James Joyce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Encounter. It was Joe Dillon who introduced the Wild West to us. He had a little library made up of old numbers of the Union Jack, Pluck, and the Halfpenny Marvel. Every evening after school, we met in his back garden and arranged Indian battles he and his fat young brother leo the idler held the loft of the stable while we tried to carry it by storm or we fought a pitched battle on the grass but however well we fought we never won siege or battle and all our bouts ended with joe dillon's war dance of victory his parents went to eight o'clock mass every morning in gardiner street and the peaceful odour of mrs dillon was prevalent in the hall of the house but he played too fiercely for us who were younger and more timid. He looked like some kind of an Indian when he capered round the garden, an old tea-cosy on his head, 
beating a tin with his fist and yelling, Ya, yaka, yaka, yaka. Everyone was incredulous when it was reported that he had a vocation for the priesthood. Nevertheless, it was true. A spirit of unruliness diffused itself among us, and under its influence, differences of culture and constitution were waived. We banded ourselves together, some boldly, some in jest, and some almost in fear. And of the number of these latter, the reluctant Indians who were afraid to seem studious or lacking in robustness, I was one. The adventures related in the literature of the Wild West were remote from my nature, but at least they opened doors of escape. I liked better some American detective stories which were traversed from time to time by unkempt, fierce, and beautiful girls. Though there was nothing wrong in these stories, and though their intention was sometimes literary, they were circulated secretly at school. One day, when Father Butler was hearing the four pages of Roman history, clumsy Leo Dillon was discovered with a copy of the Halfpenny Marvel. This page or this page? This page? Now Dillon up. Hardly had the day go on. What day? Hardly had the day dawned. Have you studied it? What have you there in your pocket? Everyone's heart palpitated as Leo Dillon handed up the paper, and everyone assumed an innocent face. Father Butler turned over the pages, frowning. What is this rubbish, he said. The Apache chief? Is this what you read instead of studying your Roman history? Let me not find any more of this wretched stuff in this college. The man who wrote it, I suppose, was some wretched scribbler who writes these things for a drink. I am surprised at boys like you, educated, reading such stuff. I could understand it if you were national school boys. Now, Dylan, I advise you strongly, get at your work or... This rebuke, during the sober hours of school, paled much of the glory of the Wild West for me, and the confused, puffy face of Leo Dillon awakened one of my consciences. But when the restraining influence of the school was at a distance, I began to hunger again for wild sensations, for the escape which those chronicles of disorder alone seemed to offer me. The mimic warfare of the evening became at last as wearisome to me as the routine of school in the morning, because I wanted real adventures to happen to myself. But real adventures, I reflected, do not happen to people who remain at home. They must be sought abroad. The summer holidays were near at hand, when I made up my mind to break out of the weariness of school life for one day at least. With Leo Dillon and a boy named Mahony, I planned a day's mitching. Each of us saved up sixpence. We were to meet at ten in the morning on the canal bridge. Mahony's big sister was to write an excuse for him, and Leo Dillon was to tell his brother to say he was sick. We arranged to go along the wharf road until we came to the ships, then to cross in the ferry boat and walk out to see the pigeon house. Leo Dillon was afraid we might meet Father Butler or someone out of the college, but Mahony asked very sensibly what would Father Butler be doing out at the pigeon house. We were reassured, and I brought the first stage of the plot to an end by collecting sixpence from the other two, at the same time showing them my own sixpence. When we were making the last arrangements on the eve, we were all vaguely excited. We shook hands, laughing, and Mahony said, Till tomorrow, mates. That night, I slept badly. In the morning, I was first comer to the bridge as I lived nearest. I hid my books in the long grass near the ash pit at the end of the garden, where nobody ever came, and hurried along the canal bank. It was a mild, sunny morning in the first week of June. I sat up on the copping of the bridge and admired my frail canvas shoes, which I had diligently pipe-clayed overnight, and watching the docile horses pulling a tramload of business people up the hill. All the branches of the tall trees which lined the mall were gay with little light green leaves, and the sunlight slanted through them onto the water. The granite stone of the bridge was beginning to be warm, and I began to pat it with my hands in time to an air in my head. I was very happy. 
When I had been sitting there for five or ten minutes, I saw Mahony's grey suit approaching. He came up the hill, smiling, and clambered up beside me on the bridge. While we were waiting, he brought out the catapult which bulged from his inner pocket and explained some improvements which he had made in it. I asked him why he had brought it, and he told me he had brought it to have some gas with the birds. Mahony used slang freely and spoke of Father Butler as old Bunser. We waited on for a quarter of an hour more, but still there was no sign of Leo Dillon. Mahony at last jumped down and said, Come along, I knew Fatty had funk it. And his sixpence, I said. That's forfeit, said Mahony. And so much the better for us. A bob and a tanner instead of a bob. We walked along the North Strand Road till we came to the vitriol works, and then turned to the right along the wharf road. Mahony began to play the Indian as soon as we were out of public sight. He chased a crowd of ragged girls, brandishing his unloaded catapult. And when two ragged boys began out of chivalry to fling stones at us, he proposed that we should charge them. I objected that the boys were too small, and so we walked on, the ragged troop screaming after us, Swaddlers! Swaddlers! Thinking that we were Protestants, because Mahony, who was dark-complexioned, wore the silver badge of a cricket club in his cap. When we came to the smoothing iron, we arranged a siege, but it was a failure, because you must have at least three. We revenged ourselves on Leo Dillon by saying what a funk he was, and guessing how many he would get at three o'clock from Mr. Ryan. We came then near the river, watching the working of cranes and engines, and often being shouted at for our immobility by the drivers of groaning carts. It was noon when we reached the quays, and, as all the labourers seemed to be eating their lunches, we bought two big currant buns and sat down to eat them on some metal piping beside the river. We pleased ourselves with the spectacle of Dublin's commerce. The barges, signalled from far away by their curls of woolly smoke, the brown fishing fleet beyond Ringsend, the big white sailing vessel which was being discharged on the opposite quay. Mahony said it would be right skit to run away to sea on one of those big ships, and even I, looking at the high masts, saw or imagined the geography which had been scantily dosed at to me at school, gradually taking substance under my eyes. School and home seemed to recede from us, and their influences upon us seemed to wane. We crossed the Liffey in the ferryboat, paying our toll to be transported in the company of two labourers and a little Jew with a bag. We were serious to the point of solemnity, but once during the short voyage our eyes met and we laughed. When we landed, we watched the discharging of the graceful three-master which we had observed from the other quay. Some bystander said that she was a Norwegian vessel. I went to the stern and tried to decipher the legend upon it, but failing to do so, I came back and examined the foreign sailors to see had any of them green eyes, for I had some confused notion. The sailors' eyes were blue and grey and even black. The only sailor whose eyes could have been called green was a tall man who amused the crowd on the quay by calling out cheerfully every time the planks fell, All right, all right. When we were tired of this sight, we walked slowly into Ringsend. The day had grown sultry, and in the windows of the grocer's shops musty biscuits lay bleaching. We bought some biscuits and chocolate, which we ate sedulously as we wandered through the squalid streets where the families of the fishermen live. We could find no dairy, and so we went into a huckster's shop and bought a bottle of raspberry lemonade each. Refreshed by this, Mahony chased a cat down the lane, but the cat escaped into a wide field. We both felt rather tired, and when we reached the field, we made at once for a sloping bank over the ridge of which we could see the daughter. It was too late, and we were too tired to carry out our project of visiting the pigeon house. We had to be home before four o'clock, lest our adventure should be discovered. Mahony looked regretfully at his catapult, and I had to suggest going home by train before he regained any cheerfulness. The sun went in behind some clouds and left us to our jaded thoughts 
and the crumbs of our provisions. There was nobody but ourselves in the field. When we had lain on the bank for some time without speaking, I saw a man approaching from the far end of the field. I watched him lazily as I chewed one of those green stems on which girls tell of fortunes. He came along by the bank slowly. He walked with one hand upon his hip, and in the other hand he held a stick with which he tapped the turf lightly. He was shabbily dressed in a suit of greenish black, and wore what we used to call a jerry hat with a high crown. He seemed to be fairly old, for his moustache was ashen grey. When he passed at our feet, he glanced up at us quickly and then continued his way. We followed him with our eyes, and saw that when he had gone on for perhaps fifty paces, he turned about and began to retrace his steps. He walked towards us very slowly, always tapping the ground with his stick. So slowly did I thought he was looking for something in the grass. He stopped when he came level with us and bade us good day. We answered him, and he sat down beside us on the slope, slowly and with great care. He began to talk of the weather, saying that it would be a very hot summer, and adding that the seasons had changed greatly since he was a boy a long time ago. He said that the happiest time of one's life was undoubtedly one's schoolboy days, and that he would give anything to be young again. While he expressed these sentiments, which bored us a little, we kept silent. Then he began to talk of school and of books. He asked us whether we had read the poetry of Thomas More, or the works of Sir Walter Scott and Lord Lytton. I pretended that I had read every book he mentioned, so that in the end he said, Ah, I can see you are a bookworm like myself. Now, he added, pointing to Mahony, who was regarding us with open eyes, He is different. He goes in for games. He said he had all Sir Walter Scott's works and all Lord Lytton's works at home, and never tired of reading them. Of course, he said, there were some of Lord Lytton's works which boys couldn't read. Matney asked, why couldn't boys read them? A question which agitated and pained me, because I was afraid the man would think I was as stupid as Mahony. The man, however, only smiled. I saw that he had great gaps in his mouth between his yellow teeth. Then he asked us which of us had the most sweethearts. Mahony mentioned lightly that he had three totties. The man asked me how many had I. I answered that I had none. He did not believe me, and said he was sure I must have one. I was silent. Tell us, said Mahony pertly to the man, how many have you yourself? The man smiled as before, and said that when he was our age he had lots of sweethearts. Every boy, he said, has a little sweetheart. His attitude on this point struck me as strangely liberal in a man of his age. In my heart I thought that what he had said about boys and sweethearts was reasonable, but I disliked the words in his mouth, and I wondered why he shivered once or twice, as if he feared something or felt a sudden chill. As he proceeded, I noticed that his accent was good. He began to speak to us about girls, saying what nice soft hair they had, and how soft their hands were, and how all girls were not so good as they seemed to be if one only knew. There was nothing he liked, he said, so much as looking at a nice young girl, at her nice white hands, and her beautiful soft hair. He gave me the impression that he was repeating something which he had learned by heart, or that, magnetized by some words of his own speech, his mind was slowly circling round and round in the same orbit. At times he spoke as if he were simply alluding to some fact that everybody knew, and at times he lowered his voice and spoke mysteriously, as if he were telling us something secret which he did not wish others to overhear. He repeated his phrases over and over again, varying them and surrounding them with his monotonous voice. I continued to gaze towards the foot of the slope, listening to him. After a long while, his monologue paused. He stood up slowly, saying that he had to leave us for a minute or so. A few minutes, and, without changing the direction of my gaze, I saw him walking slowly away from us towards the near end of the field. We remained silent when he had gone. After a silence of a few minutes, I heard Mahony exclaim, I say, look what he's doing. As I neither answered nor raised my eyes, Mahony exclaimed again, 
I say, but he's a queer old jotter. In case he asked for our names, I said, let you be Murphy and I'll be Smith. We said nothing further to each other. I was still considering whether I would go away or not when the man came back and sat down beside us again. Hardly had he sat down when Mahony, catching sight of the cat which had escaped him, sprang up and pursued her across the field. The man and I watched the chase. The cat escaped once more, and the Mahony began to throw stones at the wall she had escalated. Desisting from this, he began to wander about the far end of the field aimlessly. After an interval, the man spoke to me. He said that my friend was a very rough boy, and asked did he get whipped often at school. I was going to reply indignantly that we were not national school boys to be whipped, as he called it, but I remained silent. He began to speak on the subject of chastising boys. His mind, as if magnetized again by his speech, seemed to circle slowly round and round its new centre. He said that when boys were that kind, they ought to be whipped and well whipped. When a boy was rough and unruly, there was nothing would do him any good but a good sound whipping. A slap on the hand or a box on the ear was no good. What he wanted was to get a nice, warm whipping. I was surprised at this sentiment and involuntarily glanced at his face. As I did so, I met the gaze of a pair of bottle-green eyes peering at me from under a twitching forehead. I turned my eyes away again. The man continued his monologue. He seemed to have forgotten his recent liberalism. He said that if ever he found a boy talking to girls or having a girl for a sweetheart, he would whip him and whip him, and that would teach him not to be talking to girls. And if a boy had a girl for a sweetheart and told lies about it, then he would give him such a whipping as no boy ever got in this world. He said that there was nothing in this world he would like so well as that. He described to me how he would whip such a boy as if he were unfolding some elaborate mystery. He would love that, he said, better than anything in this world. And his voice, as he led me monotonously through the mystery, grew almost affectionate and seemed to plead with me that I should understand him. I waited till his monologue paused again. Then I stood up abruptly. Lest I should betray my agitation, I delayed a few moments, pretending to fix my shoe properly, and then saying that I was obliged to go, I bade him good day. I went up the slope calmly, but my heart was beating quickly with fear that he would seize me by the ankles. When I reached the top of the slope, I turned round, and without looking at him, called loudly across the field, Murphy! My voice had an accent of forced bravery in it, and I was ashamed of my paltry stratagem. I had to call the name again before Mahony saw me and hallooed in answer. How my heart beat as it came running across the field to me. He ran as if to bring me aid, and I was penitent, for in my heart I had always despised him a little. End of An Encounter by James Joyce Tony's Wife by Alice Dunbar This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Tony's Wife by Alice Dunbar Give me five cents worth of candy, please. It was the little Jew girl who spoke, and Tony's wife roused herself from her knitting to rise and count out the multi-hued candy, which should go in exchange for the dingy nickel grasped in warm, damp fingers. Three long sticks, carefully wrapped in crispest brown paper, and a half dozen or more of pink candy fish for lagniap, and the little Jew girl sped away in blissful contentment. Tony's wife resumed her knitting with a stifled sigh until the next customer should come. A low growl caused her to look up apprehensively. Tony himself stood beetle-browed and huge in the small doorway. Get up from there, he muttered, and open two dozen oysters right away. The Elliots want em. His English was unaccented. It was long since he had seen Italy. 
She moved meekly behind the counter and began work on the thick shells. Tony stretched his long neck up the street. Mr. Tony, Mama wants some charcoal. The very small voice at his feet must have pleased him, for his black brows relaxed into a smile, and he poked the little one's chin with a hard, dirty finger as he emptied the ridiculously small bucket of charcoal into the child's bucket and gave a banana for lagniappe. The cracking of shells went on behind, and a stifled sob arose as a bit of sharp edge cut into the thin, worn fingers that clasped the knife. Hurry up there, will you? growled the black brows. The Elliots are sending for the oysters. She deftly strained and counted them, and, after wiping her fingers, resumed her seat and took up the endless crochet work with her usual stifled sigh. Tony and his wife had always been in this same little queer old shop on Britannia Street, at least to the memory of the oldest inhabitant of the neighborhood. When or how they came, or how they stayed, no one knew. It was enough that they were there, like a sort of ancestral fixture to the street. The neighborhood was fine enough to look down upon these two tumble-down shops at the corner, kept by Tony and Mrs. Murphy, the grocer. It was a semi-fashionable locality, far uptown, away from the old-time French quarter. It was the sort of neighborhood where millionaires live before their fortunes are made, and fashionable, high-priced private schools flourish, where the small cottages are occupied by aspiring school teachers and choir singers. Such was this locality, and you must admit that it was indeed a condescension to tolerate Tony and Mrs. Murphy. He was a great, black-bearded, hoarse-voiced, six-foot specimen of Italian humanity, who looked in his little shop and on the prosaic pavement of Britannia Street somewhat as Hercules might seem in a modern drawing-room. You instinctively thought of wild mountain passes and the gleaming dirks of bandit contadini in looking at him. What his last name was, no one knew. Someone had maintained once that he had been christened Antonio Malatesta, but that was unauthentic, and as little to be believed as that other wild theory that her name was Mary. She was meek, pale, little, ugly, and German. Altogether, part of his arms and legs would have very decently made another larger than she. Her hair was pale and drawn in, sleek, thin tightness away from a pinched, pitiful face, whose dull, cold eyes hurt you, because you knew they were trying to mirror sorrow, and could not, because of their expressionless quality. No matter what the weather, or what her other toilet, she always wore a thin little shawl of dingy brick-dust hue about her shoulders. No matter what the occasion or what the day, she always carried her knitting with her, and seldom ceased the incessant twist-twist of the shining steel among the white cotton meshes. She might put down the needles and lace into the spool-box long enough to open oysters, or wrap up fruit and candy, or count out wood and coal into infinitesimal portions, or do her housework. But the knitting was snatched with avidity at the first spare moment, and the worn, white, blue-marked fingers, half enclosed in kid glove stalls for protection, would writhe and twist in and out again. Little girls just learning to crochet borrowed their patterns from Tony's wife, and it was considered quite a mark of advancement to have her inspect a bit of lace done by eager, chubby fingers. The ladies in larger houses, whose husbands would be millionaires some day, bought her lace and gave it to their servants for Christmas presents. As for Tony, when she was slow in opening his oysters or in cooking his red beans and spaghetti, he roared at her and prefixed picturesque adjectives to her lace, which made her hide it under her apron with a fearsome look in her dull eyes. He hated her in a lusty, roaring fashion, 
as a healthy beefy boy hates a sick cat and torments it to madness when she displeased him he beat her and knocked her frail form on the floor the children could tell when this had happened her eyes would be red and there would be blue marks on her face and neck poor mrs tony they would say and nestle close to her tony did not roar at her for petting them perhaps because they spent money on the multi-hued candy in glass jars on the shelves her mother appeared upon the scene once and stayed a short time but tony got drunk one day and beat her because she ate too much and she disappeared soon after when she came and where she departed no one could tell not even mrs murphy the pauline pry and gazette of the block tony had gout and suffered for many days in roaring helplessness the while his foot bound and swathed in many folds of red flannel lay on the chair before him in proportion as his gout increased and he bawled from pure physical discomfort she became light-hearted and moved about the shop with real brisk cheeriness he could not hit her then without such pain that after one or two trials he gave up in disgust so the dull years had passed and life had gone on pretty much the same for tony and the german wife and the shop the children came on sunday evenings to buy the stick candy and on weekdays for coal and wood the servants came to buy oysters for the larger houses and to gossip over the counter about their employers the little dry woman knitted and the big man moved lazily in and out in his red flannel shirt exchanged politics with the tailor next door through the window or lounged into mrs murphy's bar and drank fiercely some of the children grew up and moved away and other little girls came to buy candy and eat pink lanyap fishes and the shop still thrived one day tony was ill more than the mummified foot of gout or the wheeze of asthma he must keep his bed and send for the doctor she clutched his arm when he came and pulled him into the tiny room is it is it anything much doctor she gasped Escalapius shook his head as wisely as the occasion would permit she followed him out of the room into her shop do you will he get well doctor Escalapius buttoned up his frock coat smoothed his shining hat cleared his throat then replied oracularly madam he is completely burned out inside empty as a shell madam empty as a shell he cannot live for he has nothing to live on as the cobblestones rattled under the doctor's equipage rolling leisurely up pretania street tony's wife sat in her chair and laughed laughed with a hearty joyousness that lifted the film from the dull eyes and disclosed a sparkle beneath the drear days went by and tony lay like a veritable samson shorn of his strength for his voice was sunken to a hoarse sibilant whisper and his black eyes gazed fiercely from the shock of hair and beard about a white face life went on pretty much as before in the shop the children paused to ask how mr tony was and even hushed the jingles of their bell hoops as they passed the door red-headed jimmy mrs murphy's nephew did the hard jobs such as splitting wood and lifting coal from the bin and in the intervals between tending the fallen giant and waiting on the customers tony's wife sat in her accustomed chair knitting fiercely with an inscrutable smile about her purple compressed mouth then john came introducing himself serpent-wise into the eden of her bosom john was tony's brother huge and bluff too but fair and blond with the beauty of northern italy with the same lack of race pride which tony had displayed in selecting his german spouse john had taken unto himself betty a daughter of Aaron, aggressive powerful 
and cross-eyed. He turned up now, having heard of this illness, and assumed an air of remarkable authority at once. A hunted look stole into the dull eyes, and after John had departed with blustering directions as to Tony's welfare, she crept to his bedside timidly. Tony, she said, Tony, you're very sick. An inarticulate growl was the only response. Tony, you ought to see the priest. You mustn't go any longer without taking the sacrament. The growl deepened into words. Don't want any priest. You're always after some sniveling old woman's fuss. You and Mrs. Murphy go on with your church. It won't make you any better. She shivered under this parting shot and crept back into the shop. Still the priest came next day. She followed him into the bedside and knelt timidly. Tony, she whispered, here's Father Leblanc. Tony was too languid to curse out loud. He only expressed his hate in a toss of the black beard and shaggy mane. Tony, she said nervously, won't you do it now? It won't take long, and it will be better for you when you go. Oh, Tony, don't, don't laugh. Please, Tony, here's the priest. But the titan roared aloud. No, get out. Think I'm a-going to give you a chance to grab my money now? Let me die and go to hell in peace. Father LeBlanc knelt meekly and prayed, and the woman's weak pleadings continued. Tony, I've been true and good and faithful to you. Don't die and leave me no better than before. Tony, I do want to be a good woman once, a real for true married woman. Tony, here's the priest. Say yes. And she wrung her ringless hands. You want my money, said Tony slowly, and you shan't have it, not a cent. John shall have it. Father LeBlanc shrank away like a fading specter. He came next day, and next day, only to see reenacted the same piteous scene, the woman pleading to be made a wife ere death hushed Tony's blasphemies, the man chuckling in pain-racked glee at the prospect of her bereaved misery. Not all the prayers of Father LeBlanc, nor the wailings of Mrs. Murphy, could alter the determination of the will beneath the shock of hair. He gloated in his physical weakness at the tenacious grasp on his mentality. Tony, she wailed on the last day, her voice rising to a shriek in its eagerness. Tell them I'm your wife. It'll be the same. Only say it, Tony, before you die. He raised his head and turned stiff eyes and gibbering mouth on her. Then, with one chill finger, pointing at John, fell back dully and heavily. They buried him with many honors by the Society of Italia's sons. John took possession of the shop when they returned home, and found the money hidden in the chimney corner. As for Tony's wife, since she was not his wife after all, they sent her forth in the world penniless, her worn fingers clutching her bundle of clothes in nervous agitation, as though they regretted the time lost from knitting. End of Tony's Wife by Alice Dunbar That Spot by Jack London This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson I don't think much of Stephen Mackay any more, though I used to swear by him. I know that in those days I loved him more than my brother. If ever I meet Stephen Mackay again, I shall not be responsible for my actions. It passes beyond me that a man with whom I shared food and blanket, and with whom I mushed over the Chilcoot Trail, should turn out the way he did. I always sized Steve up as a square man, a kindly comrade without an iota of anything vindictive or malicious in his nature. 
I shall never trust my judgment in men again. Why, I nursed that man through typhoid fever. We starved together on the headwaters of the Stuart, and he saved my life on the little salmon. And now, after the years we were together, all I can say of Stephen Mackay is that he is the meanest man I ever knew. We started for the Klondike in the fall rush of 1897, and we started too late to get over Chilcoot Pass before the freeze-up. We packed our outfit on our backs part way over, when the snow began to fly, and then we had to buy dogs in order to sled it the rest of the way. That was how we came to get that spot. Dogs were high, and we paid one hundred and ten dollars for him. He looked worth it. I say looked, because he was one of the finest appearing dogs I ever saw. He weighed sixty pounds, and he had all the lines of a good sled animal. We never could make out his breed. He wasn't husky, or Malamute, nor Hudson Bay. He looked like all of them, and he didn't look like any of them. And on top of it all, he had some of the white man's dog in him, for on one side, in the thick of the mixed yellow, brown, red, and dirty white that was his prevailing colour, there was a spot of coal black, as big as a water bucket. That was why we called him Spot. He was a good looker, all right. When he was in condition, his muscles stood out in bunches all over him. And he was the strongest-looking brute I ever saw in Alaska, also the most intelligent-looking. To run your eyes over him, you'd think he could outpull three dogs of his own weight. Maybe he could, but I never saw it. His intelligence didn't run that way. He could steal and forage to perfection. He had an instinct that was positively gruesome for divining when work was to be done and for making a sneak accordingly. And for getting lost and not staying lost, he was nothing short of inspired. But when it came to work, the way that intelligence dribbled out of him and left him a mere clot of wobbling, stupid jelly would make your heart bleed. There are times when I think it wasn't stupidity. Maybe, like some men I know, he was too wise to work. I shouldn't wonder if he put it all over us with that intelligence of his. Maybe he figured it all out and decided that a licking now and again and no work was a whole lot better than work all the time and no licking. He was intelligent enough for such a computation. I tell you, I've sat and looked into that dog's eyes till the shivers run up and down my spine and the marrow crawled like yeast. What of the intelligence I saw shining out? I can't express myself about that intelligence. It is beyond mere words. I saw it, that's all. At times it was like gazing into a human soul to look into his eyes, and what I saw there frightened me, and started all sorts of ideas in my own mind of reincarnation and all the rest. I tell you, I sensed something big in that brute's eyes. There was a message there, but I wasn't big enough myself to catch it. Whatever it was, it baffled me. I can't give an inkling of what I saw in that brute's eyes. It wasn't light, it wasn't colour. It was something that moved away back when the eyes themselves weren't moving. And I guess I didn't see it move either. I only sensed that it moved. It was an expression, that's what it was, and I got an impression of it. No, it was different from a mere expression. It was more than that. I don't know what it was, but it gave me a feeling of kinship just the same. Oh, no, not sentimental kinship. It was rather a kinship of equality. Those eyes never pleaded like a deer's eyes. They challenged. No, it wasn't defiance. It was just a calm assumption of equality. And I don't think it was deliberate. My belief is that it was unconscious on his part. It was there because it was there, and it couldn't help shining out. No, I don't mean shine. It didn't shine. It moved. I know I'm talking rot, but if you'd looked into that animal's eyes the way I have, you'd understand. Steve was affected the same way I was. Why, I tried to kill that spot once. He was no good for anything, and I fell down on it. I led him out into the brush, and he came along slow and unwilling. He knew what was going on. I stopped in a likely place, put my foot on the rope, and pulled my big colts. And that dog sat down, 
and looked at me. I tell you, he didn't plead. He just looked. And I saw all kinds of incomprehensible things moving, yes, moving, in those eyes of his. I didn't really see them move. I thought I saw them. For, as I said before, I guess I only sensed them. And I want to tell you right now that it got beyond me. It was like killing a man, a conscious, brave man, who looked calmly into your gun as much as to say, Who's afraid? Then, too, the message seemed so near that, instead of pulling the trigger quick, I stopped to see if I could catch the message. There it was, right before me, glimmering all around in those eyes of his. And then it was too late. I got scared. I was trembly all over, and my stomach generated a nervous palpitation that made me seasick. I just sat down and looked at that dog, and he looked at me, till I thought I was going crazy. Do you want to know what I did? I threw down the gun and ran back to camp with the fear of God in my heart. Steve laughed at me, but I noticed that Steve led Spot into the woods a week later for the same purpose, and that Steve came back alone, and a little later Spot drifted back too. At any rate, Spot wouldn't work. We paid a hundred and ten dollars for him from the bottom of our sack, and he wouldn't work. He wouldn't even tighten the traces. Steve spoke to him the first time we put him in harness, and he sort of shivered. That was all. Not an ounce on the traces. He just stood still and wobbled like so much jelly. Steve touched him with the whip. He yelped, but not an ounce. Steve touched him again, a bit harder, and he howled. The regular long wolf howl. Then Steve got mad and gave him half a dozen, and I came on the run from the tent. I told Steve he was brutal with the animal, and we had some words, the first we'd ever had. He threw the whip down in the snow and walked away, mad. I picked it up and went to it. That Spot trembled and wobbled and cowered before ever I swung the lash, and with the first bite of it he howled like a lost soul. Next he lay down in the snow. I started the rest of the dogs and they dragged him along, while I threw the whip into him. He rolled over on his back and bumped along, his four legs waving in the air, himself howling as though he was going through a sausage machine. Steve came back and laughed at me, and I apologized for what I'd said. There was no getting any work out of that spot, and to make up for it, he was the biggest pig glutton of a dog I ever saw. On top of that, he was the cleverest thief. There was no circumventing him. Many a breakfast we went without our bacon, because Spot had been there first, and it was because of him that we nearly starved to death up the Stuart. He figured out the way to break into our meat cache, and what he didn't eat, the rest of the team did. But he was impartial. He stole from everybody. He was a restless dog, always very busy snooping around or going somewhere. And there was never a camp within five miles that he didn't raid. The worst of it was that they always came back on us to pay his board bill, which was just being the law of the land, but it was mighty hard on us, especially that first winter on the Chilkoot, when we were busted paying for whole hams and sides of bacon that we never ate. He could fight to that spot. He could do everything but work. He never pulled a pound, but he was the boss of the whole team. The way he made those dogs stand around was an education. He bullied them, and there was always one or more of them fresh marked with his fangs. But he was more than a bully. He wasn't afraid of anything that walked on four legs, and I've seen him march single-handed into a strange team without any provocation whatever, and put the kibosh on the whole outfit. Did I say he could eat? I caught him eating the whip once. That's straight. He started in at the lash, and when I caught him, he was down to the handle and still going. But he was a good looker. At the end of the first week, we sold him for $75 to the mounted police. They had experienced dog drivers, and we knew that by the time he'd covered the 600 miles to Dawson, he'd be a good sled dog. I say we knew, for we were just getting acquainted with that spot. A little later, we were not brash enough to know anything where he was concerned. A week later, we woke up in the morning 
to the dangdest dog fight we'd ever heard. It was that spot come back, and knocking the team into shape. We ate a pretty depressing breakfast, I can tell you, but cheered up two hours afterward when we sold him to an official courier, bound in to Dawson with government dispatches. That spot was only three days in coming back, and, as usual, celebrated his arrival with a rough house. We spent the winter and spring, after our own outfit was across the pass, freighting other people's outfits, and we made a fat stake. Also, we made money out of Spot. If we sold him once, we sold him twenty times. He always came back, and no one asked for their money. We didn't want the money. We'd have paid handsomely for anyone to take him off our hands for keeps. We had to get rid of him, and we couldn't give him away, for that would have been suspicious. But he was such a fine looker that we never had any difficulty in selling him. Unbroke, we'd say, and they'd pay an old price for him. We sold him as low as twenty-five dollars, and once we got back a hundred and fifty for him. That particular party returned him in person, refused to take his money back, and the way he abused us was something awful. He said it was cheap at the price to tell us what he thought of us, and we felt he was so justified that we never talked back. But to this day, I've never quite regained all the old self-respect that was mine before that man talked to me. When the ice cleared out of the lakes and rivers, we put our outfit in a Lake Bennett boat and started for Dawson. We had a good team of dogs, and of course we piled them on top the outfit. That spot was along. There was no losing him, and a dozen times the first day he knocked one or other of the dogs overboard in the course of fighting with them. It was close quarters, and he didn't like being crowded. "'What that dog needs is space,' Steve said the second day. "'Let's maroon him.' We did, running the boat in at Caribou Crossing for him to jump ashore. Two of the other dogs, good dogs, followed him, and we lost two whole days trying to find them. We never saw those two dogs again, but the quietness and relief we enjoyed made us decide, like the man who refused his hundred and fifty, that it was cheap at the price. For the first time in months Steve and I laughed and whistled and sang. We were as happy as clams. The dark days were over. The nightmare had been lifted. That spot was gone. Three weeks later, one morning, Steve and I were standing on the river bank at Dawson. A small boat was just arriving from Lake Bennett. I saw Steve give a start, and heard him say something that was not nice, and that was not under his breath. Then I looked, and there, in the bow of the boat, with ears pricked up, sat Spot. Steve and I sneaked immediately, like beaten curs, like cowards, like absconders from justice. It was this last that the lieutenant of police thought when he saw us sneaking. He surmised that there were law officers in the boat who were after us. He didn't wait to find out, but kept us in sight, and in the M&M saloon got us in a corner. We had a merry time explaining, for we refused to go back to the boat and meet Spot, and finally he held us under guard of another policeman while he went to the boat. After we got clear of him, we started for the cabin, and when we arrived, there was that spot, sitting on the stoop, waiting for us. Now how did he know we lived there? There were 40,000 people in Dawson that summer, and how did he savvy our cabin out of all the cabins? How did he know we were in Dawson anyway? I leave it to you. But don't forget what I have said about his intelligence, and that immortal something I have seen glimmering in his eyes. There was no getting rid of him any more. There were too many people in Dawson who had bought him up on Chilcoot, and the story got around. Half a dozen times we put him on board steamboats going down the Yukon, and he merely went ashore at the first landing and trotted back up the bank. We couldn't sell him, we couldn't kill him, both Steve and I had tried, and nobody else was able to kill him. He bore a charmed life. I've seen him go down in a dogfight in the main street with fifty dogs on top of him, and when they were separated, he'd appear on all his four legs, unharmed, while two of the dogs that had been on top of him would be lying dead. 
I saw him steal a chunk of moose meat from Major Dinwiddie's cache so heavy that he could just keep one jump ahead of Mrs. Dinwiddie's squaw cook, who was after him with an axe. As he went up the hill, after the squaw gave out, Major Dinwiddie himself came out and pumped his Winchester into the landscape. He emptied his magazine twice and never touched that spot. Then a policeman came along and arrested him for discharging firearms inside the city limits. Major Dinwiddie paid his fine, and Steve and I paid him for the moose meat at the rate of a dollar a pound, bones and all. That was what he paid for it. Meat was high that year. I'm only telling what I saw with my own eyes, and now I'll tell you something also. I saw that spot fall through a water hole. The ice was three and a half feet thick, and the current sucked him under like a straw. Three hundred yards below was the big water hole used by the hospital. Spot crawled out of the hospital water hole, licked off the water, bit out the ice that had formed between his toes, trotted up the bank, and whipped a big Newfoundland belonging to the gold commissioner. In the fall of 1898, Steve and I poled up the Yukon on the last water, bound for Stewart River. We took the dogs along, all except Spot. We figured we'd been feeding him long enough. He cost us more time and trouble and money and grub than we got by selling him on the Chilkoot, especially grub. So Steve and I tied him down in the cabin and pulled our freight. We camped that night at the mouth of Indian River, and Steve and I were pretty facetious over having shaken him. Steve was a funny cuss, and I was just sitting up in the blankets and laughing when a tornado hit camp. The way that Spot walked into those dogs and gave them what for was hair-raising. Now how did he get loose? It's up to you. I haven't any theory. And how did he get across the Klondike River? That's another facer. And anyway, how did he know we had gone up the Yukon? You see, we went by water, and he couldn't smell our tracks. Steve and I began to get superstitious about that dog. He got on our nerves, too, and, between you and me, we were just a mite afraid of him. The freeze-up came on when we were at the mouth of Henderson Creek, and we traded him off for two sacks of flour to an outfit that was bound up White River after copper. Now that whole outfit was lost, never trace nor hide nor hair of men, dogs, sleds, nor anything was ever found. They dropped clean out of sight. It became one of the mysteries of the country. Steve and I plugged away up the Stewart, and six weeks afterward that spot crawled into camp. He was a perambulating skeleton and could just drag along, but he got there. And what I want to know is who told him we were up the Stuart. We could have gone a thousand other places. How did he know? You tell me, and I'll tell you. No losing him. At the Mayo he started a row with an Indian dog. The buck who owned the dog took a swing at Spot with an axe, missed him, and killed his own dog. Talk about magic and turning bullets aside. I, for one, consider it a blame sight harder to turn an axe aside with a big buck at the other end of it, and I saw him do it with my own eyes. That buck didn't want to kill his own dog. You've got to show me. I told you about Spot breaking into our meat cache. It was nearly the death of us. There wasn't any more meat to be killed, and meat was all we had to live on. The moose had gone back several hundred miles, and the Indians with them. There we were. Spring was on, and we had to wait for the river to break. We got pretty thin before we decided to eat the dogs, and we decided to eat Spot first. Do you know what that dog did? He sneaked. Now how did he know our minds were made up to eat him? We sat up nights laying for him, but he never came back. And we ate the other dogs. We ate the whole team. And now for the sequel. You know what it is when a big river breaks up and a few billion tons of ice go out, jamming and milling and grinding. Just in the thick of it, when the steward went out, rumbling and roaring, we sighted Spot out in the middle. He'd got caught as he was trying to cross, up above somewhere. Steve and I yelled and shouted and ran up and down the bank, tossing our hats in the air. Sometimes we'd stop and hug each other. We were that boisterous, for we saw Spot's finish. He didn't have a chance in a million. 
he didn't have any chance at all. After the ice run, we got into a canoe and paddled down to the Yukon, and down the Yukon to Dawson, stopping to feed up for a week at the cabins at the mouth of Henderson Creek. And as we came into the bank at Dawson, there sat Spot, waiting for us, his ears pricked up, his tail wagging, his mouth smiling, extending a hearty welcome to us. How did he get out of that ice? How did he know we were coming to Dawson, to the very hour and minute, to be out there on the bank waiting for us? The more I think of that spot, the more I am convinced that there are things in this world that go beyond science. On no scientific grounds can that spot be explained. It's psychic phenomena, or mysticism, or something of that sort, I guess, with a lot of theosophy thrown in. The Klondike is a good country. I might have been there yet and become a millionaire if it hadn't been for Spot. He got on my nerves. I stood him for two years altogether, and then I guess my stamina broke. It was the summer of 1899 when I pulled out. I didn't say anything to Steve. I just sneaked. But I fixed it up all right. I wrote Steve a note and enclosed a package of rough-on rats, telling him what to do with it. I was worn down to skin and bone by that spot, and I was that nervous that I'd jump and look around when there wasn't anybody within hailing distance. But it was astonishing the way I recuperated when I got quit of him. I got back twenty pounds before I arrived in San Francisco, and by the time I'd crossed the ferry to Oakland, I was my old self again, so that even my wife looked in vain for any change in me. Steve wrote to me once, and his letter seemed irritated. He took it kind of hard because I'd left him with Spot. Also, he said he'd used the rough-on rats per directions, and that there was nothing doing. A year went by. I was back in the office and prospering in all ways, even getting a bit fat. And then Steve arrived. He didn't look me up. I read his name in the steamer list and wondered why. But I didn't wander long. I got up one morning and found that spot chained to the gatepost and holding up the milkman. Steve went north to Seattle, I learned, that very morning. I didn't put on any more weight. My wife made me buy him a collar and tag, and within an hour he showed his gratitude by killing her pet Persian cat. There is no getting rid of that spot. He will be with me until I die, for he'll never die. My appetite is not so good since he arrived, and my wife says I am looking peaked. Last night that spot got into Mr. Harvey's hen house, Harvey is my next door neighbour, and killed nineteen of his fancy bred chickens. I shall have to pay for them. My neighbours on the other side quarrelled with my wife and then moved out. Spot was the cause of it. And that is why I am disappointed in Stephen Mackay. I had no idea he was so mean a man. End of That Spot by Jack London The Dumb Man by Sherwood Anderson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for LibriVox.org by Tom Merritt. There is a story. I cannot tell it. I have no words. The story is almost forgotten, but sometimes I remember. The story concerns three men in a house in a street. If I could say the words, I would sing the story. I would whisper it into the ears of women, of mothers. I would run through the street saying it over and over. My tongue would be torn loose. It would rattle against my teeth. The three men are in a room in the house. One is young and dandified. He continually laughs. There is a second man who has a long white beard. He is consumed with doubt. But occasionally his doubt leaves him, and he sleeps. A third man there is, who has wicked eyes, and who moves nervously about the room, rubbing his hands together. The three men are waiting, waiting. Upstairs in the house there's a woman, 
standing with her back to a wall in half darkness by a window. That is the foundation of my story, and everything I will ever know is distilled in it. I remember that a fourth man came to the house, a white, silent man. Everything was as silent as the sea at night. His feet on the stone floor of the room where the three men were made no sound. The man with the wicked eyes became like a boiling liquid. He ran back and forth like a caged animal. The old gray man was infected by his nervousness. He kept pulling at his beard. The fourth man, the white one, went upstairs to the woman. There she was, waiting. How silent the house was, how loudly all the clocks in the neighborhood ticked. The woman upstairs craved love. That must have been the story. She hungered for love with her whole being. She wanted to create in love. When the white silent man came into her presence, she sprang forward. Her lips were parted. There was a smile on her lips. The white one said nothing. In his eyes there was no rebuke, no question. His eyes were as impersonal as stars. Downstairs the wicked one whined and ran back and forth like a little lost hungry dog. The gray one tried to follow him about, but presently grew tired and lay down on the floor to sleep. He never awoke again. The dandified fellow lay on the floor, too. He laughed and played with his tiny black mustache. I have no words to tell what happened in my story. I cannot tell the story. The white silent one may have been death. The waiting eager woman may have been life. Both the old gray bearded man and the wicked one puzzle me. I think, I think and think, but cannot understand them. Most of the time, however, I do not think of them at all. I keep thinking about the dandified man who laughed all through my story. If I could understand him, I could understand everything. I could run through the world telling a wonderful story. I would no longer be dumb. Why was I not given the words? Why am I dumb? I have a wonderful story to tell, but no, no way to tell it. End of The Dumb Man by Sherwood Anderson Read for LibriVox.org by Tom Merritt From the Teeth of the Tide. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Teeth of the Tide by Charles G. D. Roberts. From the House in the Water. A Book of Animal Stories. Hitherto, ever since he had been old enough to leave the den, the mother bear had been leading her fat black cub inland among the tumbled rocks and tangled spruce and pine teaching him to dig for tender roots and nose out grubs and beetles from the rotting stumps Today, feeling the need of saltier fare she led him in the opposite direction down through a cleft in the cliffs and out across the great red glistening mud flats left bare by the ebb of the terrific fundy tides from the secure warmth of his den the cub had heard faint and far off the waves thundering along the bases of the cliffs when the tide was high and the great winds drew heavily in from the sea. The sounds had always made him afraid, and today, though there was no wind, and the tide was so far out that it made no noise but a soft whisper, silken and persuasive, he held back with babyish timidity till his mother brought him to his senses with an unceremonious cuff on the side of the head. With a squall of grieved surprise, he picked himself up, shaking his head as if he had a bee in his ear, and then made haste to follow obediently, close at his mother's huge black heels. From the break in the cliffs, where the bears came down, ran a ledge of shelving rocks on a long, gradual slant across the flats toward the edge of low water. 
the tide was nearing the last of the ebb and now the slope of the shore being very gradual and the difference between high and low water in these turbulent channels something between forty and fifty feet the lapsing fringes of the ebb yellow tawny with silt were a good three-quarters of a mile away from the foot of the cliffs the vast spaces between were smooth oily copper-red mud shining and treacherous in the sun with the narrow black outcrop of the ledge drawn across on so gentle a slant that before it reached the water it was running almost on a parallel with the shoreline along the rocky ledge the old bear led the way pausing to nose at a patch of seaweed here and there or to glance shrewdly into the shallow pools among the rocks the cub obediently followed her example though doubtless with no idea of what he might hope to find but the upper stretches of the ledge near high-water mark offered nothing to reward their quest having been dry for several hours and long ago thoroughly gone over by earlier foragers so the bears pushed on down towards the lower stretches where the ledges were still wet and the long black-green weed masses still dripping and where the limpet covered protuberances of rock still oozed and sparkled with her iron-hard claws the mother bear scraped off a quantity of these limpets and crushed them between her jaws with relish swallowing the salty juices the cub tried clumsily to imitate her but the limpets defied his too tender claws so he ran to his mother thrust her great head aside and greedily licked up a share of her scrapings the sea flavor tickled his palate but the rough hard shells exasperated him they hurt his gums so that he merely rolled them over in his mouth sucked at them a few moments then spat them out indignantly his mother thereupon forsook the unsatisfactory limpets and went prowling on towards the water's edge in search of more satisfying fare as they left the limpets a gaunt figure in grey homespuns carrying a rifle appeared on the crest of the cliffs above caught sight of them and hurriedly took cover behind an overhanging pine the young woodsman's first impulse was to try a long shot at the hulking black shape so conspicuous out on the ledge against the bright water he wanted a bearskin even if the fur was not just then in prime condition but more particularly he wanted the cub to tame and play with if it should prove amenable and to sell ultimately for a good amount to some travelling show on consideration he decided to lie in wait among the rocks till the rising tide should drive the bears back to the upland he exchanged his steel-nosed cartridges for the more deadly mushroom tip filled his pipe and lay back comfortably against the pine trunk to watch through the thin green frondage the foraging of his intended prey the farther they went down the long slant of the ledge the more interested the bears became here the crows and gulls had not had time to capture all the prizes there were savory blue-shelled mussels clinging under the tips of the rocks plump spiral whelks between the oozy tresses of the seaweed orange starfish and bristly sea urchins in the shallow pools all these dainties had shells that the cubs young teeth could easily crush and they yielded meaty morsels that made beetles and grubs seem very meagre fare moreover in the salty bitter of the sea-fruit there was something marvellously stimulating to the appetite from pool to pool the old bear wandered on lured ever by richer prizes just ahead and the cub stuffed till his little stomach was like a black furry ball no longer frisked and tumbled but waddled along beside her with eyes of shiny expectancy as long as he was not too full to walk he was not too full to eat such delicacies as these the fascinating quest led them on and on till at last they found themselves at the water's edge by this time they had travelled a long way from the cleft in the cliffs by which they had come down from the uplands a good half mile of shining mud separated them in a direct line from the cliff base and the woodsman on the height as he watched them muttered to himself if that old bar don't look out the tide's a-goin to catch her afore she knows what she's about most wish i'd a socked it to her afore she'd got so far out jiminy she's seed her mistake now the tide's turned while bear and cub had their noses and paws busy in a little dry pool 
on a sudden a long shallow muddy crested wave had come hissing up over their feet and filled the pool to the brim with its yellow flood lifting her head sharply the old bear glanced at the far-off cliffs and at the mounting tide instantly realizing the peril she started back at a slow lumbering amble up the long long path by which they had come and the cub started too at a brave gallop not far behind her for he was too much afraid of the hissing yellow wave but close at her side between her sheltering form and the shore he felt that she could in some way ward off or subdue the cold and terrifying monster for perhaps two minutes the cubs struggled on gamely although owning to the fact that at this point their path was almost parallel with the water the fugitives made no perceptible gain and the rising wave was on their heels every instant then the greedy feeding produced its effect the little fellow's wind gave out completely with a whimper of pain and fright he dropped back upon his haunches and waited for his mother to save him the old bear turned bounced back and cuffed him so brusquely that he found breath enough to utter a loud squall and go stumbling forward for another score of yards then he gave out and sank upon his too distended stomach whimpering piteously this time the mother seemed to perceive that his case was serious and her anxious wrath subsided she licked him assiduously for a few seconds whining encouragement till at last he got upon his feet again trembling the yellow flood was now lapping on the ledge all about them but a rod or two farther on the rocks bulged up a couple of feet above the surrounding slope thrusting the exhausted youngster ahead of her with nose and paws the old bear gained this point of temporary vantage and then worried and frightened sat down upon her haunches and stared all around her as if trying to decide what should be done the cub lay flat with legs outstretched and mouth wide open panting the tide meanwhile was mounting so swiftly that in a few moments the rise of rocks had become almost an island the ledge was covered before them as well as behind and the only way still open lay straight over the glistening mud the old bear looked at it and whined knowing its treacheries and the woodsman watching with eager interest from the cliffs muttered take to it ye old bug eater thar ain't nothin else left for ye to do this was apparently the conclusion of the old bear herself for now after licking and nuzzling the cub for a few seconds till he stood up she stepped boldly off the rock and started out over the coppery flats the cub having apparently recovered his wind followed briskly probably much heartened by the fact that his progress was in a direction away from the alarming waves there was a desperate need of haste for when they left the rocky lift the tide was already slipping around upon the flats beyond it nevertheless the old bear moved with deliberation she could not hurry the cub and she had to choose her path by some instinct or else by some peculiar keenness of observation she seemed to detect the honey pots or deep pockets of slime that lay concealed beneath the uniformly shining surface of the mud for here she would make an aimless detour losing many precious seconds and there she would sidestep suddenly for several paces and shift her course to a new parallel outside the honey pots the mud was soft and tenacious to a depth varying from a few inches to a couple of feet but with a hard clay foundation beneath the slime through this clinging red ooze the old bear with her huge strength made her way without difficulty but the cub in a few moments began to find himself terribly hampered his fur collected the mud his little paws sank easily but at each step it grew harder to withdraw them at last chancing to stagger aside from his mother's spacious tracks he sank to his belly in the rim of a honey-pot panic-stricken he floundered vainly his nose high in the air and his eyes shut tight while his mother unconscious of what had happened plowed doggedly onward presently he opened his eyes 
his mother was now perhaps ten or a dozen feet ahead apparently deserting him right behind lapping up to his very tail was the crawling wave a heartbroken bawl burst from his throat at that cry the old bear came dashing back red mud halfway up her flanks and plastered all over her shaggy chest taking in the situation at a glance she seized the cub by the nape of the neck with her teeth and tried to drag him free but he squealed so lamentably that she realized that the hide would yield before the mud would the attempt had taken time however and the tide was now well up in the fur of his back thrusting her paw down beneath his haunches she tore him clear with a mighty wrench and a loud sucking of the baffled mud that stroke sent him head over heels some ten feet nearer safety by the time he had picked himself off pawing fretfully at the mud that bedaubed his face and half blinded him his mother was close behind him nosing him along and lifting him forward skillfully with her forepaws the slope of the flats was now so gradual as to be almost imperceptible and the tide therefore seemed to be racing in with fiercer haste as if in wrath at being so long balked of its prey engrossed in her efforts to push the cub forward the mother now lost some of her fine discrimination in regard to honey-pots she pushed the cub straight into one but jerked him back unceremoniously before the mud had time to get any grip upon him pausing for a moment to scrutinize the oozy expanse she thrust the little animal furiously along to the left searching for a safe passage before she could find one however the tide was upon them their feet splashing in the thin yellow wavelets a broken soap-box tossed overboard from some ship came washing up and stranded just before them with a whimper of delight as if he thought the box a safe refuge the cub scrambled upon it but his mother ruthlessly tumbled him off and hustled him onward floundering and splashing you'll have to swim for it old woman growled the now excited watcher behind the pine tree on the cliff as the creeping flood by this time overspread the ooze for a couple of yards ahead of them the mother could no longer discriminate as to what lay beneath it she could do nothing now but dash ahead blindly catching up the cub between her jaws in a grip that made him squeal she launched herself straight toward shore hardly daring to let her feet rest an instant where they touched fortune favored her in this rush she got ahead of the tide she gained upon it perhaps twice her body's length then she paused to drop the cub but the pause was fatal she began to sink instantly she had come upon a honey-pot of stiffer consistency than the rest which had sustained her while she was in swift motion but now in return for that support clutched her in a grip the more inexorable with all her huge strength she strained to wrench herself clear but in vain she had no purchase there was nothing to put forth her strength upon in her terror and despair she squealed aloud with her snout high in the air as if appealing to the blank blue empty sky the cub terror-stricken strove to clamber upon her back that harsh cry of hers however was but the outburst of one moment's weakness the next moment the indomitable old bear was striving silently and systematically to release herself she would wrench one great forearm clear lift it high and feel about for a solid foundation beneath the ooze failing in this she would yield that paw to the enemy again tear the other loose and feel about for a foothold in another direction at the same time she drew out her body to its full length and lay flat so that she might gain as much support as possible by distributing her weight because of this sagacity and because the mire at this point had more substance than in most of the other honey-pots she made a good fight and almost but not quite held her own by the time the tide had once more overtaken her she had sunk but a little way and was still far from giving up the unequal struggle yet for all the great beast's strength and valor and devotion there could have been but one end to that brave battle and mother and cub would have disappeared in a few minutes more under the stealthily whispering 
onrush of the flood, had not the whimsical providence or hazard of the wild come curiously to their aid. Among the jetsam of those restless fundy tides, almost anything that will float may appear, from a matchbox to a barn. What appeared just now was a big spruce log escaped from the boom on some river, emptying into the bay. It came softly wallowing in, lipped by the little waves, and passed close by the nose of the old bear, where she struggled with the water up to her shoulders. Quick as thought, she flashed up a heavy paw, caught the log by one end, and pulled the butt under her chest. The purchase thus gained enabled her to free the other paw, and in a few seconds more the weight of the fore part of her body was on the end of the log, forcing it down to the mud. Greedy as that mud was, it was yet incapable of engulfing a full-grown spruce timber quickly enough to defeat the bear's purpose. Stretching far forward on the submerged log, she strained her muscles to their utmost and slowly drew her hindquarters free from the deadly grip that held them. Then, seizing in her jaws the cub, which was swimming and whimpering beside her, she carefully felt her way farther along the log and sat down upon it to rest, clutching the youngster closely in one great forearm. Not till the tide had risen nearly to her neck did the mother move again. She was recovering her strength. Utterly daunted by the peril of the honey-pots, she chose rather to trust the tide itself. At last, catching the cub again by the back of the neck, she swam for the shore. The tide was now within a couple of hundred yards from the bases of the cliffs, and lapping upon solid, sun-baked clay. The strong flood helping her, she swam fast, though laboriously by reason of the burden in her teeth. Soon her hinder feet struck round, but she was afraid to trust it, and nervously drew them up beneath her. A few moments more, and she felt undeniably firm footing, whereupon she plunged forward with a rush and never paused, even to drop the squirming cub, till she was above high-water mark. When at last she set the little beast down, she was in such a hurry to get away from the shore and back into the secure green woods that she would not trust him to follow her as usual, but drove him on ahead as fast as he could move toward the cleft in the cliffs. As they turned up the rugged trail, her haste relaxed, and she went more slowly, but still driving the cub ahead of her, that she might be quite sure that the honey-pots would not reach up and clutch at him again. As the muddy, weary, bedraggled, pathetic-looking pair passed within tempting range of the pine-tree on the cliff-top, the woodsman instinctively threw forward his rifle. But the next moment he dropped it, with a slight flush and gave a quick glance around him as if he feared that unseen eyes might have taken note of the gesture. Hell, he'd muttered, I'd a been no better in a murderer if I'd a gone and plugged the old girl now. End of From the Teeth of the Tide by Charles G. D. Roberts Read by Jewel The Garden of Memories by C. A. Mercer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Garden of Memories by C. A. Mercer. The garden looked dreary and desolate in spite of the afternoon sunshine. The lilac and lavender bushes were past their prime. Their wealth of sweetness had been squandered by riotous offshots. The wind played among the branches and cast changing sun-flecked shadows on the grass-grown paths, narrowed by the encroachment of the box borders that had once lined the way with the stiff precision of troops before a royal progress. The flowers had the air of being overburdened with the monotony of their existence. They could never have had that aspect if they had been only wild flowers and had never experienced human care and companionship. That made the difference. The gate hung on rusty hinges. It answered with a long drawn-out creaking as it was pushed open by a man who had been a stranger to the place for nearly twenty years. 
Yes, the garden was certainly smaller than it had been pictured by his memory. There had been a time when it had appeared as a domain of extensive proportions, and the wood beyond of marvellous depth and density. He was conscious of a sense of disappointment. The property would scarcely realize as high a price in the market as he had hoped, and it was incumbent upon him to part with it, if he would be released from the narrow circumstances that hemmed him in. He had arranged to meet the lawyer there that afternoon. One of the latter's clients had already made a bid for the estate. The timber, at all events, would add to the value. The house faced southward upon the garden. It was here the man had been brought up by an old great-aunt. He guessed later that she had grudged him any of the endearments that death had denied her bestowing upon her own children. Her affections had all been buried before he was born. Besides, he took after the wrong branch of the family. She must have possessed a strong personality. It was difficult to bring to mind that it was no longer an existent force. Every one, from the parson to the servants, had stood a little in awe of her. He remembered the unmoved manner in which she had received the news of the death of a near relative. It had overwhelmed him with a sudden chill, that so she would have received tidings of his own. It had taken all the sunshine in the garden to make him warm again. In the mood that was growing upon him, it would not have much surprised him to find her sitting bolt upright in her carved high-backed chair, as she had sat in the time of his earliest recollections, the thin yellow hands on which the ring stood out folded in her lap. On one occasion she had washed his small hands between hers. The hard luster of the stones acquired a painful association with the ordeal. The blinds would be partially drawn in the musk-scented parlour to save the carpet from further fading, for there had been a tradition of thrift in the family from the time of its settlement, a tradition that had not been maintained by its latest representative. Like the atmosphere of a dream, the years grew dim and misty between now and the time when summer days were longer and sunnier, and it had been counted to him for righteousness if he had amused himself quietly and not given trouble. A stream that he had once dignified with the name of river formed a boundary between the garden and the wood. Although it had shrunk into shallow insignificance, with much beside a faint halo of the romance with which he had endued this early scene of his adventures, still clung to the spot. As he came to the stream he saw the reflection of a face in the water, not his own, but that of one much younger. It was so he met the boy. The child had been placing stepping stones to bridge the stream, and now came across, balancing himself on the slippery surfaces to test his work. It was odd that he had remained unobserved until this moment, but that was due to the fact of the water rushes on the brink being as tall as he. The boy's eyes met those of the man with a frank, unclouded gaze. He did not appear astonished. That is the way when one is young enough to be continually viewing fresh wonders. One takes everything for granted. He saw at a glance that this other was not alien to him. His instinct remained almost as true as those of the wild nature around. For his own part, he had an unmistakable air of possession about him. He appeared to belong to the place as much as the hollyhocks and honeysuckle. And yet, how could that be? Probably a child of the caretaker, the man told himself. He had authorized the agent to do what was best about keeping the house in order. He had not noticed what signs it had to show of habitation. Now he saw from the distance 
that it had not the unoccupied appearance he had expected of it nor the windows the dark vacant stare of those that no life behind illumines do you live here he asked of the boy yes the boy turned proudly toward the modest gray pile in the manner of introducing it forgetting himself in his subject it's a very old house there's a picture over the bureau in the parlor of the man who built it and planted the trees in the wood hannah says hannah it was a foolish repetition of the name of course there were other hannahs in the world the old servant of that name who had told the man stories in his boyhood had been dead more years than the child could number yes don't you know hannah she'll come and call me in presently and then you'll see her hannah says they the trees have grown up with the family he assumed a queer importance evidently in unconscious mimicry of the one who had repeated the tradition to him and that with them the house will stand or fall do you think the roots really reach so far there was an underlying uneasiness in the tone which it was impossible altogether to disguise as the other expressed his inability to volunteer an opinion on this point the boy went on seeing that his confidences were treated with due respect i dug up one myself once i wished i hadn't afterwards to make myself a christmas tree like i'd read about i just had to hang some old things i had on it it was only tiny fur small enough to go in a flower pot but that night the house shook and the windows rattled as if all the trees in the forest were trying to get in i heard them tapping their bows ever so angrily against the pane as soon as it was light i went out and planted the christmas tree again i hadn't meant to keep it out of the ground long they might have known that have you no playfellows here the boy gave a comprehensive glance around there are the trees they are good fellows i wouldn't part with one of them it's fine to hear them all clap their hands when we are all jolly together there are nests in them too and squirrels we see a lot of one another this statement was not difficult to believe the holland overalls bore evident traces of fellowship with mossy trunks the boy did most of the talking he had more to tell of the founder of the family whose portrait hung in the parlor and how when he the child grew up he rather thought of writing books as that same ancestor had done and making the name great and famous again he had not decided what kind of books he should write yet was it very hard to find words to rhyme if one tried poetry he was at no pains to hide such fancies and ambitions of which his kind are generally too sensitive or too ashamed to speak to their elders and which are as a rule forgotten as soon as outgrown shall we go in the wood now said the boy it's easy enough to cross over the stepping stones yes let us go the man was beginning to see everything through the boy's eyes the garden was again much as he had remembered it enclosed in a world of beautiful mystery nothing was really altered what alteration he had imagined had been merely a transitory one in himself the child had put a warm eager hand into his together they went into the wood as happy as a pair of truant schoolboys they might have been friends of long standing so this is your enchanted forest said the man not really enchanted replied the boy seriously i once read of one but of course it was only in a fairy tale that one vanished as soon as one spoke the right word it would be a very wrong word that could make this vanish he had a way of speaking of the wood as if it were some sacred grove 
His companion suddenly felt guilty, not quite knowing why. Of course someone might cut them down. The boy lowered his voice. It seemed shameful to mention the perpetration of such a deed aloud. It would be terrible to hear them groan when the axe struck them. The young ones mightn't mind so much, but it would be bad for the grandfather trees who've been here from the beginning. Hannah says one would still hear them wailing on stormy nights. Even if they had been felled and carted away? Yes, even then. Though, to be sure, there would be no one to hear the wailing if it is true that the house must fall too at the same time. But we needn't trouble about that. None of it is likely to happen. You see, if it did, where should I be? He laughed merrily. This last argument appeared to him to be quite conclusive. Such an important consideration placed the awful contingency quite out of the question and transformed it into nothing more than a joke. The child's laughter died away as they both stood still to listen. Each thought he had heard his own name called. It's Hannah, said the boy, and off he raced toward the house, barely saving himself from running into the arms of another person who had turned in at the gate. Who was the boy who ran round by the espaliers a minute ago? One would scarcely have judged him to be a child of the caretaker. The man's heart sank with a dull thud. Something had told him the answer before it came. Child? The lawyer looked puzzled. I did not see one. No children have any business in this garden. Neither is there any caretaker here. The house has been shut up altogether since the old servant you called Hannah died eleven years ago. They had reached the veranda. The westering sun had faded off the windows. It was easy to see that the house was empty. The shutters were up within, and the panes dark and weather-stained. Birds had built their nests undisturbed about the chimney-stacks. The hearth-stones had long been cold. My client is willing to purchase the property on the terms originally proposed the lawyer was saying. He contemplates investing in it as a building site. Of course, the timber would have to be felled. A breeze passed through the treetops like a shudder. The younger man interposed. I'm sorry you should have had the trouble of coming here, but I have decided to keep the old place after all, stick and stone. It is not right it should go out of the family. I must pull my affairs together as well as I can without that. The little phantom of his dead boyhood was to suffer no eviction. End of the Garden of Memories by C. A. Mercer Read by Lars Rolander A Lodging for the Night by Robert Louis Stevenson it was late in November 1456. A snow fell over Paris with rigorous, relentless persistence. Sometimes the wind made a sally and scattered it in flying vortices. Sometimes there was a lull, and flake after flake descended out of the black night air, silent, circuitous, interminable. To poor people looking up under moist eyebrows, it seemed a wonder where it all came from. Master Francis Villon, had propounded an alternative that afternoon at a tavern window. Was it only pagan Jupiter plucking geese upon Olympus, or were the holy angels moulting? He was only a poor master of arts, he went on, and as the question somewhat touched upon divinity, he does not venture to conclude. A silly old priest from Montagi, who was among the company, treated the young rascal to a bottle of wine in honour of the jests and the grimaces with which it was accompanied, and swore on his own white beard that he had been just such another irreverent dog when he was Villon's age. The air was raw and pointed, but not far below freezing, and the flakes were large, damp, and adhesive. 
the whole city was sheeted up an army might have marched from end to end and not a footfall given the alarm if there were any belated birds in heaven they saw the island like a large white patch and the bridges like slim white spars on the black ground of the river high up overhead the snow settled among the tracery of the cathedral towers many a niche was drifted full many a statue wore a long white bonnet on its grotesque or stainted head the gargoyles had been transformed into great false noses drooping toward the point the crockets were like upright pillows swollen on one side in the intervals of the wind there was a dull sound of dripping about the precincts of the church the cemetery of st john had taken its own share of the snow all the graves were decently covered tall white housetops stood around in grave array worthy burghers were long ago in bed benight capped like their domiciles there was no light in all the neighbourhood but a little peep from a lamp that hung swinging in the church door and tossed the shadows to and fro in time to its oscillations the clock was hard on ten when the patrol went by with halberds and a lantern beating their hands and they saw nothing suspicious about the cemetery of st john yet there was a small house backed up against the cemetery wall which was still awake and awake to evil purpose in that snoring district there was not much to betray it from without only a stream of warm vapour from the chimney top a patch where the snow melted on the roof and a few half obliterated footprints at the door but within behind the shuttered windows master francis villon the poet and some of the thievish crew with whom he consorted were keeping the night alive and passing round the bottle a great pile of living embers diffused a strong and ruddy glow from the arched chimney before this straddled dom nicholas the picardy monk with his skirts picked up and his fat legs bared to the comfortable warmth his dilated shadow cut the room in half and the firelight only escaped on either side of his broad person and in a little pool between his outspread feet his face had the beery bruised appearance of the continual drinkers it was covered with a network of congested veins purple in ordinary circumstances but now pale violet for even with his back to the fire the cold pinched him on the other side his cowl had half fallen back and made a strange excrescence on either side of his bull neck so he straddled grumbling and cut the room in half with the shadow of his portly frame on the right villon and guy tabari were huddled together over a scrap of parchment villon making a ballad which he was to call the ballad of roast fish and tabari spluttering admiration at his shoulder the poet was a rag of a man dark little and lean with hollow cheeks and thin black locks he carried his four-and-twenty years with feverish animation greed had made folds about his eyes evil smiles had puckered his mouth the wolf and pig struggled together in his face it was an eloquent sharp ugly earthly countenance his hands were small and prehensile with fingers knotted like a cord and they were continually flickering in front of him in violent and expressive pantomime as for tabari a broad complacent admiring imbecility breathed from his squashed nose and slobbering lips he had become a thief just as he might have become the most decent of burgesses by the imperious chance that rules the lives of human geese and human donkeys at the monk's other hand montigny and thevenin poncet played a game of chance about the first there clung some favour of good birth and training as about a fallen angel something long lithe and courtly in the person something aquiline and darkling in the face thevenin poor soul was in great feather he had done a good stroke of knavery that afternoon in the faubourg saint jacques and all night he had been gaining from montigny a flat smile illuminated his face his bold head shone rosily in a garland of red curls his little protuberant stomach shook with silent chucklings as he swept in his gains doubles or quits said thevenin montigny nodded grimly some may prefer to dine in state wrote villon on bread and cheese on silver plate or or help me out guido tabari giggled or parsley on a silver dish scribbled the poet 
the wind was freshening without it drove the snow before it and sometimes raised its voice in a victorious swoop and made sepulchral grumblings in the chimney the cold was growing sharper as the night went on villon protruding his lips imitated the gust with something between a whistle and a groan it was an eerie uncomfortable talent of the poets much detested by the picardy monk can't you hear it rattle in the gibbet said villon they are all dancing the devil's jig on nothing up there you may dance my gallants but you'll be none the warmer Phew! what a gust down went somebody just now a meddler the fewer on the three-legged meddler tree i say dom nicholas it'll be cold to-night on the saint denis road he asked dom nicholas winked both his big eyes and seemed to choke upon his adam's apple montfaucon the great grisly paris gibbet stood hard by the saint denis road and the pleasantry touched him on the raw as for tabari he laughed immoderately over the meddlers he had never heard anything more light-hearted and he held his sides and crowed villon fetched him a fillip on the nose which turned his mirth into an attack of coughing oh stop that now said villon and think of rhymes to fish doubles or quits said montigny doggedly with all my heart quoth thevenin is there any more in that bottle asked the monk open another said villon how do you ever hope to fill that big hogshead your body with little things like bottles and how do you expect to get to heaven how many angels do you fancy can be spared to carry up a single monk from picardy or do you think yourself another elias and they'll send the coach for you ominibus impossibile replied the monk as he filled his glass tabari was in ecstasies villon philipped his nose again laugh at my jokes if you like he said he was very good objected tabari villon made a face at him think of rhymes to fish he said what have you to do with latin you'll wish you knew none of it at the great assizes when the devil calls for guido tabari clericus the devil with the humpback and red-hot finger-nails talking of the devil he added in a whisper look at montigny all three peered covertly at the gamester he did not seem to be enjoying his luck his mouth was a little to a side one nostril nearly shut and the other much inflated the black dog was on his back as people say in terrifying nursery metaphor and he breathed hard under the gruesome burden he looks as if he could knife him whispered tabari with round eyes the monk shuddered and turned his face and spread his open hands to the red embers it was the cold that thus affected dom nicholas and not any excess of moral sensibility come now said villon about this ballad how does it run so far and beating time with his hand he read it aloud to tabari they were interrupted at the fourth rhyme by a brief and fatal movement among the gamesters the round was completed and thevenin was just opening his mouth to claim another victory when montigny leaped up swift as an adder and stabbed him to the heart the blow took effect before he had time to utter a cry before he had time to move a tremor or two convulsed his frame his hands opened and shut his heels rattled on the floor then his head rolled backward over one shoulder with the eyes open and thevenin poncet's spirit had returned to him who made it everyone sprang to his feet but the business was over in two twos the four living fellows looked at each other in rather a ghastly fashion the dead man contemplating a corner of the roof with a singular and ugly leer my god said tabari and he began to pray in latin villon broke out into hysterical laughter he came a step forward and clucked a ridiculous bow at thevenin and laughed still louder then he sat down suddenly all of a heap upon a stool and continued laughing bitterly as though he would shake himself to pieces montigny recovered his composure first let's see what he has about him remarked and he picked the dead man's pockets with a practised hand and divided the money into four equal portions on the table there's for you he said the monk received his share with a deep sigh and a single stealthy glance at the dead thevenin who was beginning to sink into himself and topple sideways off the chair we're all for it cried villon swallowing his mirth it's a hanging job for every man jack of us that's here not to speak of those who aren't he made a shocking gesture in the air with his raised right hand 
and put out his tongue and threw his head on one side so as to counterfeit the appearance of one who has been hanged then he pocketed his share of the spoil and executed a shuffle with his feet as if to restore the circulation tabari was the last to help himself he made a dash at the money and retired to the other end of the apartment montigny stuck thevenin upright in the chair and drew out the dagger which was followed by a jet of blood you fellows had better be moving he said as he wiped the blade on his victim's doublet i think we had returned villon with a gulp damn his fat head he broke out it sticks in my throat like phlegm what right has a man to have red hair when he is dead and he fell all of a heap again upon the stool and fairly covered his face with his hands montigny and don nicholas laughed aloud even to Barry feebly chiming in cry baby said the monk i always said he was a woman added montigny with a sneer sit up can't you he went on giving another shake to the murdered body tread out that fire nick but nick was better employed he was quietly taking villon's purse as the poet sat limp and trembling on the stool where he had been making a ballad not three minutes before montigny and tabari dumbly demanded a share of the booty which the monk silently promised as he passed the little bag into the bosom of his gown in many ways an artistic nature unfits a man for practical existence no sooner had the theft been accomplished than villon shook himself jumped to his feet and began helping to scatter and extinguish the embers meanwhile montigny opened the door and cautiously peered into the street the coast was clear there was no meddlesome patrol in sight still it was judged wiser to slip out severally and as villon was himself in a hurry to escape from the neighbourhood of the dead thevenin and the rest were in a still greater hurry to get rid of him before he should discover the loss of his money he was the first by general consent to issue forth into the street the wind had triumphed and swept all the clouds from heaven only a few vapours as thin as moonlight fleeted rapidly across the stars it was bitter cold and by a common optical effect things seemed almost more definite than in the broadest daylight the sleeping city was absolutely still a company of white hoods a field full of little alps below the twinkling stars villon cursed his fortune would it were still snowing now wherever he went he left an indelible trail behind him on the glittering streets wherever he went he was still tethered to the house by the cemetery of st john wherever he went he must weave with his own plodding feet the rope that bound him to the crime and would bind him to the gallows the leer of the dead man came back to him with a new significance he snapped his fingers as if to pluck up his own spirits and choosing a street at random stepped boldly forward in the snow two things preoccupied him as he went the aspect of the gallows at montfaucon in this bright windy phase of the night's existence for one and for another the look of the dead man with his bald head and garland of red curls both struck cold upon his heart and he kept quickening his pace as if he could escape from unpleasant thoughts by mere fleetness of foot sometimes he looked back over his shoulder with a sudden nervous jerk but he was the only moving thing in the white streets except when the wind swooped round a corner and threw up the snow which was beginning to freeze in spouts of glittering dust suddenly he saw a long way before him a black clump and a couple of lanterns the clump was in motion and the lanterns swung as though carried by men walking it was a patrol and though it was merely crossing his line of march he judged it wiser to get out of eyeshot as speedily as he could he was not in the humour to be challenged and he was conscious of making a very conspicuous mark upon the snow just on his left hand there stood a great hotel with some turrets and a large porch before the door it was half ruinous he remembered and had long stood empty and so he made three steps of it and jumped inside the shelter of the porch it was pretty dark inside after the glimmer of the snowy streets and he was groping forward with outspread hands when he stumbled over some substance which offered an indescribable mixture of resistances hard and soft firm and loose his heart gave a leap and he sprang two steps back and stared dreadfully at the obstacle then he gave a little laugh of relief it was only a woman and she dead he knelt beside her to make sure upon this latter point she was freezing cold and rigid like a stick a little ragged finery fluttered in the wind about her hair and her cheeks had been heavily rouged that same afternoon 
Her pockets were quite empty, but in her stocking, underneath the garter, Villon found two of the small coins that went by the names of whites. It was little enough, but it was always something, and the poet was moved with a deep sense of pathos that she should have died before she had spent her money. That seemed to him a dark and pitiable mystery, and he looked from the coins in his hand to the dead woman and back again to the coins, shaking his head over the riddle of man's life. Henry V of England, dying at Vincennes just after he had conquered France, and this poor jade cut off by a cold draught in a great man's doorway, before she had time to spend her couple of whites. It seemed a cruel way to carry on the world. Two whites would have taken such a little while to swander, and yet it would have been one more good taste in the mouth, one more smack of the lips, before the devil got the soul, and the body was left to birds and vermin. He would like to use all his tallow before the light was blown out and the lantern broken. While these thoughts were passing through his mind, he was feeling half mechanically for his purse. Suddenly his heart stopped beating, a feeling of cold scales passed up the back of his legs, and a cold blow seemed to fall upon his scalp. He stood petrified for a moment, then he felt again with one feverish movement, and then his loss burst upon him, and he was covered with perspiration. To spendthrifts money is so living and actual. It is such a thin veil between them and their pleasures. There is only one limit to their fortune, that of time, and a spendthrift with only a few crowns is the emperor of Rome until they are spent. For such a person to lose his money is to suffer the most shocking reverse, and fall from heaven to hell, from all to nothing, in a breath. And all the more he has to put his head in the halter for it. If he may be hanged to-morrow for that same purse, so dearly earned, so foolishly departed. Villon stood and cursed. He threw the two whites into the street, and shook his fist at heaven. He stamped, and was not horrified to find himself trampling the poor corpse. Then he began rapidly to retrace his steps toward the house, beside the cemetery he had forgotten all fear of the patrol which was long gone by at any rate and had no idea but that of his lost purse it was in vain that he looked right and left upon the snow nothing was to be seen he had not dropped it in the streets had it fallen in the house he would have liked dearly to go in and see but the idea of the grisly occupant unmanned him and he saw besides as he drew near that their efforts to put out the fire had been unsuccessful on the contrary, it had broken into a blaze, and a changeful light played in the chinks of the door and window, and revived his terror for the authorities and Paris gibbet. He returned to the hotel with the porch, and groped about upon the snow for the money he had thrown away in his childish passion, but he could only find one white, the other had probably stuck sideways and sunk deeply in. With a single white in his pocket, all his projects for a rousing night in some wild tavern vanished utterly away, and it was not only pleasure that fled laughing from his grasp. Positive discomfort, positive pain, attacked him as he stood ruefully before the porch. His perspiration had dried upon him, and though the wind had now fallen, a binding frost was setting in stronger with every hour, and he felt benumbed and sick at heart. What was to be done? Late as was the hour, improbable as was success, he would try the house of his adopted father, the chaplain of St. Benoit. He ran there all the way and knocked timidly. There was no answer. He knocked again and again, taking heart with every stroke, and at last steps were heard approaching from within. A barred wicket fell open in the iron-studded door and emitted a gush of yellow light. "'Hold up your face to the wicket,' said the chaplain from within. "'It's only me,' whimpered Villon. "'Oh, it's only you, is it?' returned the chaplain, and he cursed him with foul and priestly oaths for disturbing him at such an hour, and bade him to be off to hell where he came from. "'My hands are blue to the wrists,' pleaded Villon. "'My feet are dead and full of twinges. My nose aches with the sharp air. The cold lies in my heart. I may be dead before morning. Only this once, father, and before God I will never ask again.' "'You should have come earlier,' said the ecclesiastic coolly. "'Young men require a lesson now and then.' He shut the wicket and retired deliberately into the interior of the house. Villon was beside himself. He beat upon the door with his hands and feet, and shouted hoarsely after the chaplain. "'Wormy old fox!' he cried. "'If I had my hand under your twist, 
I would send you flying headlong into the bottomless pit. A door shut in the interior, faintly audible to the poet down long passages. He passed his hand over his mouth with an oath, and then the humour of the situation struck him, and he laughed and looked lightly up to heaven, where the stars seemed to be winking over his discomfiture. What was to be done? It looked very like a night in the frosty streets. The idea of the dead woman popped into his imagination and gave him a hearty fright. What had happened to her in the early night might very well happen to him before morning. And he so young, and with such immense possibilities of disorderly amusement before him. He felt quite pathetic over the notion of his own fate, as if it had been someone else's, and made a little imaginative vignette of the scene in the morning when they should find his body. He passed all his chances under review, turning the white between his thumb and forefinger. Unfortunately, he was on bad terms with some old friends who would once have taken pity on him in such a plight. He had lampooned them in verses, he had beaten and cheated them, and yet now, when he was so close to a pinch, he thought there was at least one who might perhaps relent. It was a chance, it was worth trying at least, and he would go and see. On the way two little accidents happened to him, which coloured his musings in a very different manner. For, first he fell in with the track of a patrol, and walked in it for some yards, although it lay out of his direction. And this spirited him up, at least he had confused his trail, for he was still possessed with the idea of people tracking him all about Paris over the snow, and collaring him next morning before he was awake. The other matter affected him very differently. He passed a street corner where, not so long before, a woman and her child had been devoured by wolves. This was just the kind of weather, he reflected, when wolves might take it into their heads to enter Paris again, and a lone man in these deserted streets would run the chance of something worse than a mere scare. He stopped and looked upon the place with unpleasant interest. It was a centre where several lanes intersected each other, and he looked down them all one after another, and held his breath to listen, lest he should detect some galloping black things on the snow, or hear the sound of howling between him and the river. He remembered his mother telling him the story, and pointing out the spot, while he was yet a child. His mother, if he only knew where she lived, he might make sure, at least, of shelter. He determined he would inquire upon the morrow. Nay, he would go and see her, too, poor old girl. So thinking, he arrived at his destination, his last hope for the night. The house was quite dark like its neighbours, and yet after a few taps he heard a movement overhead, a door opening, and a cautious voice asking who was there. The poet named himself in a large whisper, and waited, not without some trepidation, the result. Nor had he to wait long. A window was suddenly opened, and a pailful of slops splashed down upon the doorstep. Villon had not been unprepared for something of the sort, and had put himself as much in shelter as the nature of the porch admitted. But for all that, he was deplorably drenched below the waist. His hose began to freeze almost at once. Death from cold and exposure stared him in the face. He remembered he was of physical tendency, and began coughing tentatively. But the gravity of the danger steadied his nerves. He stopped a few hundred yards from the door where he had been so rudely used, and reflected with his finger to his nose. He could only see one way of getting a lodging, and that was to take it. He had noticed a house not far away, which looked as if it might be easily broken into, and thither he betook himself promptly, entertaining himself on the way with the idea of a room still hot, with a table still loaded with the remains of supper, where he might pass the rest of the black hours, and whence he should issue on the morrow with an armful of valuable plate, or even considered on what viands and what wines he should prefer. And as he was calling the roll of his favourite dainties, roast fish presented itself to his mind with an odd mixture of amusement and horror. I shall never finish that ballad, he thought to himself, and then, with another shudder at the recollection, Oh, damn his fat head, he repeated fervently, and spat on the snow. The house in question looked dark at first sight, but as Villon made a preliminary inspection in search of the handiest point of attack, a little twinkle of light caught his eye from behind a curtained window. The devil, he thought, people awake, some student or some saint, confound the crew, 
Can't they get drunk and lie in bed snoring like their neighbours? What's the good of curfew and poor devils of bell ringers jumping at a rope's end in bell towers? What's the use of day if people sit up all night? The gripes to them. He grinned as he saw where his logic was leading him. Every man to his business after all, added he, and if they're awake, by the Lord, I may come by a supper honestly for this once and cheat the devil. He went boldly to the door and knocked with an assured hand. On both previous occasions he had knocked timidly and with some dread of attracting notice, but now when he had just discarded the thought of a burglarious entry, knocking at a door seemed a mighty simple and innocent proceeding. The sound of his blows echoed through the house with thin phantasmal reverberations, as though it were quite empty, and these had scarcely died away before a measured tread drew nearer, a couple of bolts were withdrawn, and one wing was opened broadly, as though no guile or fear of guile were known to those within. A tall figure of a man, muscular and spare, but a little bent, confronted Villon. The head was massive in bulk, but finely sculptured, the nose blunt at the bottom, but refining upward to where it joined a pair of strong and honest eyebrows. The mouth and eyes surrounded with delicate markings, and the whole face based upon a thick white beard, boldly and squarely trimmed. Seen as it was by the light of a flickering hand-lamp, it looked perhaps nobler than it had a right to do, but it was a fine face, honourable rather than intelligent, strong, simple, and righteous. "'You knock late, sir,' said the old man, in resonant, courteous tones. Villon cringed, and brought up many servile wordings of apology. At a crisis of this sort, the beggar was uppermost in him, and the man of genius hid his head with confusion. "'You are cold,' repeated the old man, "'and hungry? Well, step in,' and he ordered him into the house with a noble enough gesture. "'Some great seigneur,' thought Villon, as his host, setting down the lamp on the flagged pavement of the entry, shot the bolts once more into their places. "'You will pardon me if I go in front,' he said, when this was done, and he preceded the poet upstairs into a large apartment, warmed with a pan of charcoal and lit by a great lamp hanging from the roof. It was very bare of furniture, only some gold plate on a sideboard, some folios, and a stand of armour between the windows. Some smart tapestry hung from the walls, representing the crucifixion of our Lord in one piece, and in another scene of shepherds and shepherdesses by a running stream. Over the chimney was a shield of arms. "'Will you seat yourself?' said the old man, "'and forgive me if I leave you. I am alone in my house to-night, and if you are to eat, I must forage for you myself.' No sooner was his host gone than Villon leaped from the chair on which he had just seated himself, and began examining the room with the stealth and passion of a cat. He weighed the gold flagons in his hand, opening all the folios, and investigated the arms upon the shield, and the stuff with which the seats were lined. He raised the window curtains, and saw that the windows were set with rich stained glass in figures, so far as he could see, of martial import. Then he stood in the middle of the room, drew a long breath, and retaining it with puffed cheeks, looked round and round him, turning on his heels, as if to impress every feature of the apartment on his memory. Seven pieces of plate, he said. If there had been ten, I would have risked it. A fine house and a fine old master, so help me all the saints. And just then, hearing the old man's tread returning along the corridor, he stole back to his chair, and began toasting his wet legs before the charcoal pan. His entertainer had a plate of meat in one hand and a jug of wine in the other. He set down the plate upon the table, motioning Villon to draw in his chair, and going to the sideboard, brought back two goblets, which he filled. "'I drink to your better fortune,' he said, gravely touching Villon's cup with his own. "'To our better acquaintance,' said the poet, growing bold. A mere man of the people would have been awed by the courtesy of the old seigneur. But Villon was hardened in that matter. He had made mirth for great lords before now, and found them as black rascals as himself. And so he devoted himself to the viands with a ravenous gusto, while the old man, leaning backward, watched him with steady, curious eyes. "'You have blood on your shoulder, my man,' he said. Montini must have laid his wet right hand upon him as he left the house. He cursed Montini in his heart. "'It was none of my shedding,' he stammered. "'I had not supposed so,' returned his host quietly. "'A brawl?' "'Well, something of that sort,' Villon admitted with a quaver. 
Perhaps a fellow murdered? Oh, no, not murdered, said the poet, more and more confused. It was all fair play, murdered by accident. I had no hand in it. God strike me dead, he added fervently. One rogue the fewer, I dare say, observed the master of the house. You may dare to say that, agreed Vignon, infinitely relieved. As big a rogue as there is between here and Jerusalem. He turned up his toes like a lamb, but it was a nasty thing to look at. I dare say you've seen dead men in your time, my lord, he added, glancing at the armour. Many, said the old man. I have followed the wars, as you imagine. Villon laid down his knife and fork, which he had just taken up again. Were any of them bold? he asked. Oh, yes, and with hair as white as mine. I don't think I would mind the white so much, said Villon. His was red, and he had a return of his shuddering and tendency to laughter, which he drowned with a great draught of wine. I'm a little put out when I think of it, he went on. I knew him, damn him, and the cold gives a man fancies, or the fancies give a man cold. I don't know which. Have you any money? asked the old man. I have one white, returned the poet, laughing. I got it out of a dead jade stocking in a porch. She was as dead as Caesar, poor wench, and as cold as a church, with bits of ribbon sticking in her hair. This is a hard world in winter for wolves and wenches and poor rogues like me. I, said the old man, Engourant de la Fouillée, Seigneur de Brice too, Bailly du Patatrac. Who and what may you be? Villon rose and made a suitable reverence. I am called Francis Villon, he said, a poor master of arts of this university. I know some Latin and a deal of vice. I can make chansons, ballads, lays, virelays, and roundels. And I am very fond of wine. I was born in a garret, and I shall not improbably die upon the gallows. I may add, my lord, that from this night forward I am your lordship's very obsequious servant to command. No servant of mine, said the knight, my guest for this evening and no more. A very grateful guest, said Villon politely, and he drank in dumb show to his entertainer. You are shrewd, began the old man, tapping his forehead, very shrewd. You have learning, you are a clerk, and yet you take a small piece of money off a dead woman in the street. Is it not a kind of theft? It is a kind of theft much practised in the wars, my lord. The wars are the field of honour, returned the old man proudly. There a man plays his life upon the cast. He fights in the name of his lord the king, his lord God, and all their lordships, the holy saints and angels. Put it, said Villon, that I were really a thief. Should I not play my life also, and against heavier odds? For gain, and not for honour. Gain, repeated Villon with a shrug. Gain, the poor fellow wants supper and takes it. So does the soldier in a campaign. Why, what are all these requisitions we hear so much about? If they are not gained to those who take them, they are loss enough to others. The men at arms drink by a good fire, while the burgher bites his nails to buy them wine and wood. I have seen a good many ploughmen swinging on trees about the country. I, I have seen thirty on one elm, and a very poor figure they made. And when I asked someone how all these came to be hanged, I was told it was because they could not scrape together enough crowns to satisfy the men-at-arms. These things are a necessity of war, which the low-born must endure with constancy. It is true that some captains drive over hard. There are spirits in every rank not easily moved by pity, and indeed many follow arms who are no better than brigands. You see, said the poet, you cannot separate the soldier from the brigand, and what is a thief but an isolated brigand with circumspect manners? I steal a couple of mutton chops, without so much as disturbing the farmer's sheep. The farmer grumbles a bit, but sups none the less wholesomely on what remains. You come up blowing gloriously on a trumpet, take away the whole sheep, and beat the farmer pitifully into the bargain. I have no trumpet. I am only Tom, Dick, or Harry. I am a rogue and a dog, and hanging's too good for me, with all my heart. But just you ask the farmer which of us he prefers— just find out which of us he lies awake to curse on cold nights. Look at us two, said his lordship. I am old, strong, and honoured. If I were turned from my house to-morrow, hundreds would be proud to shelter me. Poor people would go out and pass the night in the streets with their children, if I merely hinted that I wished to be alone. And I find you up, wandering homeless, and picking farthings off dead women by the wayside. I fear no man has nothing, 
I have seen you tremble and lose countenance at a word. I wait God's summons contentedly in my own house, or, if it please the king to call me out again, upon the field of battle. You look for the gallows, a rough, swift death, without hope or honour. Is there no difference between these two? As far as to the moon, Villon acquiesced. But if I had been born Lord of Brestoux, and you had been the poor scholar Francis, would the difference have been any the less? Should not I have been warming my knees at this charcoal pan, and would not you have been groping for farthings in the snow? Should not I have been the soldier, and you the thief? A thief! cried the old man. I a thief? If you understood your words, you would repent them. Villon turned out his hands with a gesture of inimitable impudence. If your lordship had done me the honour to follow my argument, he said, I do you too much honour in submitting to your presence, said the knight. Learn to curb your tongue when you speak with old and honourable men, or someone hastier than I may reprove you in a sharper fashion. And he rose and paced the lower end of the apartment, struggling with anger and antipathy. Villon surreptitiously refilled his cup and settled himself more comfortably in the chair, crossing his knees and leaning his head upon one hand and the elbow against the back of the chair. He was now replete and warm, and he was in no wise frightened of his host, having engaged him as justly as was possible between two such different characters. The night was far spent, and in a very comfortable fashion after all, and he felt morally certain of a safe departure on the morrow. "'Tell me one thing,' said the old man, pausing in his walk. "'Are you really a thief?' "'I claim the sacred rights of hospitality,' returned the poet. "'My lord, I am.' "'You are very young,' the knight continued. "'I should never have been so old,' replied Villon, showing his fingers, "'if I had not helped myself with these ten talents. "'They have been my nursing mothers and my nursing fathers. "'You may still repent and change.' "'I repent daily,' said the poet. "'There are few people more given to repentance than poor Francis. "'As for change, let somebody change my circumstances. "'A man must continue to eat.' if it were only that he may continue to repent. "'The change must begin in the heart,' returned the old man solemnly. "'My dear lord,' answered Villon, "'do you really fancy that I steal for pleasure? "'I hate stealing like any other piece of work or danger. "'My teeth chatter when I see a gallows. "'But I must eat, I must drink, "'I must mix in society of some sort. "'What the devil! "'Man is not a solitary animal. "'Cui Deus foe minan tradit. Make me the king pantler, make me abbot of Saint Denis, make me bailly of the patatrap, and then I shall be changed indeed. But as long as you leave me, the poor scholar Francis Villon, without a farthing, why, of course, I remain the same. The grace of God is all powerful. I should be a heretic to question it, said Francis. It has made you Lord of Breeze too, and bailly of the patatrap. It has given me nothing but the quick wits under my hat and these ten toes upon my hands. May I help myself to wine? I thank you respectfully. By God's grace, you have a very superior vintage. The Lord of Brestoux walked to and fro with his hands behind his back. Perhaps he was not yet quite settled in his mind about the parallel between thieves and soldiers. Perhaps Villon had interested him by some cross thread of sympathy. Perhaps his wits were simply muddled by so much unfamiliar reasoning, but whatever the cause, he sometimes yearned to convert the young man to a better way of thinking, and could not make up his mind to drive him forth again into the street. There is something more than I can understand in this, he said at length. Your mouth is full of subtleties, and the devil has led you very far astray. But the devil is only a very weak spirit before God's truth, and all his subtleties vanish at a word of true honour, like darkness at morning. Listen to me once more. I learned long ago that a gentleman should live chivalrously and lovingly to God, and the king, and his lady, and though I have seen many strange things done, I have still striven to command my ways upon that rule. It is not only written in all noble histories, but in every man's heart, if he will take care to read. You speak of food and wine, and I know very well that hunger is a difficult trial to endure, but you do not speak of other wants, you say nothing of honour, of faith to God and other men, of courtesy, of love without reproach. It may be that I am not very wise, and yet I think I am. 
but you seem to me like one who has lost his way and made a great error in life you are attending to the little wants and you have totally forgotten the great and the only real ones like a man who should be doctoring a toothache on the judgment day for such things as honour and love and faith are not only nobler than food and drink but indeed i think that we desire them more and suffer more sharply for their absence i speak to you as i think you will most easily understand me are you not while well careful to fill your belly disregarding another appetite in your heart which spoils the pleasure of your life and keeps you continually wretched villon was sensibly nettled under all this sermonizing you think i have no sense of honour cried he i'm poor enough god knows it's hard to see rich people with their gloves and you blowing your hands an empty belly is a bitter thing although you speak so lightly of it if you had had as many as i perhaps you would change your tune anyway i'm a thief make the most of that but i'm not a devil from hell god strike me dead i would have you know i've an honour of my own as good as yours though i don't prate about it all day long as if it were a god's miracle to have any it seems quite natural to me i keep it in its box till it's wanted why now look you here how long have i been in this room with you did you not tell me you were alone in the house look at your gold plate you're strong if you like but you're old and unarmed and i have my knife what did i want but a jerk of the elbow and here would have been you with the cold steel in your bowels and there would have been me linking in the street with an armful of gold cups did you suppose i hadn't wit enough to see that and i scorned the action there are your damned goblets as safe as in a church there are you with your heart ticking as good as new and here am i ready to go out again as poor as i came in with my one white that you threw in my teeth and you think i have no sense of honour god strike me dead the old man stretched out his right arm i will tell you what you are he said you are a rogue my man an impudent and black-hearted rogue and vagabond i have passed an hour with you oh believe me i feel myself disgraced and you have eaten and drank at my table but now i am sick at your presence and the day has come and the night bird should be off to his roost will you go before or after which you please returned the poet rising i believe you to be strictly honourable he thoughtfully emptied his cup i wish i could add you were intelligent he went on knocking on his head with his knuckles age age the brain stiff and rheumatic the old man preceded him from a point of self-respect villon followed whistling with his thumbs in his girdle god pity you said the lord of brice too at the door good-bye papa returned villon with a yawn many thanks for the cold mutton the door closed behind him the dawn was breaking over the white roofs a chill uncomfortable morning ushered in the day villon stood and heartily stretched himself in the middle of the road a very dull old gentleman he thought I wonder what his goblets may be worth. End of A Lodging for the Night by Robert Louis Stevenson Recording by Lynn Thompson The Magic Shadow by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Magic Shadow by Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Once upon a time there was born a man child with a magic shadow. His case was so rare that a number of doctors have been disputing over it ever since and picking his parents histories and genealogies to bit to find the cause their inquiries do not help us much the father drove a cab the mother was a charwoman and came of a consumptive family but these facts will not quite account for a magic shadow the birth took place on the night of a new moon down a narrow alley into which neither moon nor sun ever penetrated beyond the third story windows and that is why the parents were so long in discovering their child's miraculous gift 
The hospital student who attended merely remarked that the babe was small and sickly and advised the mother to drink sound port wine while nursing him, which she could not afford. Nevertheless, the boy struggled somehow through five years of life and was put into small clothes. Two weeks after this promotion, his mother started off to scrub out a big house in the fashionable quarter, and took him with her, for the house possessed a wide garden, laid with turf and lined with espaliers, sunflowers, and hollyhocks. And as the month was August, and the family away in Scotland, there seemed no harm in letting the child run about in this paradise while she worked. A flight of steps descended from the drawing-room to the garden, and as she knelt on her mat in the cool room, it was easy to keep an eye on him. Now and then she gazed out into the sunshine and called, and the boy stopped running about and nodded back, or shouted the report of some fresh discovery. By and by a sulphur butterfly excited him so that he must run up the broad stone steps with the news. The woman laughed, looking at his flushed face, then down at his shoestrings, which were untied, and then she jumped up, crying out sharply, Stand still, child, stand still a moment. She might well stare. Her boy stood and smiled in the sun, and his shadow lay on the whitened steps. Only the silhouette was not that of a little breeched boy at all, but of a little girl in petticoats and it wore long curls, whereas the charwoman's son was close-cropped. The woman stepped out on the terrace to look closer. She twirled her son round and walked him down into the garden and backwards and forwards, and stood him in all manner of positions and attitudes, and rubbed her eyes. But there was no mistake. The shadow was that of a little girl. She hurried over her charring, and took the boy home for his father to see before sunset. As the matter seemed important, and she did not wish people in the street to notice anything strange, they rode back in an omnibus. They might have spared their haste, however, as the cab driver did not reach home till supper-time. And then it was found that in the light of a candle, even when stuck inside a carriage lamp, their son cast just an ordinary shadow. But next morning at sunrise they woke him up and carried him to the housetop, where the sunlight slanted between the chimney stacks, and the shadow was that of a little girl. The father scratched his head. There's money in this wife. We'll keep the thing close, and in a year or two he'll be fit to go round in a show and earn money to support our declining years. With that the poor little one's misfortunes began for they shut him in his room, nor allowed him to play with the other children in the alley. There was no knowing what harm might come to his precious shadow. On dark nights his father walked him out along the streets, and the boy saw many curious things under the gas lamps, but never the little girl who inhabited his shadow, so that by degrees he forgot all about her, and his father kept silence. Yet all the while she grew side by side with him, keeping pace with his years. And on his fifteenth birthday, when his parents took him out into the country, and in the sunshine there revealed his secret, she was indeed a companion to be proud of. Neat of figure, trim of ankle, with masses of waving hair, but whether blonde or brunette could not be told, and alas, she had no eyes to look into my son said they the world lies before you only do not forget your parents who conferred on you this remarkable shadow the youth promised and went off to showman the showman gladly hired him for of course a magic shadow was a rarity though not so well paying as the strong man or the fat woman for these were worth seeing every day whereas for weeks at a time in dull weather or foggy our hero had no shadow at all but he earned enough to keep himself and help the parents at home and was considered a success one day after five years of this he sought the strong man and sighed for they had become close friends 
I'm in love, he confessed. With your shadow? No. Not with the fat woman? The strong man exclaimed with a start of jealousy. No, I've seen her, that I mean, these three days in the square, on her way to music lesson. She has dark brown eyes and wears yellow ribbons. I love her. You don't say so? She's never come to her performance, I hope. It has been foggy ever since we came to this town. Ah, to be sure, then there's a chance. For you see, she would never look at you if she knew of that other. Take my advice, go into society always at night, when there is no danger. Get introduced, dance with her, sing serenades under her window, then marry her. Afterwards, well, that's your affair. So the youth went into society and met the girl he loved, and danced with her so vivaciously, and sang serenades with such feeling beneath her window, that at last she felt he was all in all to her. Then the youth asked to be allowed to see her father, who was a retired colonel, and professed himself a man of substance. He said nothing of the shadow. But it is true he had saved a certain amount. Then, to all intents and purposes, you are a gentleman, said the retired colonel, and the wedding day was fixed. They were married in dull weather and spent a delightful honeymoon. But when spring came and brighter days, the young wife began to feel lonely, for her husband locked himself all the day long in his study to work, as he said. He seemed to be always at work, and whenever he consented to a holiday, it was sure to fall on the bleakest and dismalest day in the week. You are never so gay now as you were last autumn. I am jealous of that work of yours. At least, she pleaded, let me sit with you and share your affection with it. But he laughed and denied her, and next day she peered in through the keyhole of his study. That same evening she ran away from him, having seen the shadow of another woman by his side. Then the poor man, for he had loved his wife, cursed the day of his birth and led an evil life. This lasted for ten years, and his wife died in her father's house unforgiving. On the day of her funeral, the man said to his shadow, I see it all. We were made for each other, so let us marry. You have wrecked my life and now must save it. Only it's rather hard to marry a wife whom one can only see by sunlight and moonlight. So they were married and spent all their life in the open air, looking on the naked world and learning its secrets. And his shadow bore him children in stony ways and on the bare mountainside. And for every child that was born, the man felt the pangs of it. And at last he died and was judged, and being interrogated concerning his good deeds began, We too and looked around for his shadow. A great light shone all about, but she was nowhere to be seen. In fact, she had passed before him, and his children remained on earth, where men already were heaping them with flowers and calling them divine. The man folded his arms and lifted his chin. I beg your pardon, he said. I am simply a sinner. There are in this world certain men who create. The children of such are poems, and the half of their soul is female. For it is written that without woman no new thing shall come into the world. End of the Magic Shadow by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch Read by Lars Rolander The Gentle Euphemia by Anthony Trollope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lo, I must tell a tale of chivalry. 
for large white plumes are dancing in mine eyes. Keats Chapter 1 Knowledge, so my daughter held, was all in all. Tennyson The gentle Euphemia lived in a castle, and her father was the Count Grand Nostril. The wise Alasco, who had dwelt for fifty years in the mullion chamber of the North Tower, was her tutor, and he taught her poetry, arithmetic, and philosophy, to love virtue, and the use of the globes. And there came the lord of Mount Fidget to her father's halls to drink the blood-red wine and make exchange of the beeves and swine of Mount Fidget against the olives and dried fruits which grow upon the slopes of Grand Nostril. For the pastures of Mount Fidget are very rich, and its beeves and swine are fat. And peradventure I shall see the fair Euphemia, said the young lord to Lieutenant Hossback of the Marines, who sojourned oft at the grange of Mount Fidget, and delighted more in the racket court, the billiard table, and the game of cards, than in guiding the maneuvers of his trusty men-at-arms. Peradventure, said the young lord, I shall see the fair Euphemia, for the poets of Grand Nostril sing of her peerless beauty, and declare her to be the pearl of pearls. Nay, my lord, said the lieutenant, but an you behold the girl once in that spirit, thou art but a lost man, a kestrel with a broken wing, a spavined steed, a noseless hound, a fish out of water. For credit me, the fair Euphemia wants but a husband, and therefore do the poets sing so loudly. For Lieutenant Hossback knew that were there a lady at the Grange, the spigot would not turn so freely. By my halidome, said the young lord, I will know whether the poets sing sooth or not. So the lord of Mount Fidget departed for the castle of Grand Nostril, and his beeves and his swine were driven before him. Alasco the wise sat in the mullion chamber, with the globes before him, and Aristotle's volume under his arm, and the gentle Euphemia sat lowly on a stool at his feet, and she asked him as to the lore of the ancient schools. Teach me, she said, as Plato taught, and the learned Esculapius and Aristides the just, for I would fain walk in the paths of knowledge, and be guided by the rules of virtue. But he answered her not at all, nor did he open the books of wisdom. Nay, my father, she said, but the winged hours pass by, and my soul is athirst. Then he answered her and said, My daughter, there cometh hither this day the young lord of Mount Fidget, whose beeves and swine are as the stars of heaven in number, and whose ready money in many banks brings in rich harvest of interest. He cometh hither to drink the blood-red wine with your father, and to exchange his beeves and swine for the olives and the dried fruits which grow upon the slopes of Grand Nostril, and peradventure he will ask to see thy father's daughter. Then wilt thou no longer desire to hear what Plato teaches, or how the just man did according to justice. But Euphemia replied, Nay, my father, am I no better than other girls, that I should care for the glance of the young man's eye? Have I not sat at your feet since I was but as high as your knee? Teach me still, as Plato taught. But Alasco said, Love will still be lord of all. He shall never be lord of me, said Euphemia. Chapter 2 and from the platform spare ye not to fire a noble salvo shot. Lord Marmion waits below, Scott. And in those days there was the rinder pest in the land among the cattle, and the swine were plagued with a sore disease, and there had gone forth an edict and a command from the queen's counsellors that no beeves or swine should be driven on the queen's highways. So there came upon the lord of Mount Fidget men armed with authority from the queen, 
and they slew his beeves and his swine, and buried their carcasses twenty fathoms deep beneath the ground. And the young lord was angered much, for he loved his beeves and his swine, and he said to himself, What will my lord the Count Grand Nostril say unto me if I visit him with empty hands? Will the blood-red wine be poured, or shall I see the gentle Euphemia? For the Count Grand Nostril was a hard man, and loved a bargain well. But I have much money in many banks, said the lord of Mount Fidget, in counsel with himself, and though my beeves and my swine are slain and buried, yet will he receive me, for the rich are ever welcome, though their hands be empty. So he went up the slopes which led to the castle of Grand Nostril. And at the portal within the safeguard of the drawbridge there were huge heaps of dried fruits and mountains of olives. And there came out to him the Count Grand Nostril, and demanded of him where were his beeves and his swine. And the Lord told the Count how men in authority from the Queen had come upon him on the road, and had slain the beasts and buried them twenty fathom beneath the earth, because of the rinder pest which raged in the land, and because of the disease among the swine. Then said the Count Grand Nostril, And art thou come empty-handed to drink the blood-red wine, and hast thou never a horn or a tusk? If my butler draw but a sorry pint for thee, I'll butler him with a bastinado. No, not a cork. Get thee gone to thy grange. So he drew up the drawbridge, and the sweet scent of the olives and of the dried fruits were borne aloft by the zephyrs, and struck upon the envious senses of the young lord. And shall I not see thy daughter, the gentle Euphemia? said he. Then the Count Grand Nostril called to his archers, and bade them twang their bows. And the archers twanged their bows, and seven arrows struck the Lord Mount Fidget full upon his breast. But their points availed naught against his steel curé, so he smiled and turned away. Nay, my lord, Count Grand Nostril, said he, thou shalt rue the day when thou treatest thus one who has ready money in many banks. I will set the lawyers at thee and ruin thee with many costs. Then, as he walked away, the archers twanged again and struck him on the back. The good steel turned the points, and the arrows of Grand Nostril fell blunted to the ground. But I fear there was one arrow which entered just above the joint of the knight's harness and galled the neck of the young lord. But as he went down the slopes, there waved a kerchief from the oriel window over the eastern parapet. CHAPTER THREE Oh, cuz, 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 my pretty little cuz, dost know how many fathom deep I am in love? Shakespeare T'was midnight, and there came a soft knock at the door of Alasco the Wise. But Alasco heard it not, for he was drinking in the wisdom of the ancients with all his senses, and his ears were deaf to all earthly sounds. "'Sleepest thou, my father?' said the gentle Euphemia, as she opened the door. "'Or is thy soul buried amidst thy books?' "'Daughter,' said Alasco the wise, "'my soul is buried among my books. "'The hour is short, and the night cometh, "'and he who maketh not his hay while the sun of life shineth "'shall hardly garner his crop beneath the cold, damp hand of death.' But for thee, my child, in thy needs, all other things shall give way. Then he wiped his pen and put a mark in his book and closed his lexicon. My father, said the girl, didst thou hear my father's archers, how their bows twanged this morn? I heard a rattling as of dried peas against the window pane, said the sage. It was the noise, father, of the arrows as they fell upon the breast of Lord Mount Fidget and they fell upon his back also, and alack, one has struck him on the nape of his neck. And then he rode away. Oh, father! And is it thus with thee, my child? said Alasco. Thus, father, said Euphemia, and she hid her face upon the surge of his mantle. 
Did I not say that love should still be lord of all? said the sage. Spare me, father, said the damsel. Spare the child that has stood at thy footstool since she was as high as thy knee. Spare me and aid me to save my lord. Then they sallied forth from the small wicket which opens into the forest from beneath the west barbican. Chapter 4 Come back, come back, he cried in grief. My daughter, oh, my daughter! Campbell When he found she levanted, the Count of Alsace at first turned remarkably red in the face. Barham and in the morning the Count of Grand Nostril called for his daughter, and his eyes were red with drinking, and his breath was thick, and he sat with his head between his hands. For he had drunk the blood-red wine sitting all alone through the night, laughing as he quaffed down goblet after goblet at the discomfiture of the Lord of Mount Fidget. Grinder pest indeed, he had said, he that cometh hither empty-handed, is likely to return a dry. Ho, oh, there, butler, another stoop of Malvasi, and let it be that with the yellow seal. But in the morning he had called for a cool tankard, and now he demanded his daughter's presence that she might pour for him the cup which cheers but not inebriates. Where is the Lady Euphemia? Why tarries the Lady Euphemia? But the attendants answered him never a word. Then he called again, Why cometh not my child to pour for her father the beverage which he loves? Now by cock and pie, and that old greybeard detainer he shall hence from the mullion chamber, and that with a flea in his ear. But still they answered him not a word. Then he up with the tankard from which he had taken his morning's bruce and flung it at the menial's head. Thou churl, thou sot, thou knave, thou clod, why answerest thou not thy liege and lord? But the menial put his hands to his bruised head, and still answered he never a word. Then there entered Dame Ulrica, a poor and aged cousin of the house, who went abroad to dances and to tea parties with the gentle Euphemia. And it please you, my lord count, said Dame Ulrica, Euphemia has fled this morning by the small wicket which leads from beneath the west barbican into the forest, and Alasco the wise has gone with her. Then the Count Grand Nostril stood up in his wrath, and sat down in his wrath, and stood up in his wrath once again. That tankard full of gold pieces, said he, to him who shall bring me the gray beard's head. Then the archers twanged their bows, and the men-at-arms sharpened their sabers, and the volunteers looked to their rifles, and the drummers drummed, and the fifers fifed, and they let down the drawbridge, and they went forth in pursuit of the wise Alasco and the gentle Euphemia. By cock and pie, said the Count Grand Nostril, and it be as I expect, and that sorry knave for Mount Fidget is at the bottom of this. In that case it will be meetest, my lord, that she should be his wife, said the dame Ulrica, who was riding on a palfrey at his right hand. And when she spoke the ancient virtue of the old race was to be seen in her eye, and might be heard in her voice. Ay, thou sayest well, dame, answered the count. And the lord of Mount Fidget has beeves and swine numerous as the stars, and ready money in many banks said Dame Ulrica, for Dame Ulrica was not virtuous only, but prudent also. By cock and pie, thou sayest sooth, said the Count Grand Nostril, and as they had now reached the fiery nostril, a hostel that standeth on the hill overlooking the olive gardens of the castle, the Count called loudly for the landlord's ale. By cock and pie, this is dry work, said the Count Grand Nostril, but we will squeeze Mount Fidget drier before we have done with him. Then the menials laughed, and the pot-bellied landlord swayed his huge paunch hither and thither as he shook his sides with merriment. Faith, and it is my lord the Count is ever ready with his joke, said the landlord. So they paid for the beer and rode on. 
Chapter 5 A breathing but devoted warrior lay. T'was Lars bleeding fast from life away. Byron In the upper chamber of a small cottage, covered with ivy and vines, lay the lord of Mount Fidget, hurt unto death. For one of the arrows had touched him on the nape of the neck, and the point had been dipped in the oil of strychnine. And there leaned over his couch a widow, watching him from moment to moment, touching his lips ever and anon with orange juice mixed with brandy, and wiping the clammy dew from his cold brow. "'Lord of Mount Fidget,' she said, "'when my dear husband was torn from my widowed arms, thy father gave unto the poor widow this cottage. Would I could repay the debt with my heart's blood. Aha! Alas! Alack! And well a day! said the young lord. Naught can repay me now, either interest or principal. All my money at all the banks cannot prolong my life one hour. No, nor my beeves and swine, though they outnumber the stars of heaven and are fatter than a butter tub. It is all up with poor Mount Fidget. Nay, say not so, my lord. If only I could reach the wise man that liveth in the mullion chamber of the North Tower, he hath a medicine that might yet be of avail. Then Mount Fidget demanded who was the wise man, and where was the mullion chamber of the North Tower, and when he learned that aid could be had only from the castle of Grand Nostril, he sighed amain, and sighed again, and then thus he addressed the widow. I help from Grand Nostril, yes, but not such aid as that. I want no gray-bearded senior to rack my dying brains with wise saws, but if it might be given me to let my eyes rest but once on the form of the gentle Euphemia, methinks I could die contented. Then the door of the chamber was opened, and there entered a young page, whose slashed doublet and silken hose were foul with the mud of many lanes, and the dirt of the forest clung to his short cloak, and his hair was wet with the dropping of the leaves, and his cap was crushed, and his jacket was torn. "'He is here! He is here!' said the page. "'I have followed him by his blood through the forest.' Then the page fell at the bedfoot, and there he fainted. CHAPTER Six. Meanwhile, war arose. Milton. But as the page sank upon the floor, a small bottle fell from his breastcoat pocket, and the widow saw that it was labeled, Antidote for the Oil of Strychnine. Then the widow's heart leaped for joy, and as she poured the precious drops into the gaping wound, she said a prayer that the page might recover also. But what noise is this of horses and of men around this humble vineyard of the poor widow? Tiraloo, 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 oh! Ha! said the Mount Fidget, raising himself on his elbow. Tis the war cry of the Grand Nostril. Routed down, routed down, routed down, down, then greeted his ears. Ha ha! he cried. Routed thou, ah, routed thou, routed thou, thou, tis the war cry of the Mount Fidget. And he grasped the sword which lay beneath his pillow. Mount Fidget to the rescue! Shall a man lie still and perish beneath the bedclothes? Ha! A horseback! Ho! A walker! For Walker was the captain of the men at arms at Mount Fidget, and the Lord knew the voice of his trusty clansman. Then the widow looked through the lattice window, and told him how the fight went. But no one thought of the page upon whose brow the clammy hand of death was falling as he lay at the bed foot. CHAPTER Seven, Close against her heaving breast, something in her hand is pressed. Longfellow Alas, go the wise had been left in the forest, and was unable to stir another step. "'Tis the blood of the Mount Fidget,' he had said, when he saw the gouts upon the path. "'I know it by its purple hue, and by its violet-scented perfume. "'Follow it on, but take that bottle with thee. "'And stay, lest thy sex betray thee to ill-usage from the boors, 
take this page's raiment which i carry in my wallet and put the bottle in thy breast coat pocket if thou find as is too likely a gaping wound in the nape of the neck naught can restore him but this pour it in freely and he shall live but if he shall first have heard the war cry of thy father to disturb him then he shall surely die so the gentle euphemia had gone through the forest and had reached the chamber of the widow in which lay the lord of mount fidget and as she lay at the foot of the bed slowly there came back upon her mind a knowledge that she was there she put her hand to her bosom in haste and found that the bottle was gone then a terrible sound greeted her ears and she heard the war cry of her father tirralo 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 he is dead she cried springing to her feet he is dead and i will die also then the widow knew that it was the gentle euphemia no thou gentlest one she said he shall not die he shall live to count the fat beeves and the many swine of mount fidget and shall be the possessor of much money and many banks and thou thou gentlest one shall share his blessings for love shall still be lord of all i do confess said the gentle euphemia in a silvern whisper that was heard by him beneath the bedclothes i do confess that love is lord of me and she sank upon the floor chapter eight i charge you be his faithful and true wife keep warm his hearth and clean his board and when he speaks be quick in your obedience elizabeth b browning and then they all returned to the castle of grand nostril and on their way they took up the wise alasco who had remained in the forest nay father said the damsel smiling but thou hast been right in all things and hast taught me better than plato ever taught and was not i young once myself said the sage so when the blood-red wine had warmed his old veins and made supple the joints of his aged legs he tripped a measure in the castle hall and was very jocund so the lord of mount fidget was married to the gentle euphemia but when three months were passed and gone lieutenant hospack had returned to his regimental duties and love shall still be lord of all anthony trollope end of the gentle euphemia Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Love in a Cottage by Francis A. Darevage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander love in a cottage by francis a darevich tell me charlie who is that fascinating creature in blue that waltzes so divinely asked young frank belmont of his friend charles hastings as they stood playing wallflower for the moment at the military ball julia heathcote answered charles with half a sigh an old flame of mine i proposed but she refused me on what ground simply because i had a comfortable income her head is full of romantic notions and she dreams of nothing but love in a cottage she contends that poverty is essential to happiness and money its bane have you given up all hopes of her entirely in fact i am engaged then you have no objection to my addressing this dear romantic angel none whatever but i see my fiancee excuse me i must walk through the next quadrille with her frank belmont was a stranger in boston a new yorker immensely rich and fashionable but his reputation had not preceded him and charlie hastings was the only man who knew him in new england he procured an introduction to the beauty from one of the managers and soon danced and talked himself into her good graces in fact it was a clear case of love at first sight on both sides the enamoured pair were sitting apart enjoying a most delightful tete-a-tete suddenly belmont 
heaved a deep sigh. "'Why do you sigh, Mr. Belmont?' asked the fair Julia, somewhat pleased with his proof of sensibility. "'Is not this a gay scene?' "'Alas, yes,' replied Belmont gloomily. "'But fate does not permit me to mingle habitually in scenes like this. "'They only make my ordinary life doubly gloomy. "'And even here I deem to see the shadow of a fiend waving me away. "'What right have I to be here?' "'What fiend do you allow to?' asked Miss Heathcote with increasing interest. "'A fiend hardly presentable in good society.' replied belmont bitterly one could tolerate a mephistophilus a dignified fiend with his pockets full of money but my tormentor if personified would appear with seedy boots and a shocking bad hat how absurd it is too true sighed belmont and the name of this fiend is poverty are you poor yes madam i'm poor and when i would fain render myself agreeable in the eyes of beauty in the eyes of one i could love this fiend whispers me beware you have nothing to offer her but love in a cottage mr belmont said julia with sparkling eyes and a voice of unusual animation although there are solid souls in this world who only judge of the merits of an individual by his pecuniary possessions i am not one of that number i respect poverty there is something highly poetical about it and i imagine that happiness is oftener found in the humble cottage than beneath the palace roof belmont appeared enchanted with this encouraging avowal the next day after cautioning his friend charlie to say nothing of his actual circumstances he called on the widow heathcote and her fair daughter in the character of the poor gentleman the widow had very different notions from her romantic offspring and when belmont candidly confessed his poverty on soliciting permission to address julia he was very politely requested to change the subject and never mention it again the result of all this manoeuvring was an elopement the bell of the ball jumping out of a chamber window on a shed and coming down a flight of steps to reach her lover for the sake of being romantic when she might just as well have walked out of the front door the happy couple passed a day in new york city and then frank took his beloved to his cottage an irish hack conveyed them to a miserable shanty in the environs of new york where they alighted and frank escorting the bride into the apartment which served for parlor kitchen and drawing-room and was neither papered nor carpeted introduced her to his mother much in the way claude melnot presents pauline the old woman who was peeling potatoes hastily wiped her hands and face with a greasy apron and saluted her darter as she called her on both cheeks can it be possible thought julia that this vulgar creature is my belmont's mother frank screamed the old woman you'd better go right upstairs and take off them clothes for the boy's been sent arter them more than fifty times frank borry them clothes ma'am she added to julia by way of explanation to look smart when he went down east the bridegroom retired of this hint and soon reappeared in a pair of faded nankeen pantaloons reaching to about the calf of the leg a very shabby black coat out at the elbows a ragged black vest and instead of his varnished leather boots a pair of immense cowhide brogans now said he sitting quietly down by the cooking stove i begin to feel at home ah this is delightful isn't it dearest and he warbled though never so humble there's no place like home julia's heart swelled so that she could not utter a word dearest said frank i think you told me you had no objection to smoking none in the least said the bride i rather like the flavor of a cigar oh a cigar replied belmont that would never do for a poor man and oh horror he produced an old clay pipe and filling it from a little newspaper parcel of tobacco began to smoke with a keen relish 
dinner dinner he exclaimed at length ah thank you mother i'm as hungry as a bear codfish and potatoes julia not very tempting fare but what of that our ailment is love yes and by way of treat added the old woman i been and gone and bought a whole pint of albany ale and three cream cakes from the candy shop next block poor julia pleaded indisposition and could not eat a mouthful before belmont however the codfish and potatoes and the ale and cream cakes disappeared with a very unromantic and unlover-like velocity at the close of the meal a thundering double knock was heard at the door come in cried belmont a low-browed man in a green waistcoat entered now mr belmont he exclaimed in a strong hibernian accent are ye ready to go to work by the powers if i don't see ye sail to-morrow on the shop-board i'll discharge ye without a character and ye shall starve on the top of that to-morrow morning mr maloney replied belmont meekly i'll be at my post and it'll be mighty healthy for you to do that same replied the man as he retired belmont speak tell me gasped julia who is that man that loafer he's my employer answered belmont smiling and his profession he's a tailor and you i'm a journeyman tailor at your service a laborious and thankless calling it ever was to me but now dearest as i drive the hissing goose across the smoking seam i shall think of my own angel and my dear cottage and be happy that night julia retired weeping to her room in the attic that ere counterpane darter said the old woman i worked with these here old hands ain't it putty i hope you'll sleep well here there's a broken pane of glass but i'll put one of frank's old hats in it and i don't think you'll feel the draught there used to be a good many rats here but i don't think they'll trouble you now for frank's been a piecing in of em left alone julia threw herself into a chair and burst into a flood of tears even belmont had ceased to be attractive in her eyes the stern privations that surrounded her banished all thoughts of love the realities of life had cured her in one day of all her quixotic notions well julia how do you like poverty and love in a cottage asked belmont entering in his bridal dress not so well sir as you seem to like that borrowed suit answered the bride reddening with vexation very well you shall suffer it no longer my carriage awaits your orders at the door your carriage indeed yes dearest it waits but for you to bear us to belmont hall my lovely villa on the hudson and your mother i have no mother alas the old woman downstairs is an old servant of the family then you've been deceiving me frank how wicked it was all done with good motive you were not born to endure a life of privation but to shine the ornament of an elegant and refined circle i hope you will not love me the less when you learn that i am worth nearly half a million that's the melancholy fact and i can't help it oh frank cried the beautiful girl and hid her face in his bosom she presided with grace at the elegant festivities of belmont hall and seemed to support her husband's wealth and luxurious style of living with the greatest fortitude and resignation never complaining of her comforts nor murmuring a wish for living in a cottage end of love in a cottage by francis a Durivage, read by lars rolander The Clicking of Cuthbert by P. G. Woodhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The young man came into the smoking room of the clubhouse and flung his bag with a clatter on the floor. He sank moodily into an armchair and pressed the bell. Waiter! Sir! 
The young man pointed at the bag with every evidence of distaste. You may have these clubs, he said. Take them away. If you don't want them yourself, give them to one of the caddies. Across the room, the oldest member gazed at him with a grave sadness through the smoke of his pipe. His eye was deep and dreamy, the eye of a man who, as the poet says, has seen golf steadily and seen it whole. You're giving up golf, he said. He was not altogether unprepared for such an attitude on the young man's part. For from his eyrie on the terrace above the ninth green, he had observed him start out on the afternoon's round and had seen him lose a couple of balls in the lake at the second hole after taking seven strokes at the first. Yes, cried the young man fiercely, forever damn it, footling game, blanked infernal fat-headed silly ass of a game, nothing but a waste of time. The sage winced. Don't say that, my boy. But I do say it. What utterly good is golf? Life is stern and life is earnest. We live in a practical age. All round us we have foreign competition making itself unpleasant, and we spend our time playing golf. What do we get out of it? Is golf any use? That's what I'm asking you. Can you name me a single case where devotion to this pestilential pastime has done a man any practical good? The sage smiled gently. I could name a thousand. One will do. I will select, said the sage, from the innumerable memories that rush on my mind, the story of Cuthbert Banks. Never heard of him. Be of good cheer, said the oldest member. You are going to hear of him now. It was in the picturesque little settlement of Wood Hills, said the oldest member, that the incidents occurred which I am about to relate. Even if you have never been in Wood Hills, that suburban paradise is probably familiar to you by name. Situated at a convenient distance from the city, it combines in a notable manner the advantages of town life with the pleasant surroundings and healthful air of the country. Its inhabitants live in commodious houses standing in their own grounds and enjoy so many luxuries such as gravel soil, main drainage, electric light, telephone baths, and company's own water, that you might be pardoned for imagining life to be so ideal for them that no possible improvement could be added to their lot. Mrs. Willoughby Smithhurst was under no such delusion. What Woodhills needed to make it perfect, she realized, was culture. Material comforts are all very well, but if the summon bonum is to be achieved, the soul who demands a look-in, and it was Mrs. Smethurst's unfaltering resolve that never while she had her strength should the soul be handed the loser's end. It was her intention to make Wood Hills a centre of all that was most cultivated and refined, and golly, how she had succeeded. Under her presidency, the Wood Hills Literary and Debating Society had tripled its membership. But there is always a fly in the ointment a caterpillar in the salad, the local golf club, an institution to which Mrs. Smethurst strongly objected, had also tripled its membership, and the division of the community into two rival camps, the golfers and the cultured, had become more marked than ever. This division, always acute, had attained now to the dimensions of schism. The rival sects treated one another with a cold hostility. Unfortunate episodes came to widen the breach. Mrs. Smethurst's house adjoined the links, standing to the right of the fourth tee, and as the literary society was in the habit of entertaining visiting lecturers, many a golfer had foozled his drive owing to sudden loud outbursts of applause coinciding with the downswing. And not long before the story opens a sliced ball, whizzing in at the open window, had come within an ace of incapacitating Raymond Parslow Devine, the rising young novelist, who rose at the moment a clear foot and a half, from any further exercise of his art. Two inches indeed to the right, and Raymond must inevitably have handed in his dinner pail. To make matters worse, a ring at the front doorbell followed almost immediately, 
and the maid ushered in a young man of pleasing appearance in a sweater and baggy knickerbockers, who apologetically but firmly insisted on playing his ball where it lay. And what with the shock of the lecturer's narrow escape, and the spectacle of the intruder standing on the table and working away with a niblick, the afternoon session had to be classed as a complete frost. Mr. Devine's determination, from which no argument could swear him, to deliver the rest of his lecture in the coal cellar, gave the meeting a jolt from which it never recovered. I have dwelt upon this incident because it was the means of introducing Cuthbert Banks to Mrs. Smethurst's niece Adeline. As Cuthbert, for it was he who had so nearly reduced muster roll of rising novelist by one, hopped down from the table after his talk, he was suddenly aware that a beautiful girl was looking at him intently. As a matter of fact, everyone in the room was looking at him intently, none more so than Raymond Parslow Devine, but none of the others were beautiful girls. Long as the members of Wood Hills Literary Society were no brain, they were short on looks, and to Cuthbert's excited eye, Adeline Smethurst stood out like a jewel in a pile of coke. He had never seen her before, for she had only arrived at her aunt's house on the previous day. But he was perfectly certain that life, even when lived in the midst of gravel soil, main drainage and company's own water, was going to be a pretty poor affair if he did not see her again. Yes, Cuthbert was in love, and it is interesting to record as showing the effect of the tender emotion on a man's game, that twenty minutes after he had met Adeline, he did the short eleventh in one and as near as a toucher got a three on the four hundred yard twelfth. I will skip lightly over the intermediate stages of Cuthbert's courtship and come to the moment when, at the annual ball in aid of the local cottage hospital, the only occasion during the year on which the lion, so to speak, lay down with the lamb, and the golfers and the cultured met on terms of easy comradeship, their differences temporarily laid aside, he proposed to Adeline and was badly stymied. That fair, soulful girl could not see him with a spyglass. Mr. Banks, she said, I will speak frankly. Charge ahead, assented Cuthbert. Deeply sensible, as I am of. I know, of the honour and the compliment and all that, but passing lightly over all that guff, what seems to be the trouble? I love you to distraction. Love is not everything. You're wrong, said Cuthbert earnestly. You're right of it, love. And he was about to dilate on the theme when she interrupted him. I am a girl of ambition. And very nice too, said Cuthbert. I am a girl of ambition, repeated Adeline. And I realize the fulfillment of my ambitions must come through my husband. I am very ordinary myself. What? cried Cuthbert. You ordinary? Why, you are a pearl among women, the queen of your sex. You can't have been looking in a glass lately. You stand alone, simply alone. You make the rest look like battered repaints. Well, said Adeline, softening a trifle, I believe I am fairly good looking. Anybody who was content to call you fairly good-looking would describe the Taj Mahal as a pretty nifty tomb. But that is not the point. What I mean is, if I marry a non-entity, I shall be a non-entity myself forever, and I would sooner die than be a non-entity. And if I follow your reasoning, you think that that lets me out. Well, really, Mr. Banks, have you done anything? Or are you likely ever to do anything worthwhile? Cuthbert hesitated. It's true, he said. I didn't finish in the first ten in the Open, and I was knocked out in the semi-final of the Amateur, but I won the French Open last year. The what? The French Open Championship. Golf, you know. Golf? You waste all your time playing golf? I admire a man who is more spiritual, more intellectual. A pang of jealousy ran Cuthbert's bosom. Like what's his name, Devine? He said sullenly. Mr. Devine, replied Adeline, blushing faintly. 
is going to be a great man. Already he has achieved much. The critics say that he is more Russian than any other young English writer. And is that good? Of course, it's good. I should have thought the V's would be to be more English than any other young English writer. Nonsense. Who wants an English writer to be English? You have got to be Russian or Spanish or something to be a real success. The mantle of the great Russians has descended on Mr. Devine. From what I have heard of Russians, I should hate to have that happen to me. There is no danger of that, said Adeline scornfully. Oh, well, let me tell you that there is a lot more in me than you think. That might easily be so. You think I am not spiritual and intellectual, said Cuthbert, deeply moved. Very well. Tomorrow I join the literary society. Even as he spoke the words, his leg was itching to kick himself for being such a chump. But the sudden expression of pleasure on Adeline's face soothed him, and he went home that night with the feeling that he had taken on something rather attractive. It was only in the cold, grey light of the morning that he realized what he had let himself in for. I do not know if you have had any experience of suburban literary societies, but the one that flourished under the eye of Mrs. Willoughby Smethurst at Wood Hills was rather more so than the average. With my feeble powers of narrative, I cannot hope to make clear to you all the Cuthbert Banks endured in the next few weeks. And even if I could, I doubt if I should do so. It is all very well to excite pity and terror, as Aristotle recommends, but there are limits. In the ancient Greek tragedies, it was an ironclad rule that all the real rough stuff should take place off stage, and I shall follow this admirable principle. It will suffice if I say merrily that J. Cuthbert Banks had a thin time. After attending eleven debates and fourteen lectures on verse labor, poetry, the seventeenth-century essays, the new Scandinavian movement in Portuguese literature, and other subjects of a similar nature, he grew so enfeebled that, on the rare occasions when he had time for a visit to the links, he had to take a full iron for his mashy shots. It was not simply the oppressive nature of the debates and lectures that sapped his vitality. What really got him right in amongst him was the torture of seeing Adeline's adoration of Raymond Parslow Devine. The man seemed to have made the deepest possible impression upon her plastic emotions. When he spoke, she leaned forward with parted lips and looked at him. When he was not speaking, which was seldom, she leaned back and looked at him. And when he happened to take the next seat to her, she leaned sideways and looked at him. One glance at Mr. Devine would have been more than enough for Cuthbert, but Adeline found him a spectacle that never palled. She could not have gazed at him with a more rapturous intensity if she had been a small child and he a saucer of ice cream. All this Cuthbert had to witness while still endeavouring to retain the possession of his faculties sufficiently to enable him to duck and back away if somebody suddenly asked him what he thought of the sombre realism of Vladimir Brusilov. It is little wonder that he tossed in bed, picking at the coverlet, through sleepless nights, and had to have all his waistcoat taken in three inches to keep them from sagging. The Vladimir Brusilov, to whom I have referred, was the famous Russian novelist, and owing to the fact of his being in the country on a lecturing tour at the moment, there had been something of a boom in his works. The Wood Hills Literary Society had been studying them for weeks, and never since his first entrance into intellectual circles had Cuthbert Banks come nearer to throwing in the towel. Vladimir specialized in grey studies of hopeless misery where nothing happened till page 380, when the Mojik decided to commit suicide. It was tough going for a man whose deepest reading hitherto had been warden on the push shot, and there can be no greater proof of the magic of love than the fact that Cuthbert struck it without a cry. But the strain was terrible and I am inclined to think that he must have cracked had it not been for the daily reports in the papers of the internecine strife which was proceeding so briskly in russia 
Cuthbert was an optimist at heart, and it seemed to him that at the rate at which the inhabitants of that interesting country were murdering one another, the supply of Russian novelists must eventually give out. One morning, as he tottered down the road for the short walk, which was now almost the only exercise to which he was equal, Cuthbert met Adeline. A spasm of anguish flitted through all his nerve centers as he saw that she was accompanied by Raymond Parslow Devine. "'Good morning, Mr. Banks,' said Adeline. "'Good morning,' said Cuthbert hollowly. "'Such good news about Vladimir Brusilov. "'Dead?' said Cuthbert with a touch of hope. "'Dead? Of course not. Why should he be? "'No, Aunt Emily met his manager after his lecture at Queen's Hall yesterday, "'and he has promised that Mr. Brusilov shall come to her next Wednesday reception.' "'Oh, ah!' said Cuthbert dully. I don't know how she managed it. I think she must have told him that Mr. Devine would be there to meet him. But you said he was coming, argued Cuthbert. I shall be very glad, said Raymond Devine, of the opportunity of meeting Brusilov. I am sure, said Adeline, he will be very glad of the opportunity of meeting you. Possibly, said Mr. Devine, possibly. Competent critics have said that my work closely resembles that of the great Russian masters. Your psychology is so deep. Yes, yes. And your atmosphere. Quite. Cuthbert, in a perfect agony of spirit, prepared to withdraw from his love feast. The sun was shining brightly, but the world was black to him. Birds sang in the treetops, but he did not hear them. He might have been a mojik for all the pleasures he found in life. You will be there, Mr. Banks, said Adeline, as she turned away. Oh, all right, said Cuthbert. When Cuthbert had entered the drawing room on the following Wednesday and had taken his usual place in a distant corner where, while able to feast his gaze on Adeline, he had a sporting chance of being overlooked or mistaken for a piece of furniture, he perceived the great russian thinker seated in the midst of a circle of admiring females raymond parslow devine had not yet arrived his first glance at the novelist surprised cuthbert doubtless with the best motives vladimir brusilov had permitted his face to become almost entirely concealed behind a dense zareba of hair but his eyes were visible through the undergrowth and it seemed to cuthbert that there was an expression in them not unlike that of a cat in a strange backyard surrounded by small boys the man looked forlorn and hopeless and cuthbert wondered whether he had had bad news from home this was not the case the latest news which vladimir brusilov had had from russia had been particularly cheering three of his principal creditors had perished in the last massacre of the bourgeoisie and a man whom he owed for five years for a samovar and a pair of overshoes had fled the country and had not been heard of since it was not bad news from home that was depressing vladimir what was wrong with him was the fact that this was the eighty-second suburban literary reception he had been compelled to attend since he had landed in the country on his lecturing tour and he was sick to death of it when his agent had first suggested the trip he had signed on the dotted line without an instant's hesitation worked out in rubles the fees offered had seemed just about right but now as he peered through the brushwood at the faces round him and realized that eight out of ten of those present had manuscripts of some sort concealed on their persons and were only waiting for an opportunity to whip them out and start reading he wished that he had stayed at his quiet home in nejni novgorod where the worst thing that could happen to a fellow was a brace of bombs coming in through the window and mixing themselves up with his breakfast egg at this point in his meditations he was aware that his hostess was looming up before him with a pale young man in horn-rimmed spectacles at her side there was in mrs smethurst's demeanour something of the unction of the master of ceremonies at the big fight who introduces the earnest gentleman who wishes to challenge the winner oh mr brusilov said mrs smethurst i do want you to meet mr raymond parslow devine whose work i expect you know he is one of our younger novelists. 
the distinguished visitor peered in a wary and defensive manner through the shrubbery but did not speak inwardly he was thinking how exactly like mr devine was to the eighty-one other younger novelists to whom he had been introduced at various hamlets throughout the country raymond parslow devine bowed courteously while cuthbert wedged into his corner glowered at him the critics said mr devine have been kind enough to say that my poor efforts contain a good deal of the russian spirit i owe much to the great russians i have been greatly influenced by sovietsky down in the forest something stirred it was vladimir brusilov's mouth opening as he prepared to speak he was not a man who prattled readily especially in a foreign tongue he gave the impression that each word was excavated from his interior by some up-to-date process of mining he glared bleakly at mr devine and allowed three words to drop out of him sovietsky no good he paused for a moment, set the machinery working again, and delivered five more at the pithead. I speak me of Sovietsky. There was a painful sensation. The lot of a popular idol is in many ways an enviable one, but it has the drawback of uncertainty. Here today and gone tomorrow. Until this moment, Raymond Parslow Devine's stock had stood at something considerably over par in Woodhill's intellectual circles, but now there was a rapid slump. Hitherto he had been greatly admired for being influenced by Sovietsky, but it appeared now that this was not a good thing to be. It was evidently a rotten thing to be. The law could not touch you for being influenced by Sovietsky, but there is an ethical as well as a legal code and this it was obvious that Raymond Parslow Devine has transgressed. Women drew away from him slightly, holding their skirts. Men looked at him censuriously. Adeline Smethurst started violently and dropped a teacup, and Cuthbert Banks, doing his popular imitation of a sardine in his corner, felt for the first time that life held something of sunshine. Raymond Parslow Devine was plainly shaken, but he made an adroit attempt to recover his lost prestige. When I say I have been influenced by Sovietsky, I mean, of course, that I was once under his spell. A young writer commits many follies. I have long since passed through that phase. The false glamour of Sovietsky has ceased to dazzle me. I now belong wholeheartedly to the school of Nestikov. There was a reaction. People nodded at one another sympathetically. After all, we cannot expect old heads on young shoulders and a lapse at the outset of one's career should not be held against one who has eventually seen the light. Nastikov no good, said Vladimir Brusilov coldly. He paused, listening to the machinery. Nastikov worse than Sovietsky. He paused again. I spit me on Nastikov, he said. This time there was no doubt about it. The bottom had dropped out of the market and Raymond Parslow Devine preferred were down in the cellar with no takers. It was clear to the entire assembled company that they had been all wrong about Raymond Parslow Devine. They had allowed him to play on their innocence and sell them a pup. They had taken him at his own valuation and had been cheated into admiring him as a man who amounted to something, and all the while he had belonged to the school of Nastikov. You never can tell. Mrs. Smethurst's guests were well-bred, and there was consequently no violent demonstration, but you could see by their faces what they felt. Those nearest Raymond Parslow jostled to get further away. Mrs. Smethurst eyed him stonily, through a raised lorgnette. One or two low hisses were heard, and over at the other end of the room, somebody opened the window in a marked manner. Raymond Parslow Devine hesitated for a moment, then, realizing his situation, turned and slung to the door. There was an audible sigh of relief as it closed behind him. Vladimir Brusilov proceeded to sum up. No novelist any good except me. Sovietsky, yeah. Nastikov, bah. I spit me on them all. No novelist anywhere any good except me. P.G. Woodhouse and Tolstoy, not bad. Not good, but not bad. No novelist any good except me. And having uttered this dictum, he removed a slab of cake from a nearby plate, stirred it through the jungle, and began to champ. It is too much to say that there was a dead silence. 
there could never be that in any room in which Vladimir Brusilov was eating cake. But certainly what you might call the general chit-chat was pretty well down and out. Nobody liked to be the first to speak. The members of the Woodhill Literary Society looked at one another timidly. Cuthbert, for his part, gazed at Adeline, and Adeline gazed into space. It was plain that the girl was deeply stirred. Her eyes were opened wide, a faint flush crimsoned her cheeks, and her breath was coming quickly. Adeline's mind was in a whirl. She felt as if she had been walking gaily along a pleasant path and had stopped suddenly on the very brink of a precipice. It would be idle to deny that Raymond Pastor Devine had attracted her extraordinarily. She had taken him at his own valuation as an extremely hot potato, and her hero worship had gradually been turning into love and now her hero had been shown to have feet of clay it was hard i consider on raymond pastor devine but that is how it goes in this world you get a following as a celebrity and then you run up against another bigger celebrity and your admirers desert you one could moralize on this at considerable length but better not perhaps enough to say that the glamour of raymond parslow devine ceased abruptly in that moment for adeline and her most coherent thought at this juncture was the resolve as soon as she got up to her room to burn the three signed photographs he had sent her and to give the autographed presentation set of his books to the grocer's boy mrs smethurst meanwhile having rallied somewhat was endeavouring to set the feast of reason and flow of soul going again and how do you like england mr brusilov she asked the celebrity paused in the act of lowering another segment of cake damn good he replied cordially i suppose you have travelled all over the country by this time you said it agreed the thinker have you met many of our great public men yeah yeah quite a few of nibs lloyd george i met him but beneath the matting a discontented expression came into his face and his voice took on a peevish note but i not meet your real great men your armichel your arevedon i not meet them that's what gives me the people with have you ever met arbismel and arevedon a strange, anguished look came into Mrs. Smethurst's face and was reflected in the faces of the other members of the circle. The eminent Russian had sprung two entirely new ones on them, and they felt that their ignorance was about to be exposed. What would Vladimir Brusilov think of the Woodhills Literary Society? The reputation of the Woodhills Literary Society was at stake, trembling in the balance and coming up for the third time in dumb agony mrs smethurst rolled her eyes about the room searching for someone capable of coming to the rescue she drew blank and then from a distant corner there sounded a deprecating cuff and those nearest cuthbert banks saw that he had stopped twisting his right foot round his left ankle and his left foot round his right ankle and was sitting up with a light of almost human intelligence in his eyes Air said Cuthbert, blushing as every eye in the room seemed to fix itself on him. I think he means Abbe Michel and Harry Verdon. Abe Michel and Harry Verdon? repeated Mrs. Smethurst blankly. I never heard of. Yeah, yeah, most very, said Vladimir Brusilov enthusiastically. Abbe Michel and Harry Verdon. You knew them, yes? What? No? Perhaps? I have played with Abe Mitchell often, and I was partnered with Harry Verdon in last year's Open. The great Russian uttered a cry that shook the chandelier. You play in the Open? Why? he demanded reproachfully of Mrs. Smethurst. Was I not been introduced to this young man who play in Opens? Well, really, faltered Mrs. Smethurst, well the fact is uh, mr brusilov uh, she broke off she was unequal to the task of explaining without hurting anyone's feeling that she had always uh, regarded cuthbert as a piece of cheese and a blot on the landscape introduct me thundered the celebrity why certainly certainly of course this is mr 
she looked appealingly at Cuthbert. Banks, prompted Cuthbert. Banks, cried Vladimir Brusilov. Not Kuthabut Banks? <laughs> Is your name Kuthabut? asked Mrs. Smethurt faintly. Well, it's Cuthbert. Yeah, yeah, Kuthabut. There was a rush and swirl as the effervescent Muscovite burst his way through the throng and rushed to where Cuthbert sat. He stood for a moment, eyeing him excitedly, then, stooping swiftly, kissed him on both cheeks before Cuthbert could get his guard up. My dear young man, I saw you with the French open. Great, 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 superb, hot stuff, and you can say I said so. Well, you permit one who is but eighteen at Nijni Novogod to salute you once more. And he kissed Cuthbert Banks again. Then, Brushing aside one or two intellectuals who were in the way, he dragged up a chair and sat down. You are a great man, he said. Oh, no, said Cuthbert modestly. Yeah, great, most, very, the, very, the way you lay your approach pots, dead from anywhere. Oh, I don't know. Mr. Brusilov drew his chair closer. Let me tell you this very funny story about putting. It was one day I play at Nijni Novogorod with the pro against Lenin and Trotsky, and Trotsky had a two-inch putt from the hole. But just as he addresses the ball, someone in the crowd he tries to assassinate Lenin with a revolver. You know that is our great national sport, trying to assassinate Lenin with revolvers, and the bang puts Trotsky off his stock and he goes five yards past the hole, and then Lenin, who is rather shaken, you understand, he misses again himself, and we win the hole and match, and I clean up three hundred and ninety-six thousand rubles, or fifteen shillings in your money. Some game of it. And now let me tell you one other very funny story. Desultory conversation had begun in murmurs over the rest of the room, as the Wood Hills intellectuals politely endeavoured to conceal the fact that they realised that they were about as much out of it as this reunion of twin souls as cats at a dog show. From time to time they started as Vladimir Brusilov's laugh boomed out. Perhaps it was a consolation to them to know that he was enjoying himself. As for Adeline, how shall I describe her emotions? She was stunned. Before her very eyes, the stone which the builders had rejected had become the main thing. The hundred to one shot had walked away with the race. A rush of tender admiration for Cuthbert Banks flooded her heart. She saw that she had been all wrong. Cuthbert, whom she had always treated with a patronizing superiority, was really a man to be looked up to and worshipped. A deep, dreamy sigh shook Adeline's fragile form. Half an hour later, Vladimir and Cuthbert Banks rose. Got a bye, Mrs. Smith Trust, said the celebrity. Thank you for a most charming visit. My friend Kuthabut and me, we go now to suit a few holes. You will lend me clubs, friend Kuthabut. Any want? The nebulous key is what I use most. Got a bye, Mrs. Smith Trust. They were moving to the door when Cuthbert felt a light touch on his arm. Adeline was looking up at him tenderly. May I come too and walk round with you? Cuthbert's bosom heaved. Oh, he said with a tremor in his voice, that you would walk round with me for life. Her eyes met his. Perhaps, she whispered softly, it could be arranged. And so concluded the oldest member. You see that golf can be of the greatest practical assistance to a man in life's struggle. Raymond Parslow Devine, who was no player, had to move out of the neighborhood immediately, and is now, I believe, writing scenarios out in California for the Flickr Film Company. Adeline is married to Cuthbert, and it was only his earnest pleading which prevented her from having their eldest son christened Abe Mitchell ribbed face mashy bang for she is now as keen a devotee of the great game as her husband those who know them say that theirs is a union so devoted so the sage broke off abruptly for the young man had rushed to the door and out into the passage through the open door he could hear him crying passionately to the waiter to bring back his clubs end of the clicking of cuthbert this is a librivox recording
The Opening of the Will from The Flegeljahre by Jean Paul Richter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel Novotny. The Opening of the Will. Since Haslau had been a princely residence, no one could remember any event, the birth of their heir apparent excepted, that had been awaited with such curiosity as the opening of the van der Kabel will. Van der Kabel might have been called the Haslau Crassus, and his life described as a pleasure-making mint, or a washing of gold sand under a golden rain, or in whatever other terms wit could devise. Now, seven distant living relatives of seven distant deceased relatives of Kabel were cherishing some hope of a legacy, because the Crassus had sworn to remember them. These hopes, however, were very faint. No one was especially inclined to trust him, as he not only conducted himself on all occasions in a gruffly moral and unselfish manner, in regard to morality, to be sure the seven relatives were still beginners, but likewise treated everything so derisively and possessed a heart so full of tricks and surprises that there was no dependence to be placed upon him. The eternal smile hovering around his temples and thick lips and the mocking falsetto voice impaired the good impression that might otherwise have been made by his nobly cut face and a pair of large hands from which New Year's presents, benefit performances and gratuities were continually falling. Wherefore, the birds of passage proclaimed the man, this human mountain ash in which they nested, of whose berries they ate, to be in reality a dangerous trap, and they seemed hardly able to see the visible berries for the invisible snares. Between two attacks of apoplexy, he made his will and deposited it with the magistrate. Though half dead, when he gave over the certificate, to the seven presumptive heirs, he said in his old tone of voice that he did not wish this token of his decease to cause dejection to mature men, whom he would much rather think of as laughing than as weeping heirs. And only one of them, the coldly ironical police inspector, Harbrecht, answered the smilingly ironical Crassus. It was not in their power to determine the extent of their collective sympathy in such a loss. At last the seven heirs appeared with their certificate at the city hall. These were the consistorial councillor Glanz, the police inspector, the court agent Neupeter, the attorney of the royal treasury Knoll, the bookseller Passvogel, the preacher at early service Flax, and Herr Flitte from Alsace. They duly and properly requested of the magistrates the charter consigned to the latter by the late Kabel, and asked for the opening of the will. The chief executor of the will was the officiating Burgermeister in person. The under-executors were the municipal councillors. Presently the charter and the will were fetched from the council chamber into Burgermeister's office. They were passed around to all the councillors and the heirs in order that they might see the privy seal of the city upon them and the registry of the consignment written by the town clerk upon the charter was read aloud to the seven heirs. Thereby it was made known to them that the charter had really been consigned to the magistrates by the late departed one and confided to them Scrinio Rai Publici Likewise, that he had been in his right mind on the day of consignment. The seven seals, which he himself had placed upon it, were found to be intact. Then, after the town clerk had again drawn up a short record of all this, the will was opened in God's name and read aloud by the officiating burgomaster. It ran as follows. 
I, von der Kabel, du draw up my will on the 7th day of May 1790, here in my house in Haslau in Dog Street, without a great ado of words, although I have been both a German notary and a Dutch domine. Notwithstanding, I believe that I am still sufficiently familiar with the notary's art to be able to act as a regular testator and bequeather of property. Testators are supposed to commence by setting forth the motives which have caused them to make their will. These with me, as with most, are my approaching death and the disposal of an inheritance which is desired by many. To talk about the funeral and such matters is too weak and silly. That which remains of me, however, may the eternal sun above us make use of for one of his verdant springs and not for a gloomy winter. The charitable bequests about which notaries must always inquire I shall attend to by setting aside for three thousand of the city paupers an equal number of florins, so that in the years to come, on the anniversary of my death, if the annual review of the troops does not happen to take place on the common that day, they can pitch their camp there and have a merry feast of the money, and afterward clothe themselves with the tent linen. To all the schoolmasters of the principality also I bequeath to every man one August d'or. My will being divided into clauses, this may be taken as the first. Second clause. It is the general custom for legacies and disinheritances to be counted among the most essential parts of the will. In accordance with this custom, consistorial councillor Glanz, attorney of the royal treasury Knoll, court agent Peter Neupeter, police inspector Habrecht, the preacher at early service Flax, the court bookseller Passvogel, and Herr Flitte, for the time being, receive nothing. Not so much because no Trebellianica is due to them as the most distant relatives, or because most of them have themselves enough to bequeath, as because I know out of their own mouths that they love my insignificant person better than my great wealth. Which person I therefore leave them, little as can be got out of it. 7. Preternaturally long faces at this point started up like seven sleepers. The consistorial counsellor, a man still young but celebrated throughout all Germany for his oral and printed sermons, considered himself one most insulted for such taunts. From the Alsatian flitte there escaped an oath accompanied by a slight smack of the tongue. The chin of flax, the preacher at early service, grew downward into a regular beard. The city councillors could hear several softly ejaculated obituaries referring to the late Kabel under the name of scamp, fool, infidel, etc. But the officiating burgomaster waved his hand. The attorney of the royal treasury and the bookseller again bent all the elastic steel springs of their faces as if setting a trap and the Burgermeister continued to read, although with enforced seriousness. Third clause. I make an exception of the present house in Dog Street, which after this, my third clause, shall just as it stands, devolve upon and belong to that one of my seven above-named relatives, who first, before the other six rivals, can in one half hour's time, to be reckoned from the reading of the clause, shed one or two tears over me, his departed uncle in the presence of an estimable magistrate who shall record the same. If, however, all eyes remain dry, then the house likewise shall fall to the exclusive heir whom I am about to name. Here the Burgermeister closed the will, remarked that the condition was certainly unusual but not illegal, and the court must adjudge the house to the first one who wept with which he placed his watch, which pointed to half-past eleven, 
on the office table and sat himself quietly down in order in his capacity of executor to observe, together with the whole court, who should first shed the desired tear over the testator. It cannot fairly be assumed that, as long as the earth had stood, a more woe-begone and muddled Congress ever met upon it than this one composed of seven dry provinces assembled together, as it were, in order to weep. At first, some precious minutes were spent merely in confused wondering and in smiling. The Congress had been placed too suddenly in the situation of the dog who, when about to rush angrily at his enemy, heard the latter call out, Beg! and who suddenly got up on his hind legs and begged, showing his teeth. From cursing they had been pulled up too quickly into weeping. Everyone realised that genuine emotion was not to be thought of. Downpours do not come quite so much on the gallop. Such sudden baptism of the eyes was out of the question. But in 26 minutes something might happen. The merchant Neupeta asked if it were not an accursed business and a foolish joke on the part of a sensible man, and he refused to lend himself to it. But the thought of that house, that it might swim into his purse on a tear, caused him a peculiar irritation of the glands, which made him look like a sick lark to whom a clyster is being applied with an oiled pinhead, the house being the head. The attorney of the royal treasury, Knoll, screwed up his face like a poor workman whom an apprentice is shaving and scraping on a Saturday evening by the light of a shoemaker's candle. He was furiously angry at the misuse made of the title Will and quite near to shedding tears of rage. The crafty bookseller, Passvogel, at once quietly set about the matter in hand. He hastily went over in his mind all the touching things which he was publishing at his own expense or on commission, and from which he hoped to brew something. He looked all the while like a dog that is slowly licking off the emetic which the Parisian veterinary de May had smeared on his nose. It would evidently be some time before the desired effect would take place. Flitte, from Alsace, danced around in the Burgermeister's office, looked laughingly at all the serious faces and swore he was not the richest among them, but not for all Strasbourg and Alsace besides was he capable of weeping over such a joke. At last the police inspector looked very significantly at him and declared, in case Monsieur hoped, by means of laughter, to squeeze the desired drops out of the well-known glands and out of my Bohemian, the caruncle and others, and thus thievishly to cover himself with this window-pane moisture, he wished to remind him that he could gain just as little by it as if he should blow his nose and try to profit by that, as in the latter case it is well known that more tears flow from the eyes through the ductus nasalis than were shed in any church pew during a funeral sermon. But the Alsatian assured him he was only laughing in fun and not with serious intentions. The inspector, for his part, tried to drive something appropriate into his eyes by holding them wide open and staring fixedly. The preacher at early service, Flax, looked like a beggar riding a runaway horse. Meanwhile, his heart, which was already overcast with the most promising sultry clouds caused by domestic and church troubles, could have immediately drawn up the necessary water as easily as the sun before bad weather. If only the floating house navigating toward him had not always come between as a much too cheerful spectacle and acted as a dam. The consistorial councillor had learned to know his own nature from New Year's and funeral sermons, and was positive that he himself would be the first to be moved if only he started to make a moving address to the others. When, therefore, he saw himself and the others hanging so long on on the drying line, he stood up and said with dignity, 
Everyone knows who had read his printed works, knew for a certainty that he carried a heart in his breast which needed to repress such holy tokens as tears are, so as not thereby to deprive any fellow man of something, rather than laboriously to draw them to the surface with an ulterior motive. This heart has already shed them, but in secret, for Kabel was my friend, he said, and looked around. He noticed with pleasure that all were sitting there as dry as wooden corks. At this special moment, crocodiles, stags, elephants, witches, ravens could have wept more easily than the heirs. So disturbed and enraged were they by glance. Flax was the only one who had a secret inspiration. He hastily summoned to his mind Kabel's charities and the mean clothes of the grey hair of the women who formed his congregation at the early service, Lazarus with his dogs and his own long coffin and also the beheading of various people, Werther's sorrows, a small battlefield and himself. How pitifully here in the days of his youth he was struggling and tormenting himself over the claws of the will. Just three more jerks of the pump handle and he would have his water and the house. Oh, Kabel, my Kabel, continued Glance, almost weeping for joy at the prospect of the approaching tears of sorrow. When once beside your loving heart, covered with earth, my heart too shall mull. I believe, honoured gentlemen, said Flax mournfully, arising and looking around, his eyes brimming over. I am weeping. After which he sat down again and let them flow more cheerfully. He had feathered his nest. Under the eyes of the other heirs, he had snatched away the prize house from Glance, who now extremely regretted his exertions, since he had quite uselessly talked away half of his appetite. The emotion of Flax was placed on record, and the house in Dog Street was adjudged to him for good and all. The Burgomeister was heartily glad to see the poor devil get it. It was the first time in the Principality of Haslau that the tears of a schoolmaster and teacher of the church had been metamorphosed, not like those of the Heliads, into light amber, which encased an insect, but like those of the goddess Freya, into gold. Glance congratulated Flax, and gaily drew his attention to the fact that perhaps he, Glance, had helped to move him. The rest drew aside, by their separation accentuating their position on the dry road from that of flax on the wet. All, however, remained intent upon the rest of the will. Then the reading of it was continued. End of The Opening of the Will by Jean-Paul Richter Read by Rachel Novotny, The Black Forest, Germany This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. While the Auto Waits, a short story by O. Henry, the pen name of William Sidney Porter. Promptly at the beginning of twilight came again in that quiet corner of that quiet small park the girl in grey. She sat upon a bench and read a book, for there was yet to come a half-hour in which print could be accomplished. To repeat, her dress was grey and plain enough to mark its impeccancy of style and fit. A large meshed veil imprisoned her turban hat and a face that shone through it with a calm and unconscious beauty. She had come there at the same hour on the day previous and on the day before that, and there was one who knew it. The young man who knew it hovered near, relying upon burnt sacrifices to the great Joss Luck. His piety was rewarded, for in turning a page her book slipped from her fingers and bounded from the bench a full yard away. The young man pounced upon it with instant avidity, returning it to its owner with that air that seems to flourish in parks and public places, 
a compound of gallantry and hope, tempered with respect for the policeman on the beat. In a pleasant voice, he risked an inconsequent remark upon the weather, that introductory topic responsible for so much of the world's unhappiness, and stood poised for a moment, awaiting his fate. The girl looked him over leisurely, at his ordinary neat dress, and his features distinguished by nothing particular in the way of expression. "'You may sit down, if you like,' she said, in a full, deliberate contralto. "'Really, I would like to have you do so. The light is too bad for reading. I would prefer to talk.' The vassal of luck slid upon the seat by her side with complaisance. "'Oh, do you know,' he said, speaking the formula with which park chairmen open their meetings, that you are quite the stunningest girl I have seen in a long time. I had my eye on you yesterday. Didn't know somebody was bowled over by those pretty lamps of yours, did you, honeysuckle? Whoever you are, said the girl in icy tones, you must remember that I am a lady. I will excuse the remark you have just made, because the mistake was doubtless not an unnatural one in your circle. I asked you to sit down, if the invitation must constitute me your honeysuckle, consider it withdrawn. I earnestly beg your pardon, pleaded the young man. His expression of satisfaction had changed to one of penitence and humility. It was my fault, you know. I mean, there are girls in parks, you know. That is, of course, you don't know, but... Abandon the subject, if you please. Of course I know. Now, tell me about these people passing and crowding each way along these paths. Where are they going? Why do they hurry so? Are they happy? The young man had promptly abandoned his air of coquetry. His cue was now for a waiting part. He could not guess the role he would be expected to play. It is interesting to watch them, he replied, postulating her mood. It is the wonderful drama of life. Some are going to supper and some to uh, other places. One wonders what their histories are. I do not, said the girl. I am not so inquisitive. I come here to sit because here only can I be near the great common throbbing heart of humanity. My part in life is cast where its beats are never felt. Can you surmise why I spoke to you, Mr. Uh, Parkenstacker, supplied the young man. Then he looked eager and hopeful. No, said the girl, holding up a slender finger and smiling slightly. You would recognize it immediately. It is impossible to keep one's name out of print, or even one's portrait. This veil and this hat of my maid furnish me with an incog. You should have seen the chauffeur stare at it when he thought I did not see. Candidly, there are five or six names that belong in the Holy of Holies, and mine, by the accident of birth, is one of them. I spoke to you, Mr. Stankenpot. Parkenstacker, corrected the young man modestly. Mr. Parkenstacker, because I wanted to talk for once with a natural man, one unspoiled by the despicable gloss of wealth and supposed social superiority. Oh, you do not know how weary I am of it, money, 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 and of the men who surround me, dancing like little marionettes all cut by the same pattern. I am sick of pleasure, of jewels, of travel, of society, of luxuries of all kinds. I always had an idea, ventured the young man, hesitatingly, that money must be a pretty good thing. A competence is to be desired, but when you have so many millions that... She concluded the sentence with a gesture of despair. It is the monotony of it, she continued, that Paul's. Drives, dinners, theatres, balls, suppers, with the gilding of superfluous wealth over it all. Sometimes the very tinkle of the ice in my champagne glass nearly drives me mad. Mr. Parkenstacker looked ingenuously interested. I have always liked, he said, to read and hear about the ways of wealthy and fashionable folks. I suppose I am a bit of a snob, but I like to have my information accurate. Now, I had formed the opinion that champagne is cooled in the bottle and not by placing ice in the glass. The girl gave a musical laugh of genuine amusement. You should know, she explained in an indulgent tone, that we of the non-useful class depend for our amusement upon departure from precedent. Just now it is a fad to put ice in champagne. The idea was originated by a visiting Prince of Tartary while dining at the Waldorf. It will soon give way to some other whim, just as at a dinner party this week on Madison Avenue a green kid glove was laid by the plate of each guest to be put on and used while eating olives. I see, admitted the young man humbly, 
these special diversions of the inner circle do not become familiar to the common public sometimes continued the girl acknowledging his confession of error by a slight bow i have thought that if ever i should love a man it would be one of lowly station one who is a worker and not a drone but doubtless the claims of caste and wealth will prove stronger than the inclination just now i am besieged by two one is a grand duke of a german principality i think he has or has had a wife somewhere driven mad by his intemperance and cruelty the other is an english marquis so cold and mercenary that i even prefer the diabolism of the duke what is it that impels me to tell you these things mr pakenstacker parkenstacker breathed the young man indeed you cannot know how much i appreciate your confidences the girl contemplated him with a calm impersonal regard that befitted the difference in their stations what is your line of business mr parkenstacker she asked a very humble one but i hope to rise in the world were you really in earnest when you said that you could love a man of lowly position indeed i was but i said might there is the grand duke and the marquis you know yes no calling could be too humble were the man what i would wish him to be i work declared mr parkenstacker in a restaurant the girl shrank slightly not as a waiter she said a little imploringly labor is noble but personal attendance you know valets and i am not a waiter i am cashier in on the street they faced that bounded the opposite side of the park was the brilliant electric sign restaurant i am cashier in that restaurant you see there the girl consulted a tiny watch set in a bracelet of rich design upon her left wrist and rose hurriedly she thrust her book into a glittering reticule suspended from her waist for which however the book was too large why are you not at work she asked i am on the night turn said the young man it is yet an hour before my period begins may i not hope to see you again i do not know perhaps but the whim may not seize me again i must go quickly now there is a dinner and a box at the play and oh the same old round perhaps you noticed an automobile at the upper corner of the park as you came one with a white body and red running gear asked the young man knitting his brows reflectively yes i always come in that pierre waits for me there he supposes me to be shopping in the department store across the square conceive of the bondage of life wherein we must deceive even our chauffeurs good night but it is dark now said mr parkenstacker and the park is full of rude men may i not walk if you have the slightest regard for my wishes said the girl firmly you will remain at this bench for ten minutes after i have left i do not mean to accuse you but you are probably aware that autos generally bear the monogram of their owner again good night swift and stately she moved away through the park the young man watched her graceful form as she reached the pavement at the park's edge and turned up along it towards the corner where the automobile stood then he treacherously and unhesitatingly began to dodge and skim among the park trees and shrubbery in a course parallel to her route keeping her well in sight when she reached the corner she turned her head to glance at the motor car and then passed it continuing on across the street sheltered behind a convenient standing cab the young man followed her movements closely with his eyes passing down the sidewalk of the street opposite the park she entered the restaurant with the blazing sign the place was one of those frankly glaring establishments all white paint and glass where one may dine cheaply and conspicuously the girl penetrated the restaurant to some retreat at its rear whence she quickly emerged without her hat and veil the cashier's desk was well to the front a red-haired girl on the stool climbed down glancing pointedly at the clock as she did so the girl in grey mounted in her place the young man thrust his hands into his pockets and walked slowly back along the sidewalk at the corner his foot struck a small paper-covered volume lying there sending it sliding to the edge of the turf by its picturesque cover he recognized it as the book the girl had been reading he picked it up carelessly and saw that its title was new arabian nights the author being of the name of stevenson he dropped it again upon the grass and lounged irresolute for a minute then he stepped into the automobile 
reclined upon the cushions and said two words to the chauffeur. Club, Henri. The end of the recording of While the Auto Waits by O. Henry. An Ideal of London by Beatrice Harridan. It was one o'clock, and many of the students in the National Gallery had left off work and were refreshing themselves with lunch and conversation. There was one old worker who had not stirred from his place, but he had put down his brush and had taken from his pocket a small book, which was like its owner, thin and shabby of covering. He seemed to find pleasure in reading it, for he turned over its pages with all the tenderness characteristic of one who loves what he reads. Now and again he glanced at his unfinished copy of the beautiful portrait of Andrea del Sarto, and once his eyes rested on another copy next to his, better and truer than his, and once he stopped to pick up a girl's prune-coloured tie, which had fallen from the neighbouring easel. After this he seemed to become unconscious of his surroundings, as unconscious indeed as any one of the pictures near him. Any one might have been justified in mistaking him for the portrait of a man, but that his lips moved, for it was his custom to read softly to himself. The students passed back to their places, not troubling to notice him, because they knew from experience that he never noticed them, and that all greetings were wasted on him, and all words were wanton expenditure of breath. They had come to regard him very much in the same way as many of us regard the wonders of nature, without astonishment, without any questionings, and often without any interest. One girl, a newcomer, did chance to say to her companion, How ill that old man looks! Oh, he always looks like that, was the answer. You soon get accustomed to him. Come along, I must finish my blind beggar this afternoon. In a few minutes most of the workers were busy again, although there were some who continued to chat quietly, and several young men who seemed reluctant to leave their girlfriends, and who were by no means encouraged to go. One young man came to claim his book and pipe, which he had left in the charge of a bright-eyed girl, who was copying Sir Joshua's angels. She gave him his treasures, and received in exchange a dark red rose, which she fastened in her belt and then he returned to his portrait of Mrs. Siddons. But there was something in his disconsolate manner which made one suspect that he thought less of Mrs. Siddons's beauty than of the beauty of the girl who was wearing the dark red rose. The strangers, strolling through the rooms, stopped now and again to peer curiously at the students' work. They were stared at indignantly by the students themselves, but they made no attempt to move away, and even ventured sometimes to pass criticisms of no tender character on some of the copies. The fierce-looking man who was copying the horse fair deliberately put down his brushes, folded his arms, and waited defiantly until they had gone by. But others, wiser in their generation, went on painting calmly. Several workers were painting the new Raphael, one of them was a white-haired old gentlewoman whose hand was trembling and yet skilful still. More than once she turned to give a few hints to the young girl near her, who looked in some distress and doubt. Just the needful help was given, and then the girl plied her brush merrily, smiling the while with pleasure and gratitude. There seemed to be a genial, kindly influence at work, a certain homeliness too, which must needs assert itself where many are gathered together, working side by side. All made a harmony. The wonderful pictures, collected from many lands and many centuries, each with its meaning and its message from the past. The ever-present memories of the painters themselves, who had worked and striven and conquered. And the living human beings, each with his wealth of earnest endeavour and hope. Meanwhile, the old man read on, uninterruptedly until two hands were put over his book and a gentle voice said mr lindall you have had no lunch again do you know i begin to hate lucretius he always makes you forget your food 
the old man looked up and something like a smile passed over his joyless face when he saw helen stanley bending over him ah he answered you must not hate lucretius i have had more pleasant hours with him than with any living person he rose and came forward to examine her copy of andrea del sarto's portrait yours is better than mine he said critically in fact mine is a failure i think i shall only get a small price for mine indeed i doubt whether i shall get sufficient to pay for my funeral you speak dismally she answered smiling i missed you yesterday he continued half dreamily i left my work and i wandered through the rooms and i did not even read lucretius something seemed to have gone from my life at first i thought it must be my favorite raphael or the murillo but it was neither the one nor the other it was you that was strange wasn't it but you know we get accustomed to anything and perhaps i should have missed you less the second day and by the end of the week i should not have missed you at all mercifully we have in us the power of forgetting i do not wish to plead for myself she said but i do not believe that you or any one could really forget that which outsiders call forgetfulness might be called by the better name of resignation i don't care about talking any more now he said suddenly and he went to his easel and worked silently at the picture and helen stanley glanced at him and thought she had never seen her old companion look so forlorn and desolate as he did to-day he looked as if no gentle hand had ever been placed on him in kindliness and affection and that seemed to her a terrible thing for she was one of those prehistorically minded persons who persist in believing that affection is as needful to human life as rain to flower life when first she came to work at the gallery some twelve months ago she had noticed this old man and had wished for his companionship she was herself lonely and sorrowful and although young had to fight her own battles and she had learned something of the difficulties of fighting and this had given her an experience beyond her years she was not more than twenty-four years of age but she looked rather older and though she had beautiful eyes full of meaning and kindness her features were decidedly plain as well as unattractive there were some in the gallery who said among themselves that as mr lindoll had waited so many years before talking to anyone he might have chosen someone better worth the waiting for but they soon became accustomed to seeing helen stanley and mr lindoll together and they laughed less than before and meanwhile the acquaintance ripened into a sort of friendship half sulky on his part and wholly kind on her part he told her nothing about himself and he asked nothing about herself for weeks he never even knew her name sometimes he did not speak at all and the two friends would work silently side by side until it was time to go and then he waited until she was ready and walked with her across trafalgar square where they parted and went their own ways but occasionally when she least expected it he would speak with glowing enthusiasm on art then his eyes seemed to become bright and his bent figure more erect and his whole bearing proud and dignified there were times too when he would speak on other subjects on the morality of free thought on bruno of blessed memory on him and scores of others too he would speak of the different schools of philosophy he would laugh at himself and at all who having given time and thought to the study of life's complicated problems had not reached one step further than the old world thinkers perhaps he would quote one of his favorite philosophers and then suddenly relapse into silence returning to his wonted abstraction and his indifference to his surroundings helen stanley had learned to understand his ways and to appreciate his mind and without intruding on him in any manner had put herself gently into his life as his quiet champion and his friend no one in her presence dared speak slightingly of the old man or to make fun of his tumble-down appearance or of his worn-out silk hat with a crack in the side or of his rag of a black tie which together with his overcoat had seen better days once she brought her needle and thread and darned the torn sleeve during her lunch-time and though he never knew it 
It was a satisfaction to her to have helped him. Today she noticed that he was painting badly, and that he seemed to take no interest in his work. But she went on busily with her own picture, and was so engrossed in it that she did not at first observe that he had packed up his brushes and was preparing to go home. Three more strokes, he said quietly, and you will have finished your picture. I shall never finish mine. Perhaps you will be good enough to set it right for me. I am not coming here again. I don't seem to have caught the true expression. What do you think? I am not going to let it worry me, for I am sure you will promise to do your best for me. See, I will hand over these colours and these brushes to you, and no doubt you will accept the palette as well. I have no further use for it. Helen Stanley took the palette, which he held out toward her, and looked at him as though she would wish to question him. It is very hot here, he continued, and I am going out. I am tired of work. He hesitated and then added, I should like you to come with me if you can spare the time. She packed up her things at once, and the two friends moved slowly away, he gazing absently at the pictures, and she wondering in her mind as to the meaning of his strange mood. When they were on the steps inside the building, he turned to Helen Stanley and said, I should like to go back to the pictures once more. I feel as if I must stand among them just a little longer. They have been my companions for so long that they are almost part of myself. I can close my eyes and recall them faithfully. But I want to take a last look at them. I want to feel once more the presence of the great masters and to refresh my mind with their genius. When I look at their work I think of their life and can only wonder at their death. It was so strange that they should die. They went back together, and he took her to his favourite pictures, but remained speechless before them, and she did not disturb his thoughts. At last he said, I am ready to go. I have said farewell to them all. I know nothing more wonderful than being among a number of fine pictures. It is almost overwhelming. One expects nature to be grand, but one does not expect man to be grand. You know we don't agree there, she answered. I expect everything grand and great from man. They went out of the gallery and into Trafalgar Square. It was a scorching afternoon in August, but there was some cooling comfort in seeing the dancing water of the fountains, sparkling so brightly in the sunshine. Do you mind stopping here a few minutes, he said. I should like to sit down and watch. There is so much to see. She led the way to a seat, one end of which was occupied by a workman who was sleeping soundly and snoring too, his arms folded tightly together. He had a little clay pipe in the corner of his mouth. It seemed to be tucked in so snugly that there was not much danger of its falling to the ground. At last Helen spoke to her companion. What do you mean by saying that you will not be able to finish your picture? Perhaps you are not well. Indeed, you don't look well. You make me anxious, for I have a great regard for you. I am ill and suffering, he answered quietly. I thought I should have died yesterday, but I made up my mind to live until I saw you again. I thought I would ask you to spend the afternoon with me, and go with me to Westminster Abbey, and sit with me in the cloisters. I do not feel able to go by myself, and I know of no one to ask except you, and I believe you would not refuse me, for you have been very kind to me. I do not quite understand why you have been kind to me, but I am wonderfully grateful to you. Today I heard someone in the gallery say that you were plain. I turned round and I said, I beg your pardon, I think she is very beautiful. I think they laughed, and that puzzled me, for you have always seemed to me a very beautiful person. At that moment the little clay pipe fell from the workman's mouth and was broken into bits. He awoke with a start, gazed stupidly at the old man and his companion, and at the broken clay pipe. "'Curse my luck,' he said, yawning. "'I was fond of that damned little pipe.' The old man drew his own pipe and his own tobacco pouch from his pocket. "'Take these, stranger,' he said. "'I don't want them, and good luck to you.' The man's face brightened up as he took the pipe and pouch. "'You're uncommon kind,' he said. "'Can you spare them?' he added, holding them out half-reluctantly. 
Yes, answered the old man. I shall not smoke again. You may as well have these matches, too. The labourer put them in his pocket, smiled his thanks, and walked some little distance off, and Helen watched him examine his new pipe, and then fill it with tobacco and light it. Mr. Lindall proposed that they should be getting on their way to Westminster, and they soon found themselves in the abbey. They sat together in the poet's corner. A smile of quiet happiness broke over the old man's tired face as he looked around and took in all the solemn beauty and grandeur of the resting place of the great. You know, he said half to himself, half to his companion, I have no belief of any kind, and no hopes, and no fears, but all through my life it has been a comfort to me to sit quietly in a church or a cathedral. The graceful arches, the sun shining through the stained windows, the vaulted roof, the noble columns, have helped me to understand the mystery, which all our books of philosophy cannot make clear, though we bend over them year after year, and grow old over them, old in age and in spirit. Though I myself have never been outwardly a worshipper, I have never sat in a place of worship, but that, for a time being, I have felt a better man. But directly the voice of doctrine or dogma was raised, the spell was broken for me, and that which I hoped was being made clear had no further meaning for me. There was only one voice which ever helped me, the voice of the organ, arousing me, thrilling me, filling me with strange longing, with welcome sadness, with solemn gladness. I have always thought that music can give an answer when everything else is of no avail. I do not know what you believe. I am so young to have found out, she said, almost pleadingly. Don't worry yourself, he answered kindly. Be brave and strong and let the rest go. I should like to live long enough to see what you will make of your life. I believe you will never be false to yourself or to anyone. That is rare. I believe you will not let any lower ideal take the place of your high ideal of what is beautiful and noble in art, in life. I believe that you will never let despair get the upper hand of you. If it does, you may as well die. Yes, you may as well. And I entreat you not to lose your entire faith in humanity. There is nothing like that for withering up the very core of the heart. I tell you, humanity and nature have so much in common with each other that if you lose part of your pleasure in the latter, you will see less beauty in the trees, the flowers, and the fields, less grandeur in the mighty mountains and the sea. The seasons will come and go, and you will scarcely heed their coming and going. Winter will settle over your soul, just as it settled over mine. And you see what I am. They had now passed into the cloisters, and they sat down in one of the recesses of the windows, and looked out upon the rich plot of grass which the cloisters enclose. There was not a soul there except themselves. The cool and the quiet and the beauty of the spot refreshed these pilgrims, and they rested in calm enjoyment. Helen was the first to break the silence. I am so glad you have brought me here, she said. I shall never grumble now at not being able to afford a fortnight in the country. This is better than anything else. It has always been my summer holiday to come here, he said. When I first came, I was like you, young and hopeful, and I had wonderful visions of what I intended to do and to be. Here it was I made a vow that I would become a great painter and win for myself a resting place in this very abbey. There is humour in the situation, is there not? I don't like to hear you say that, she answered. It is not always possible for us to fill all our ambitions. Still, it is better to have them and failed of them than not to have them at all. Possibly, he replied coldly. Then he added, I wish you would tell me about yourself. You have always interested me. I have nothing to tell you about myself, she answered frankly. I am alone in the world, without friends and without relations. The very name I use is not a real name. I was a foundling. At times I am sorry I do not belong to anyone, and at other times I am glad. You know I am fond of books and of art, so my life is not altogether empty, and I find my pleasure in hard work. 
when i saw you at the gallery i wished to know you and i asked one of the students who you were he told me you were a misanthrope then i did not care so much about knowing you until one day you spoke to me about my painting and that was the beginning of our friendship forty years ago he said sadly the friend of my boyhood deceived me i had not thought it possible that he could be false to me he screened himself behind me and became prosperous and respected at the expense of my honor i vowed i would never again make a friend a few years later when i was beginning to hold up my head the woman whom i loved deceived me then i put from me all affection and all love greater natures than mine are better able to bear these troubles but my heart contracted and withered up he paused for a moment many recollections overpowering him then he went on telling her the history of his life unfolding to her the story of his hopes and ambitions describing to her the very home where he was born and the dark-eyed sister whom he had loved and with whom he had played over the daisied fields and through the carpeted woods and all among the richly tinted bracken one day he was told she was dead and that he must never speak her name but he spoke it all the day and all the night beryl nothing but beryl and he looked for her in the fields and in the woods and among the bracken it seemed as if he had unlocked the casket of his heart closed for so many years and as if all the memories of the past and all the secrets of his life were rushing out glad to be free once more and grateful for the open air of sympathy beryl was as swift as a deer he exclaimed you would have laughed to see her on the moor ah it was hard to give up all the thoughts of meeting her again they told me i should see her in heaven but i did not care about heaven i wanted beryl on earth as i knew her a merry laughing sister i think you are right we don't forget we become resigned in a dead dull kind of way suddenly he said i don't know why i have told you all this and yet it has been such a pleasure to me you are the only person to whom i could have spoken about myself for no one else but you would have cared don't you think she said gently that you made a mistake in letting your experiences embitter you because you have been unlucky in one or two instances it did not follow that all the world was against you perhaps you unconsciously put yourself against all the world and therefore saw everyone in an unfavorable light it seems so easy to do that trouble comes to most people doesn't it and your philosophy should have taught you to make the best of it at least that is my notion of the value of philosophy she spoke hesitatingly as though she gave utterance to these words against her will i am sure you are right child he said eagerly he put his hands to his eyes but he could not keep back the tears i have been such a lonely old man he sobbed no one can tell what a lonely loveless life mine has been if i were not so old and so tired i should like to begin all over again he sobbed for many minutes and she did not know what to say to him of comfort but she took his hand within her own and gently caressed it as one might do to a little child in pain he looked up and smiled through his tears you have been very good to me he said and I dare say you have thought me ungrateful You mended my coat for me one morning and not a day has passed But that I have looked at that darn and thought of you I like to remember that you had done it for me, but you have done far more than this for me You have put some sweetness into my life Whatever becomes of me hereafter I shall never be able to think of my life on earth as anything but beautiful Because you thought kindly of me and acted kindly for me the other night when this terrible pain came over me i wished you were near me i wished to hear your voice there is very beautiful music in your voice i would have come to you gladly she said smiling quietly at him you must make a promise that when you feel ill again you will send for me then you will see what a splendid nurse i am and how soon you will become strong and well under my care strong enough to paint many more pictures each one better than the last now will you promise 
Yes, he said, and he raised her hand reverently to his lips. You are not angry with me for doing that, he asked suddenly. I should not like to vex you. I am not vexed, she answered kindly. Then perhaps I may kiss it once more, he asked. Yes, she answered, and again he raised her hand to his lips. Thank you, he said quietly. That was kind of you. Do you see that broken sun-ray yonder? Is it not golden? I find it very pleasant to sit here, and I am quite happy and almost free from pain. Lately I have been troubled with a dull thudding pain in my heart, but now I feel so strong that I believe I shall finish that Andrea del Sarto after all. Of course you will, she answered cheerily, and I shall have to confess that yours is better than mine. I am willing to yield the palm to you. I must alter the expression of the mouth, he replied. That is the part which has worried me. I don't think I told you that I have had a commission to copy Rembrandt's old Jew. I must set to work on that next week. But you have given me your palette and brushes, she laughed. You must be generous enough to lend them to me, he said, smiling. By the way, I intend to give you my books, all of them. Some day I must show them to you. I especially value my philosophical books. They have been my faithful companions through many years. I believe you do not read Greek. That is a pity, because you would surely enjoy Aristotle. I think I must teach you Greek. It would be an agreeable legacy to leave you when I pass away into the great silence. I should like to learn, she said, wondering to hear him speak so unreservedly. It seemed as if some vast barrier had been rolled aside, and as if she were getting to know him better, having been allowed to glance into his past life, to sympathize with his past mistakes, and with the failure of his ambitions, and with the deadening of his heart. You must read Aeschylus, he continued enthusiastically, and, if I mistake not, the Agamemnon will be an epoch in your life. You will find that all these studies will serve to ennoble your art, and you will be able to put mind into your work, and not merely form and colour. Do you know, I feel so well, that I believe I shall not only live to finish Andrea del Sarto, but also to smoke another pipe? You have been too rash today, she laughed, giving away your pipe and pouch, your palette and brushes, in this reckless manner. I must get you a new pipe tomorrow. I wonder you did not part with your venerable Lucretius. That reminds me, he said, fumbling in his pocket. I think I have dropped my Lucretius. I fancy I left it somewhere in the poet's corner. It will grieve me to lose that book. Let me go and look for it, she said, and she advanced a few steps, and then came back to him. You have been saying many kind words to me, she said, and she put her hand on his arm, and I have not told you that I value your friendship, and am grateful to you for letting me be more than a mere stranger to you. I have been very lonely in my life, for I am not one to make friends easily, and it has been a great privilege to me to talk with you. I want you to know this, for if I have not been anything to you, you have been a great deal to me. I have never met with much sympathy from those of my own age. I have found them narrow and unyielding, and they found me dull and uninteresting. They have passed through few experiences, and knew nothing about failure or success, and some of them did not even understand the earnestness of endeavour, and laughed at me when I spoke of a high ideal. So I withdrew into myself, and should probably have grown still more isolated than I was before, but that I met you, and as time went on we became friends. I shall always remember your teaching, and I will try to keep to a high ideal of life and art and endeavour, and I will not let despair creep into my heart, and I will not lose my faith in humanity. As she spoke, a lingering ray of sunshine lit up her face and gently caressed her soft brown hair. Slight though her form, sombre her clothes, and unlovely her features, she seemed a gracious presence because of her earnestness. Now, she said cheerily, you rest here until I come back with your Lucretius, and then I think I must be getting on my way home. But you must fix a time for our first Greek lesson, for we must begin tomorrow. When she had gone, he walked in the cloisters, holding his hat in his hand and his stick under his arm. 
there was a quiet smile on his face which was called forth by pleasant thoughts in his mind and he did not look quite so shrunken and shriveled as usual his eyes were fixed on the ground but he raised them and observed a white cat creeping toward him it came and rubbed itself against his foot and purring with all its might seemed determined to win some kind of notice from him the old man stooped down to stroke him and was just touching its sleek coat when he suddenly withdrew his hand and groaned deeply he struggled to the recess and sank back the stick fell on the stone with a clatter and the battered hat rolled down beside it and the white cat fled away in terror but realizing that there was no cause for alarm it came back and crouched near the silent figure of the old man watching him intently then it stretched out its paw and played with his hand doing its utmost to coax him into a little fun but he would not be coaxed and the cat lost all patience with him and left him to himself meanwhile helen stanley was looking for the lost lucretius in the poet's corner she found it laying near chaucer's tomb and was just going to take it to her friend when she saw the workman to whom they had spoken in trafalgar square he recognized her at once and came toward her i've been having a quiet half hour here he said it does me a sight good to sit in the abbey you should go into the cloisters she said kindly i have been sitting there with my friend he will be interested to hear that you love this beautiful abbey i should like to see him again said the workman he has a kind way about him and that pipe he gave me is an uncommon good one still i am sorry i smashed the little clay pipe i'd grown used to it i smoked it ever since my little girl died and left me alone in the world i used to bring my little girl here and now i come alone but it isn't the same thing no it could not be the same thing said helen gently but you find some comfort here some little comfort he answered one can't expect much they went together into the cloisters and as they came near the recess where the old man rested helen said why he has fallen asleep he must have been very tired and he has dropped his hat and stick thank you if you will put them down there i will watch by his side until he wakes up i don't suppose he will sleep for long the workman stooped down to pick up the hat and stick and glanced at the sleeper something in the sleeper's countenance arrested his attention he turned to the girl and saw that she was watching him what is it she asked anxiously what is the matter with you he tried to speak but his voice failed him and all he could do was to point with trembling hand at the old man helen looked and a loud cry broke from her lips the old man was dead end of an idyll of london by beatrice harridan read by lynn thompson I Walk Up the Avenue by Richard Harding Davis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. A Walk Up the Avenue by Richard Harding Davis. He came down the steps slowly and pulling mechanically at his gloves. He remembered afterwards that some woman's face had nodded brightly to him from a passing brougham, and that he had lifted his hat through force of habit and without knowing who she was. He stopped at the bottom of the steps and stood for a moment uncertainly, and then turned toward the north, not because he had any definite goal in his mind, but because the other way led toward his rooms, and he did not want to go there yet. He was conscious of a strange feeling of elation, which he attributed to his being free, and to the fact that he was his own master again in everything. And with this he confessed to a distinct feeling of littleness, of having acted meanly or unworthily of himself or of her. And yet he had behaved well, even quixotically. He had tried to leave the impression with her that it was her wish and that she had broken with him, 
not he with her he held a man who threw a girl over as something contemptible and he certainly did not want to appear to himself in that light or for her sake that people should think he had tired of her or found her wanting in any one particular he knew only too well how people would talk how they would say he had never really cared for her that he didn't know his own mind when he had proposed to her and that it was a great deal better for her as it is than if he had grown out of humour with her later as to their saying she had jilted him he didn't mind that he much preferred they should take that view of it and he was chivalrous enough to hope she would think so too he was walking slowly and had reached thirtieth street a great many young girls and women had bowed to him or nodded from the passing carriages but he did not tend to disturb the measure of his thoughts he was used to having people put themselves out to speak to him everybody made a point of knowing him not because he was so very handsome and well-looking and an over-popular youth but because he was as yet unspoiled by it but in any event he concluded it was a miserable business still he had only done what was right he had seen it coming on for a month now and how much better it was that they should separate now than later or that they should have had to live separated in all but location for the rest of their lives yes he had done the right thing decidedly the only thing to do he was still walking up the avenue and had reached thirty-second street at which point his thoughts received a sudden turn a half dozen men in a club window nodded to him and brought to him sharply what he was going back to he had dropped out of their lives as entirely of late as though he had been living in a distant city when he had met them he had found their company uninteresting and unprofitable he had wondered how he had ever cared for that sort of thing and where had been the pleasure of it was he going back now to the gossip of that window to the heavy discussions of traps and horses to late breakfasts and early suppers must he listen to their congratulations on his being one of them again and must he guess at their whispered conjectures as to how soon it would be before he again took up the chains and harness of their fashion he struck the pavement sharply with his stick no he was not going back she had taught him to find amusement and occupation in many things that were better and higher than any pleasures or pursuits he had known before and he could not give them up he had her to thank for that at least and he would give her credit for it too and gratefully he would always remember it and he would show in his way of living the influence and the good effects of these three months in which they had been continually together he had reached forty-second street now well it was over with and he would get to work at something or other this experience had shown him that he was not meant for marriage that he was intended to live alone because if he found that a girl as lovely as she undeniably was palled on him after three months it was evident that he would never live through life with any other one yes he would always be a bachelor he had lived his life had told his story at the age of twenty-five and would wait patiently for the end a marked and gloomy man he would travel now and see the world he would go to that hotel in cairo she was always talking about where they were to have gone on their honeymoon or he might strike further into africa and come back bronzed and worn with long marches and jungle fever and with his hair prematurely white he even considered himself with great self-pity returning and finding her married and happy of course 
and he enjoyed in anticipation the secret doubts she would have of her later choice when she heard on all sides praise of this distinguished traveller and he pictured himself meeting her reproachful glances with fatherly friendliness and presenting her husband with tiger skins and buying her children extravagant presents this was at forty-fifth street yes that was decidedly the best thing to do to go away and improve himself and study up all those painters and cathedrals with which she was so hopelessly conversant he remembered how out of it she had once made him feel and how secretly he had admired her when she had referred to a modern painting as looking like those in the long gallery of the louvre he thought he knew all about the louvre but he would go over again and locate that long gallery and become able to talk to her understandingly about it and then it came over him like a blast of icy air that he could never talk over things with her again he had reached fifty-fifth street now and the shock brought him to a standstill on the corner where he stood gazing blankly before him he felt rather weak physically and decided to go back to his rooms and then he pictured how cheerless they would look and how little of comfort they contained he had used them only to dress and sleep in of late and the distaste with which he regarded the idea that he must go back to them to read and sit and live in them showed him how utterly his life had become bound up with a house on twenty-seventh street where was he to go in the evening he asked himself with pathetic hopelessness or in the morning or afternoon for that matter were there to be no more of those journeys to picture galleries and to the big publishing houses where they used to hover over the new book counter and pull the books about and make each other innumerable presents of daintily bound volumes until the clerks grew to know them so well that they never went through the form of asking where the books were to be sent and those tete-a-tete luncheons at her house when her mother was upstairs with a headache or a dressmaker and the long rides and walks in the park in the afternoon and the rush downtown to dress only to return to dine with them ten minutes late always and always with some new excuse which was allowed if it was clever and frowned at if it was commonplace was all this really over why the town had only run on because she was in it and as he walked the streets the very shop windows had suggested her to him florists only existed that he might send her flowers and gowns and bonnets in the milliner's windows were only pretty as they would become her and as for the theatres and the newspapers they were only worth while as they gave her pleasure and he had given all this up and for what he asked himself and why he could not answer that now it was simply because he had been surfeited with too much content he replied passionately he had not appreciated how happy he had been she had been too kind too gracious he had never known until he had quarrelled with her and lost her how precious and dear she had been to him he was at the entrance to the park now and he strode on along the walk bitterly upbraiding himself for being worse than a criminal a fool a common blind mortal to whom a goddess had stooped he remembered with bitter regret a turn off the drive into which they had wandered one day a secluded pretty spot with a circle of box around it and into the turf of which he had driven his stick and claimed it for them both by the right of discovery and he recalled how they had used to go there just out of sight of their friends in the ride and sit and chatter on a green bench beneath a bush of box 
like any nursery maid and her young man, while her groom stood at the brougham door in the bridal path beyond. He had broken off a sprig of the box one day and given it to her, and she had kissed it foolishly and laughed and hidden it in the folds of her riding skirt in burlesque fear lest the guards should arrest them for breaking the much-advertised ordinance. And he remembered with a miserable smile how she had delighted him with her account of her adventure to her mother, and described them as fleeing down the avenue with their treasure, pursued by a squadron of mounted policemen. This and a hundred other of the foolish, happy fancies they had shared in common came back to him, and he remembered how she had stopped one cold afternoon just outside of this favorite spot beside an open iron grating sunk in the path into which the rain had washed the autumn leaves and pretended it was a steam radiator and held her slim gloved hands out over it as if to warm them how absurdly happy she used to make him and how light-hearted she had been he determined suddenly and sentimentally to go to that secret place now and bury the engagement ring she had handed back to him under that bush as he had buried his hopes of happiness and he pictured how some day when he was dead she would read of this in his will and go and dig up the ring and remember and forgive him he struck off from the walk across the turf straight toward this dell taking the ring from his waistcoat pocket and clinching it in his hand he was walking quickly with rapt interest in this idea of abnegation when he noticed unconsciously at first and then with a start the familiar outlines and colors of her brougham drawn up in the drive not twenty yards from their old meeting place he could not be mistaken he knew the horses well enough and there was old wallace on the box and young wallace on the path he stopped breathlessly and then tipped on cautiously keeping the encircling line of bushes between him and the carriage and then he saw through the leaves that there was some one in the place and that it was she he stopped confused and amazed he could not comprehend it she must have driven to the place immediately on his departure but why and why to that place of all others he parted the bushes with his hands and saw her lovely and sweet-looking as she had always been standing under the box bush beside the bench and breaking off one of the green branches the branch parted and the stem flew back to its place again leaving a green sprig in her hand she turned at that moment directly toward him and he could see from his hiding place how she lifted the leaves to her lips and that a tear was creeping down her cheek then he dashed the bushes aside with both arms and with a cry that no one but she heard sprang toward her young van bibber stopped his mail phaeton in front of the club and went inside to recuperate and told how he had seen them driving home through the park in her brougham and unchaperoned which i call very bad form said the punctilious van bibber even though they are engaged End of a walk up the avenue by Richard Harding Davis. Read by Lars Rolander.